Okay. Welcome to uh, resist Resisting Censorship with Blockchain Tech Class 3. Uh, since we didn't have a class uh, last week for spring break, uh, we're still on Class 3 at the moment. Thank you, we should be on Class 4, but I uh, had to skip a class. Uh, now let's just get started with the class. I want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, all information shown in this class is not intended to provide personal attacks or financial advice. This information presented is intended to be consumed and used for educational purposes only. I am not an investment advisor, nor am I a tax advisor. I'm still, still a college student. And uh, please consider your own personal circumstances and speak with the professional advisors and independently research any data or information you may rely on, both for making an investment or tax decision or otherwise. And uh, welcome to my class. Um, now it's just you, Jay Hearn, and a, and a professor. There is a, one more person here, but I don't think he's here for the class. So um, I'll try not to bother him too much. And, uh, That's me. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanna go over some blockchain terminology and uh, just quick go over it. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogcoin, Litecoin, Monero, et cetera. There are roughly tokens that are typically decentralized and open source. The goal is to enable the common man, but realistically, it's always a tech savvy internet dweller is most using it to be able to use it to be able to use without need of intermediaries such as a bank. Technically, you so I can use it. I have to go over that later on in the, in the presentation. The blockchain network utilizes a public ledger comprised of various wallet addresses, which is the public and private wallet address. And this peer-to-peer -peer side of transactions via individual wallet addresses characterize most of the cryptocurrency transactions today. And uh, I want to get started on the, rep and the article that Professor Swish shared with me. I wanted to put it in the class today since, uh, uh, since it's very relevant to the class. This is regarding the crypto, the crypto and the sanctions on Russia. According to The Economist magazine, almost nobody in Russia has attempted to use crypto or blockchain to bypass the sanctions. There's a misspelling there. I, I fix that later. And there are many three major, there are three major reasons why. Number one, the blockchain infrastructure in Russia, due to the Russian government being hostile to uh, everything blockchain related, basically there's no large crypto uh, exchanges anywhere in Russia, since uh, the Russian government, like any other authoritarian government, don't really like any blockchain or any crypto, crypt, cryptocurrencies in general. Russia, Russia in particular, they really just hated it. I say go as far as they hate more than China does. But, uh, what, and number two, you, what you can purchase with crypto is very limited. I say very limited, but realistically you can't do buy anything in Russia with crypto. Uh, you can't really uh, buy anything directly with crypto currency tokens, Russia. If you try to buy something with a Bitcoin in Russia, you're going to get a lot of confused looks. So you need to convert the crypto to usable fiat or to a fiat to a currency to purchase items or services. However, this requires a major crypto exchange to do so, which doesn't exist in Russia, which points back to all the way to number one. There's no crypto blockchain infrastructure in Russia. Uh, and on that point, the article describes a lot more about uh, Coinbase and Binance banning over, Coinbase in particular, banning over 25,000 accounts related, related uh, located in Russia and Binance, that's gonna, which says they're going to follow suit after an executive order on March 9th from the Biden administration, which are pushing sanctions on Russia, particularly on the digital assets. So, yeah, a lot of exchanges just folded unexpectedly. You expect them to put up a little more fight in that, but they kind of just one executive order and they all just fold to the government, which leaves a very important lesson. Don't leave your money on the exchanges. You get a physical hardware wallet, get a tenure or a Chesar, whatever. Just don't leave your money on the exchanges. They're, they're very vulnerable as past events keep continually proving it's that they can easily get shut down. The founder can die unexpectedly with the password of them and Nobody's able to access it, or they just do a rug pull and just try to just take all the crypt, take all the tokens away from you. Exchanges aren't exactly a great place to put your crypto. So yeah, get a physical wallet always. And the third point, 
the crypto doesn't protect anonymity and privacy as expected. I, I predicted this. <laughs> is, uh, I'm particular on my Monero presentation on last semester is that big blockchain has a big vulnerability is that, is that you can easily link the wallets to people now is if you if uh, if you have the if you have the address as blockchain transactions are public once identified it's easy to trace the history of funds this card i want to park back to the event 2021 where the fba managed to see 33.6 billion worth of crypto assets related to a debt from an exchange in 2016 uh, basically the government knows about cryptocurrencies now they they all they know about the blockchain they can track you now. It's not. It's not like a 2010 anymore. It's not 2010 anymore. It's 2022. They know. They know. Which is why. Uh, which is why Bitcoin, which was initially used by Silk Road, but unfortunately is pretty trackable now by every government, almost every major government in the world. And here's a part two. Essentially, Russia can't use crypto to bypass our sanctions due to international bypass the sanctions due to international uh, laws and, and policies. However, international, not to mention international crypto exchanges like Binance or uh, <clears throat> Binance and other other famous stuff used throughout the world. They'll just sell you out for a quick buck, just a, a, a quick government order, and they just fold. And, uh, and also due to foolish hostility, early crypto infrastructure in Russia. All leads to the all leads to the fact that there's no no crypto usage in Russia. They kind of shot themselves in the foot in that regard. However, another side of the, the conflict of the Ukraine and Russia war, Ukraine is actually embracing crypto. They're easily, easily using they're using it to easily gain donations and uh, all of this stuff on Twitter. Particularly on February 26, the official Ukrainian Twitter account published. If they publish their digital wallet addresses, which to me, which is accepting uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other tokens, and donations quickly flooded in. I think the quote from uh, Alexa, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Bornyagov, the Ukrainian deputy minister for digital transformation. Yeah, they adopted crypto, crypto very quickly. Crypto really helped during the first few days because we were able to cover some immediate needs. Nearly 100 million worth of tokens has since been donated to those and other wallets sent by private initiatives. Yeah. Ukraine embraced crypto early on, but in compared to Russia, which is kind of just, they shunned it out. And now Russia can't really use crypto with their own advantage. And now they're kind of just, they kind of shut themselves off that way. They could have, they could have bypassed sanctions. Could they have bypassed sanctions? Maybe. I'm not sure, but they they weren't able to even try at this point. It's just kind of it's kind of sad at this point. Well, I guess in terms of the in terms of winning, who's winning in terms of crypto? Definitely, it's definitely Ukraine. That's the irony. The Ethereum founder is Russian himself, but he has no infrastructure in his own country. And uh, I want to call, I want to briefly go into NFTs now. I want to briefly go over what exactly NFTs are. They're a non fugible token, non fugible, which means the token cannot be easily duplicated, replicated, or replaced. In theory, because there has been times where it actually has been duplicated, replicated, and replaced. And I've covered the big NFT torrent hack that happened a while ago, last semester. It's basically a guy just copied all the tokens from the exchanges and just set them publicly. It was a big hack. Everyone in the NFT is here kind of freaked out over that. And uh, most crypto tokens like Bitcoin are fungible, which means they can be duplicated and replaced to a certain degree. Uh, every NFT is unique to each other. An NFT token is different in theory allowing most NFTs to be used to represent original artworks, collectibles, such as digital trading cards, music, videos, etc. cetera. Uh, the way NFTs are built that allows them to flourish in a world of digitalized art. You, can, you don't have to go to an art gallery to use it. 
And my NFTs are basically uh, based on Ethereum blockchain, but there's a couple more NFTs are being based on other forms of blockchain like the Solera. Ethereum itself is special in that it can hold additional data information about a particular token. That's but with, with the smart contract in Ethereum. Through the verification of ownership, history of ownership, and prices are the additional, and price and the price changes are the additional data that can be stored on those NFTs. Now let's go to the real major topic: fall of NFTs. Yeah, as you can see right here in a verse and NFTs. There's a big peak right here around January, but yeah, so it's certainly going. It's a big decline right now. It's like nobody. From source, yeah, I got it from uh, the Forest Magazine. The author himself took a screenshot of this, which I'll show in the next one. Yeah, and it's interest in NFTs and in metaverse is falling fast. Uh, NFTs, and I'm quoting from the article right here. NFTs, meanwhile, peaked somewhere around the end of January and have dropped since. This should ward off the idea that the global banking breaking news of Russia invading Ukraine causes drop of interest for this term, and perhaps many others. As we can see, this is already being slide a month before the invasion even happened. It's been a smooth decline again since, and so shows no sign of sh shows no sign of sh That's a tongue twister. Shows no sign of slowing. Uh, and to give my two cents on this. I guess the interest in NFTs have, uh, as you guys well know, that NFTs, ever since they premiered in the public, is that the public reaction to them has been kind of lackluster. Like nobody's really enthusiastic about the idea of a JPEG monkey being sold for $10,000 $10, plus or even a million dollars. The idea is kind of absurd to a lot of people. And not to mention the right clicking thing. The right-clicking joke is that you can just easily just right-click the media itself and just take all the advantage of it. I guess, uh, as I mentioned before, NFTs do have utility, but it's just the public are not seeing that. Yeah, Jay Heard is saying that people don't understand the fundamentals about NFT, but people in tech understand. I agree. Like, uh, and you just copy and paste uh, Copy and pasta. That's a misspelling right there. Copy and paste NFTs. Not really. If you're involved in a crypto or NFT block, you can usually see online posts about how NFTs are just uh, practically the same as a JPEG, PNG, or a GIF right there. Uh, not this, That's not really entirely true, though. I mean, you can prove your ownership nor sell the NFT at all if you have a copy of it. If you have the NFT, you can just, you have proof that you own it and you can easily sell it. It's like, just because you have the copy and paste of the JPEG money, JPEG monkey is that you're not making, but you're not making money off it. Uh, actually, just here, one update I want to do from last semester, which is, uh, the Giga Chat NFT from last semester, as you can see right here, there was a bid on it for about $3,000 and one was for 18,000, which is crazy. I wanted to give a update on a price. Unfortunately though, the owner of the NFTs have delisted them. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anyone bought them or not. I was able to get a, yeah. Not, it's not really a rug pull, they're still selling NFTs. It's just those, these NFTs in particular has been delisted. I don't think anyone bought them. So I guess over the, I kind of hyped this up a bit saying, wow, people are buying this. NFTs might survive a bit, but as you can see, as I showed in the past slides, there's been a slow decrease, at least according to the, at least according to in Google searches. I mean, I can't say this is a tire representation of the public interest of NFTs, but it is a Google search. Um, and that, that is a good, a good metric to go by. I'm not really enthusiastic about metaverse. NFTs, are, I, I personally like, but metaverse, I mean, I like to see this chart during the Super Bowl. 
Yeah, good point. The metaverse had a good high interest, but it seems to be dipping a little bit faster than compared to NFTs. All the crypto related ads. Yeah, def, I, I want to, I would want to see that too, Jay. And uh, here's citations for everything I explained so far. Uh, here's go, this link in particular goes a bit more into uh, the argument about how NFTs are just a lot more than just being JPEGs and just pieces of media. They, they, have, they definitely have value. I agree with that. And uh, I have the, still have the citation for Yuji Ijiri from last, from last presentation. He's, got, he's the <clears throat> accountant who invented the triple entry bookkeeping, which is relevant to the blockchain. And uh, here's the source I use for, which I covered for, for Russia sanctions and crypto, particularly this uh, Economist article. article. Unfortunately, there's a big paywall with this one. So if you want to see this one right here, I just sent, I think you have the link, Jay, that the press the suite sent you. Or if you don't have it, I can just send you the, I can just send you the word point, word document myself. Sure, I'll do that. And uh, interest in NFTs and metaverse is falling fast. Yeah, this is from the Forest Magazine, which the, the, the I, had to, I had to give a disclaimer with this one. The article, the author himself just used to, yeah, he just used the Google search, search interests as his, as his tire basis for the article. So it's not, it's not that NFTs is gonna crash anytime soon. Don't worry about that. It's just that interest in, in Google searches, which is just declining. And it's not entirely crash as you can see right here. But I would be wary of going into an NFTs or the metaverse at this point. And uh, that's my presentation so far. Uh, thanks, Jay, for for looking at it. Cool. So um, this is video number six, and we're going to kind of uh, go back a little bit just so that we could see his build up to his Excel plugin. Um, and in case um, it, it didn't last time you weren't able to see how fast he did it, we'll just um, go through that again. Let's look at the S&P 500. And then we can add metrics to it. So we want to see the index value. But let's say we want to look at valuations. I apologize. Let's right. pull it back. In right. this lesson, we're going to look at the charting function in Capital IQ. Look at the S&P 500. And then we can add metrics to it. So we want to see the index value. But let's say we want to look at valuations. We want to look at based to earnings. Sergio, are you are you just seeing my dashboard of that? Okay. Um, let me try to get it on the correct screen. Here we go. So let's look at price to normalized EPS. There we go. So we can see here the turquoise line is the index value and the orange line is the PE ratio. So the PE ratio is shown on the right axis, the index value of the left axis. So we can see that it's currently trading at 37 times price to normalized EPS. This is in November, 2020. And you can see the history here with it hitting the low during the midst of the COVID-19 lockdowns, uh, just below 20 X. We can, of course, play with the chart to go back further. Let's say we want to see five years of history of index value and PE ratio. We've got that there. So this is and so if you look up at the top ribbon um, or the blue ribbon at the top, it'll say charting. If you go to that, it'll pull up your save charts or anything else. And so let's actually speed up um, since we have our charts, right? See if you could 
load your chart, right click in the pane to explore for more options and it sells in Excel. Let's see. So mine, did you save your... Um, Mine did not save none of the EPS or what about yours? Like the volume or, or stuff that you can pick that it shows? Yeah, okay, yeah, you might not have been here for one of them. Um, and so it, it wants daily normalized EPS. And then he wants index value, right? Which is just the share price, right? And so that's cool. Cool, yeah, I saved it for both, all right. <clears throat> so if you click metrics, you can pick index value and normalize EPS. And so this is quite old, but this is the part where he shows you the, the Excel. And that's what we want to capture real quick. And then we'll, we'll jump. A common type of chart you may want to build. Let's uncheck that. And let's do compare. Let's compare the S&P 500 with Amazon. Now it becomes a relative share price chart. So it's looking at the percentage difference between the two in terms of their performance. So you can see that the S&P 500 over this time period has increased 57%, whereas Amazon has increased nearly 400%. So a relative share price chart can be quite helpful for all sorts of presentations or analysis that you may do. So we've created this custom chart. Pause for a moment to... I'm hitting compare and then I'm, maybe it's picking the wrong pane. There's only one pane. Put in Amazon's ticker. Okay, I get it. So you can't just hit um, enter or something when you want to, you hit compare and you got to go over to the right and hit add yeah. or it will um, won't work. <laughs> In capital IQ. Now let's export it to Excel. All right, good. So that top right key, charting Excel. All right, here we go. So here is the Excel download that we've done. And you can see it's created the chart for us with the underlying data. It's not just an image. We actually have the data. So we can then use this data to reformat the chart to match our company branding or, or whatever style guide we want to follow. And then we can take this and put it into presentations. So you can export, of course, a lot more data than just this. You could add all sorts of metrics to this, compare all sorts of companies. And then in Excel, you can create all sorts of different charts and graphs for your presentations. Now we're gonna look at how you can use Capital IQ to manage your workflow. And so if you actually look at your Excel spreadsheet, you see where it says Bloomberg, or it might say Bloomberg on yours. Oh, like right up here, you hit and yeah. on it but it doesn't matter anyways later on it's going to add capital iq up top of it and it has like a bunch of you know really good functions we're going to explore coverage and projects coverage simply means companies that you're trying to work with or are working with and relationships that you have so let's go into coverage and create a coverage list example and we're just making a test here. 
We work in investment banking in the technology, media, and telecommunications group, and we cover Apple. We're going to add Apple to our coverage list. Let's look for Samsung. And these are some, some companies that we cover. Oh, we didn't pick up Google there. That's actually Alphabet, right? So here we have our list. We need to add at least one person. So I'll add just myself for now. Now I've created this coverage list called example with all these companies. And so I can use this to easily track these businesses, their activity, and to manage some workflow for me. Going to coverage tracking, I can add notes here. So strategy notes, relationship details, etc. And you can imagine that if there was a large team and a lot of companies to cover, it'd be very helpful to have all of this organized in here. Now and project management. Let's create a new project. We'll also call this example. So we can have the project name project status, groups. There's lots of information that you can add here to a project. And by filling in all of the info here for the project, and then using the search function, your entire organization can centrally store all this information. See here, a project example is the only project in the system. You can imagine if there were a lot of projects, I could search for them by name, or by criteria and help manage some workflow here at Capital IQ. All right, in this lesson, we are gonna look at portfolios and we're gonna generate a sample portfolio to show you how this works. We are inside the example portfolio that Capital IQ has generated for us, where you could manually add positions and then get some interesting reporting where you can see sector allocation, geographic allocation, you can see the weighting, of each security in the portfolio, et cetera. So you could create all sorts of custom portfolios there. And you could also use the reporting function, which is an advanced feature that you would have to unlock. But if you unlock this feature, you can look at all sorts of super advanced reporting for portfolios as well. Our focus in using Capital IQ is primarily for the FMVA, which is for financial modeling evaluation. We really focus on the areas covered previously, which are companies, research, markets, screening, charting, and a little bit of coverage or projects. But really screening being the most powerful tool of all for us in Capital IQ. And in coming lessons, we will look at the Excel plugin, another very powerful form of crunching research and analysis for financial analysts. All right. In this lesson, we're going to install the cap. All right, cool. Now, um, now at least you've seen how it's downloaded and kind of some of the. Um, the features. Okay, I, I believe we got through this um, video too, and we're actually on, um, should be starting number eight, but let, it's important for us to go over this again, capital you know, IQ to make plugin. sure. Go to my capital IQ. I can speed it up a little, right? On the left navigation, go to downloads, then download the office plugin. Follow the prompts. Downloads, downloads, and... Um, like, I think on this computer, it was already on there. Uh, yeah. And then, so that's and it's something that on your laptop, it might, let's see, new installer. Says you must close the application. Okay. Right. 
next three next i think it'll say that you don't have the proper or the permissions to install which is cool right we'll just keep moving on you in a new excel workbook which you you can do it from um and so do you see that right there up at the top where it says s p right there now once you do the plugin on your laptop at home you'll be able to do it and i was talking with this energy company interview yesterday i was telling them about it how you can the tickers come in live and all you got to do is just switch the ticker and it'll pull all 10Ks. Everything updates instantly. And he's he's like, damn, because he was saying that they usually only have, they have about 8,000 data points and they got to pull them within like 15 minutes. And oh, we have followed the prompts to install the SMP Capital IQ plugin. And we can access it here on the ribbon now. And so if you look up at that ribbon, I wanted to pause and see it. It has unfresh, unlinked template formula, screening, which is the most powerful, upload formula builder. Uh, it sounds like a dream for us, right? Everything to make our jobs easier. First thing I want to show you is the pre-installed templates. These are very powerful tools for getting started. Let's go to financials and then let's go to standard. Once this is loaded, we can see that we've got a set of financial statements for IBM. And we can see that everything here in green is a capital IQ formula with this at CIQ syntax. And we can see that we've got all sorts of items here with different time periods. And capital IQ is pulling these numbers in. Now, if you really want to see the power of this tool, we can go up here to the ticker, which is what's controlling this entire template. And we can change it from, say, IBM to. GE's financials. So you can see that this is a pretty powerful tool. Yeah, that's it right there, bro. That's creating that's, profiles or creating. Especially when you don't got to be connected to Bloomberg and you're at your house, you wake up at two in the morning and you're like, hey, I got an idea. You could change the date across here. You could change the fiscal periods. You've got LTM here. That's super handy. Now, let's try to recreate some of the stuff that's built here manually. You may not always want to use a template like this. You may sometimes want to calculate things yourself. So let's look here. This is 2019 year-end total revenues for GE. Let's rebuild that number off on the side here. Let's go to Formula Builder. We're going to have the identifier of the company, which is the ticker, linked to this cell here. What we're going to look for is revenue, total revenue. That's the metric that we want. An absolute period, in this case, fiscal year 2019. We will link to the cell here that controls the as of date. And for the currency, let's also link here to US dollars. We'll then click add formula. So what you see here is this number pops in. Let's just format it. You can see that we get the same number here as we got with the preloaded template. So that's how we're able to manually build a financial line item. And we could go down and do that for any of these items and for any time period. That's how you can pull in data into Excel using the Cap IQ plugin. All right, let's look at another example of a template. Let's go to valuation and then let's pick WAC, weighted average cost of capital. We've got a very nice template where we can see all of the assumptions. We can see a beta calculation section over here. Sensitivity analysis, and ultimately down here, the overall whack for IBM. And you can play with the assumptions. There's all sorts of things in here that you can change. And you can do a very detailed weighted average cost of capital analysis using this template. And now let's go into valuation again, and let's pick 
DCF. Let's look at the discounted cash flow. Here we go. Here's the DCF analysis. You can see once again, there are assumptions laid out for IBM. You've got a beta calculation built into this. Here's the WAC that we saw previously. But beneath it, we've got the projected cash flows. We've got some historical numbers for reference, then those forecasted out into the future. We can see some growth rates here. That's nice and helpful. DCF assumptions. And then finally, you get to the present value. Then there's sensitivity analysis beneath that as well, where the terminal value is sensitized based on different inputs. Working capital assumptions. So you can see that there is a lot here in this template. You've got a lot to work with. And you can simply switch from IBM to any other company just by changing the ticker. Let's just change that to GE for General Electric. So then we could take a look at GE's numbers here. Let's go back to IBM. Let's scroll down really at the end of the day. This is what we're looking at. We're getting an implied share price based on the DCF analysis. We then got the company's current share price as observed in the market. And we can see if it's trading at a premium or a discount to that implied share price or that intrinsic value, which may indicate a buy or sell opportunity, depending on how you look at it. Of course, you'd have to carefully analyze the assumptions that generate the forecast to see if you agree with this assessment here. So here, this model is saying that the current share price is significantly higher than the implied share price should be based on the model. But the devil is in the details. You'd have to look at all of these assumptions and see if you agree with them. Of course, you could change them and ultimately come to your own view on intrinsic value relative to the public market price. So this is a great tool if you want to quickly get started on a discounted cash flow analysis. Look at one more template together. Let's go to company tear sheets. And how about this one pager? All right, oh, so yeah, I like this one a lot. Really nice one pager that summarizes IBM. We can see the valuation of the business, share price chart, capital structure, a financial summary here, and then some charts as well that have like say you were in private equity and, and you had like all these companies you had to look through every day and you just had a little bit amount of time, you could pull them up on here real fast, boom, you could screen them out. Right, the financial summary and the valuation, dividend history, key management members, ownership, there's a lot of good stuff here. So you can imagine that this type of one pager template, which by the way, can be very easily updated by simply changing the ticker be extremely useful to you as a financial analyst. Like that, now we've got the whole analysis done for GE. So this is a great tool for creating one page profiles on companies. You could take these and insert them into presentations, turn them into PDFs on their own, combine a whole series of them into one big PDF booklet. There are a lot of ways to use this tool and this template to save yourself a lot of time. All right, let's look at a simple example of how we can use the formula builder to create our own template. And so we can not do this unless you're able to get the plugin. By using the identifier. But I don't, I don't think you can because of the school. Yeah, I, I want it, man. It's as long as you download it on your personal one. I then want to get revenue. So let's go into the income statement here. Select total revenue. We can select the 2019 fiscal year of date and currency, which will be the global default. Let's add the formula here and press OK. We can take this and fill it right with Control R. The total revenue in 2019 for IBM and for GE. And you can see in the formula here what is being referenced. So if you want to disaggregate this into a more dynamic formula, you can strip parts of it out. Let's take a look at how to do that. 
So let's study the syntax here. You can see that it starts by taking the company's ticker symbol, which we've linked up here dynamically, so that's good. But then what we want to do is strip out revenue. And we can actually replace the label here with IQ total revenue. And then we can delete this. And make it here, which we can anchor in place using F4 a couple of times. is looking a bit more dynamic, like our typical Excel formulas we like to build. Let's also strip out the fiscal period, top left corner, as an assumption. So we can now delete that from the formula, and we can link it here. Let's press F4 once to anchor that in place, fill it right with Control R. the current date as of date which we can copy and paste here let's change the reference in here let's just quickly format this There we go. Now we've got a nice dynamic formula. We want to fill it in for EBIT and net income. All we have to do is go into the formula builder. I thought he was just going to drag down, bigger. right? And it would instantly update. I've been like, oh, okay, I see why you did all that. Out the CIQ code for EBIT. We can see that it's IQ underscore EBIT to cancel. Let's do the same for net income. IQ underscore and I. So we're going to fill these formulas down. First, let's just make sure everything is in place to fill down. We want to make sure that the reference to the ticker, which is cell B2, it's properly anchored, so we will always refer to row two. So fill that right with control R. If we've done our anchoring properly, we can fill all that down with control D. And there we go. We get the numbers that we wanted. Let's press F5, go to special. Let's select all constants. We want to format those to be blue. Indicate that they are hard coded assumptions that drive our model. We've got in black these dynamic formulas. We can change these if, for example, we want 2018 instead of 2019. Numbers just like that. Yeah, that's great right there. If instead of General Electric, we want Goldman Sachs, we simply change it to GS. We get Goldman Sachs numbers there. We would have to do a deeper dive as to why there is an NA for EBIT in 2018 for GS. So let's just change this back now to GE. We also want to add a company name here. Let's just do this one last item. Let's go to Cap IQ Formula Builder, search for company name. Let's reference to the cell here. Press OK. There we go. It's filled to the right. And I like to have company name here. Let's change it to a formula because if you're simply referencing a ticker and you don't know all the tickers by heart, it could be easy to have a typo in the ticker and you'd never know down here based on the revenue alone. But if it's linking to the company name, of course you would know right away if you have the wrong ticker. So that's how you can start to build a custom template for yourself as a financial analyst using the S&P Capital IQ plugin.
Thank you so much for joining us for this course. We've covered capital IQ use cases for investment banking, equity research, investment management, credit, private equity and venture capital, and for corporations. We've looked at a lot of the functions across capital IQ, and we've really focused in on screening as one of the most interesting use cases for capital IQ. We hope you've seen the power of this platform. And I encourage you to get two months of free access to Capital IQ through CFI's Full Immersion Program. If you're not already registered in the Full Immersion Program, you can go to your student dashboard where you can enroll, or you can upgrade from the basic to Full Immersion Program. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for this Capital IQ Fundamentals course. Man, about like a year ago, that, that CFI Institute, it was... Um like 500 bucks and you got the whole course, lifetime, certification, everything. Right, now, we're gonna cert now it's like a monthly fee because it went from, they had like two or three certifications. Now they got about five or six. And of course they're charging the premium. Um, I think that's about all the videos that he gives for free there. I was going to just pay out a pocket myself for it. That way I could get more videos, but I have another plan. See if we can actually go to his page. Here it is. Okay. Yeah, so I guess is that's the video he has on it. I'm definitely going to get some more videos off of, um, I believe in the first meeting I showed to where if you just get on the S&P website, like on the Capital IQ website, they have um, like training for students. They have about 10 videos of their own. And actually, let's just go take a look at that right now. And so um, that way... Once Professor Sweet watches the video, he can, um, you know, kind of push us in the right direction that we should go. Um, here we go. It says news and insight solution product login. Let's see for students. It should be up here, right? Mm. Okay, so I guess it's in academia. Oh, student, let's go there. Um, come on, I know there's a lot, I've seen them before. Let's see. What do you like the most about it, Sergio? Yeah. Well, I thought it showed. Well, let's see what video said. Uh... Mm. 
solution structure. Maybe you got to access it through product login. I don't understand why it's not popping up. Hold on, um, student. Go. This might be it. Once you log in. Okay, yeah, you, can you see that? It says platform functionality, training, visio, basics. Oh, I apologize, give me one moment. Dun, 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 dun. There you go. And so in this one, Training webinar recordings. Let's see what the screening looks like. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Gives you the videos right there. Uh, they had some other ones that was, it was about 10 videos that students should do, and you were supposed to work for them through them. Um, training videos. Here's a list that blah, blah, blah. Uh, when I find it, um, I'm going to send it to you, Sergio. Maybe I can get your email or your student email or whatever, or if you're on the Discord group. Okay. All right. And, um, I think that's pretty much all we really got. I mean, we can just kind of look through. That's cool. Um, important training. Let's see if it's right here or no. Dun, 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 dun. Office plugins. Oh, they got a word plugin too. PowerPoint, cell template videos, press center plugin training videos. Profile Excel model that is available to all SP Capital IQ users who have access to the Capital IQ Excel plugin. This model is an ideal way to prepare C level, presentable, and customizable tear sheets on investors. At yeah, I'm, I'm sure Tim, um, you know, did that in, in double speed, right? Uh, and that's all I got for today. I'm going to spend the weekend um, searching the internet and and messing around on there. And then I'm gonna um, ask Professor Sweet what he thinks. Thank you for coming out. Hey, thank you, Juan. All right, was um, you know, we had to go back a little, but definitely if you can, um, on your laptop at home, go to the library database and then do the capital IQ plugin. You too, man. God bless you. Have a good, have a good weekend. Hey, do you know Natasha Burns? Why does that name sound so familiar? Is that an instructor? Yeah. Professor? Do you have a class at six? So, hello. Um, this is class number four. I'm sorry we missed last week. I had some things I had to handle. Uh, my parents just uh, moved back to New Zealand, so I just wanted to spend some time with them. Uh, but I'm glad everybody's here today. And this is class number four, like I said. And we're going to be going uh, last week or two weeks ago, for spring break, three weeks ago. We went over classes and objects. Um, we went over the different types of loops. Um, remember, there's four loops. There's while loops. 
Um, and then with classes and objects, that's a pretty important topic. So um, this as well, this week's kind of going to be somewhat of a review week because next week I would like to kind of start making a project on Jupiter, just like kind of do something fun, something interesting that we can actually take all the knowledge that we've learned so far and actually apply it to something. So that should be fun. So if you have time, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, it doesn't have to be long, just um, just do like a little bit of research on your own time about classes and objects. If you took notes uh, two, three weeks ago, go back and look at those. Um, really anything, just kind of check it out, go review it. So next week we can, we can just hop right into it. And then we also went over lambdas, which is just kind of like, um, it helps save space a little bit. And then for our overview of today, we're gonna go over iterators, scope and built-in functions. And so for iterators and built-in functions, we kind of dabbled in that a little bit. Um, built-in functions mainly, remember we did like max, min, uh, mean, average, stuff like that. Um, but we're going to get a little bit further into depth with it today. And just so we can kind of, so we can um, learn some things that are useful to know. And if we ever get into any problems, we can try and solve them with uh, a few of the built-in functions. So first we're going to go over iterators and inheritance. And an iterator is essentially, um, let's start with something that's iterable. So it's a list, a tuple, a dictionary, a set. All of these are iterable. And what that means is that it can be um, it can be gone through and repeated. So, I mean, you could run a loop. You could run it through a loop. If you have a dictionary, you can loop it and have it print out each word. So that is what iterable means. An actual iterator itself is um, it's the function telling so you make a function uh you make a set and then you say iterate this set and then you print out each line or if we wanted to we could just run it through a loop and then it would automatically do that itself and it would print out each variable in the string or each um, number in the in the um, equation whatever we'd like to do and then for inheritance um uh, so for inheritance, um, it's not anything crazy. It's so uh, two, three weeks ago when we did classes and objects, if you remember, we created the class and then we put the parameters for the class and then we created an object after we had finished creating the class and that class's parameters were then passed on to that object. So that's what we call inheritance. That's basically just saying that if you create this class and then you make a subclass or an object under it, then you can pass those parameters onto it. You don't have to, usually you do though. Um, so that's inheritance and iterators um, for, for, next thing we have is scope. And scope is like, it's really not complicated, but it's really good knowledge to have and understand and be able to like go through a few lines of code and kind of pick out if something's local or global. Just being able to tell can also help you debug um, when you run into errors in your code and things like that. So if um, everybody can see this little graphic I have right here, it's really perfect. So it's kind of like a Venn diagram, except not really. So you have the local scope at the very bottom. And what that means for our local scope, um, it's inside of a function. So if we make a function and here, actually this will be easier for me to show you on. Um, Good I'm good on the Zoom. Okay. Okay. So if we if we make a function define my function. Okay, so we have my function and with the syntax. And then in this function, we declare that X 
is equal to 300. Okay. And then, so this is local. This is a local scope because we have the function, my function, and then right underneath it, we have X is equal to 300. So one thing about local scope is this function or this X is now only defined in my function. If I were to do my function and then ask for print X, and then we try and run this, I get an error and it's a name error because because X is not defined because it's outside, I'm asking it outside of the function instead of inside. So that's gonna be our local scope. And kind of on the flip side of that, we have our global scope, which is the exact opposite. So if we did X equals 300, and then we did my function, and then, Did print so this doesn't give me an error. Um, no, no, it's, so it's outside of the function because it's. Oh, um, well, so if I was, I was just trying to show you it, the error message that would pull up if I did try and call it within the function. Um, but yeah, sometimes, but um, so basically if you try and call it within the function, um, you cannot, you, you can, um, you can use the X. And if we wanted to, um, Let's go, it can be, so it can be accessed locally or globally um, since it's outside. And then if, um, if we wanted to make this, if we wanted to do it in the function, but we still wanted to make it global, we could do global and then X equals 300 and then So yeah, so then we would do, we would make global X and then X 300. And now this defines X as global, although it is still within a function. And so back to the diagram over here. So we have the local scope and then you see the circle closes off. And then we go into the global scope, which is the local scope is still included in the global scope. And then you have the built-in, which are functions that are just automatically built in that um, everybody has access to. So, and um, now we have our built-in functions. Um, like I said, this is, some of these are a review. We went over max, min, um, mean, um, a few ones that are good to learn. I know we kind of went over sorted a little bit. Um, and then help, if you ever don't know um, what exactly a function does or what you can do with it, you can do help and then type the function and it'll actually pull up exactly what it does and the syntax and everything that you need to know. Um, DIR will check um, all the local variables and it will also, um, show you how many, um, what like parameters are attached to a certain object. Um, and so for zip, um, zip is mainly used with iterable objects, um, iterable or set a tuple. If you have two of them and you want to run a loop through both of them, then you would use the zip function um, for that. 
And then super is something we'll learn a little bit later on, but that's um, that has to do with inheritance. And you can essentially use the function and you don't have to type in the class or the object that you want the parameters passed on to. It'll just take whatever class or object you have created and automatically pass on those parameters. And then um, these aren't, aren't um, terribly important to know now. It's more for later on. Um, open, this can open a file. Um, you can open it in different ways, read only. You can open it right if you need to edit it. Um, different things like that. Um, is subclass and is instance. The subclass is something within a class that you would create just kind of as a subclass. And this is where inheritance would also come in because subclasses would inherit the parent classes uh, parameters. And then callable, if something is callable, if you can um, retrieve it from one a different destination than you are actually at, then it'll return true. Um, if not, it will return false. And so like I said, this uh, today was more kind of a review because next week I would like to get into a project, um, some, something interesting, something we can all have fun with, um, just kind of use our knowledge and um, put it to the test. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Can you go back to your, your program? I certainly can. Oh, on the uh, on the global. Why isn't it printing So that I'm actually not sure. Let's try this. So I'm unsure as to why, let's see if I did. I may have just had the uh, syntax messed up. Yeah, so I did, I just had the, uh, the syntax messed up. Um, so when I was trying to print it in here, I had this print line tabbed out. And if it's tabbed, it, it uh, Okay. Of course. Of course. All right. So I need to go look. I haven't gotten our videos up on YouTube, but maybe this weekend I can and go back and review the Yeah, I'm mean, aiming. It didn't, like I said, it really won't take long. It's just kind of a quick overview of everything that we've gone over. You don't even have to go over everything more classes and objects and just make sure that you don't have to know the syntax, but just be somewhat familiar with it. I mean, you know, like what you use for a set, tuple, dictionary. Um, that type of thing. So if you can, if you have time, I totally recommend checking that out. Um, just kind of looking into it a little bit. Um, if not, no worries. You know, I'll go over everything next week um, during class. And uh, yeah. All right. All right. So if you, if you're ready. Okay. Yes, sir. And thank you for showing up and y'all have a nice rest of your day. 2.15. I'll go ahead and I'll start. So, as you guys know, I'm Jacob, this is the uh, digital assets course. So it's very worth noting that, um, as you can see here, Bitcoin actually reaches year to date, finally, after being in the, the slumps for a little while. Um, we're now heading into April, uh, finally recovering. It's, I don't know what it's at right now. I know, I believe it was at like a 5% rally today. Um, but this is the year to date as of today, um, whenever I made this. And then here's the uh, price of Bitcoin since last Sunday. Um, can you not see it? How about now? Oh, it's showing, yeah, it's showing, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, I can see. Um, so this is the price of Bitcoin since, well, I'll just go back since Jay just joined us. Uh, year to date, Jay, we just said uh, we got, we're finally recovering after being down. So hopefully we can um, 
say somewhere in this range. And then here's a price since last Sunday. We see that uh, Bitcoin has actually gone up 12.3% through since last Sunday, which is pretty amazing. Um, great to see we had some eventful days on the 24th. And um, while wow, it looks like some late hours on the weekend and on Sunday, uh, I know I was watching it here, but nothing crazy. And then going to gold, what do you think the resistance is now? Oh, gosh. Uh, honestly, that's a hard one. I, for some reason, I'm bearish. I, I don't know why. I just think it's going to be hard to support these levels. Um, but, I mean, we never know. I, I think that we're we're just going to fluctuate back up and down. Probably, gosh, I hate, I hate doing price predictions, but um, I could definitely see it correcting to 45. I mean, that's where we see a big jump here. Um, but I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we go back to 38 anytime soon. Um, I mean, that's, gosh, a, a fat difference between where we're at now. Uh, I actually don't know. It's really interesting. I, I have no clue. I've been reading the news. I've been watching it. I don't know why there's a big run up. I know there was a big run up last week on Ethereum, uh, which I'm going to show. So maybe I know I know they're not too heavily correlated, but they're pretty correlated. Um, the overall market, I think uh, there's just a lot of buyers. But no, I, I don't know any of the specific news. But if you do, um, I'd love to hear them. Uh, so the price of gold since last Sunday, here we go. We're up almost a percent. Um, and then Ethereum, here we go, 14.3. So a little bit higher than um, Bitcoin. But the previous week of Ethereum, I believe, was also pretty strong. I don't think it was this strong, but um, really, really strong. Um, we broke three. The 22nd, uh, Sunday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Um, so yeah, and then here's the trading volumes for our uh, top two stable coins um, by market cap. So we're gonna see Tether here um, has some nice volume. Um, really dipped, really really dipped. Um, and then also um, U.S. dollar coin. I want to say that's because it's a Saturday, you know, um, not too much market going on on Saturday. Uh, so Tether is its own. They're uh, stationed in the Bahamas. Um, that's where their reserves are. And I want to, I don't know where the U S dollar coin is, um, uh, um, reserves are, but, um, mainly the difference is they're just two different coins, stable coins. But the reality is that they have, a a one-to-one -to, -one to the U S dollar. So they're not U S this isn't actually the U.S. dollar coin. Um, so the United States doesn't have any backing on this. Um, but just to say that these are the um, these are the main two stable coins by market cap. Thanks for asking these questions, Jay. I uh, appreciate it. Yes, it's made by Coinbase. I don't know if USDC is made by Coinbase, actually, but we can do a quick Google check. Hmm. It looks like it's a company called Circle. Um, I want to do a whole thing on uh, stable coins. Today I'm doing a, a thing on, um, gosh, let me turn on. Uh, like uh, Web3. I'm doing Web3 today. I know a lot of guys wanted to see Web3, unfortunately, not here, but. Um, but yeah, it looks like this company Circle is taking a hold of it. I don't know this company. Um, let's see what they say about USDC though. 1.9 trillion transferred on centralized finance, decentralized. I'm looking to alternatives to gain yield besides a savings account. So um, when you mean savings account, are you talking about like a crypto savings account or are you more um 
like the modern savings account, like through Wells Fargo or um, like these other banks? Because I know uh, Gemini, I mean, I've been, I've been, yeah, it's not a savings account. I know, um, let me show you this company. This is, this is where I personally have my savings account. Um, not 100% of it, but definitely like a good 80% of it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you can see here, you can, um, any cons of this one, the only con um, is if you need the money in your actual physical bank account, uh, it's not there. Um, they are, they're New York licensed. So they're not, uh, they don't have a federal license, but they do have that New York. Um, I forget the, the actual name of it. Let's see, it's, it should be down here. Yeah, and um, it's a 8%. 8% uh, staking with them. And this is their coin. So, I mean, if look right here, 8.05 APY on your cryptocurrency. Um, but that's only with their, uh, their Gemini dollar. So, I mean, here is your protect. If you put, I mean, I don't know if you have 10,000 laying around, but here's a little calculator they have for you. Um, $1,600 in two years. That's pretty nice. Um, I personally don't have that much with them, but this is around what I have with them. So, I mean, that's what I'll be getting. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then, yeah. And I know DAI is another stable coin. Is it paid quarterly? It's actually paid monthly. Um, so, I mean, you'll, you'll get your, your APY monthly. Yeah. 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 It's, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Yeah. So, um, try to come next week. I, if you, I'm going to, I'm going to do a thing on stable coins next week. So you should come out to that one. Um, I'll touch a lot more on this and all the other options um, in the market. So that's, those are the stable coin volumes uh, worth noting the um, around 78. So what is web three? www dot or worldwide web. Web three will be built using decentralized blockchains. Um, not entirely, but that's what a lot of the uh, the hype around it is. So Web3 contains dApps or decentralized applications, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, commonly, yeah, a big move away from big tech. Um, DAOs also known as decentralized autonomous uh, corporations instead of organizations. Um, DeFi, decentralized finance, and smart contracts. Um, I'm going to touch on dApps, DAOs, and NFTs, DeFi, and smart contracts on another one. Uh, I could have included smart contracts into this session. Um, unfortunately, I just I just didn't get to it. But uh, I think I I'll make it up in my uh, books and podcasts books and podcasts. Today. So going on. Um, I think this is an amazing thread. Um, I don't really personally know this woman. Uh, so maybe she's a Russian bot. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, she goes on to say the World Wide Web, commonly known as the web, is something built on top of the Internet, a collection of documents that can be requested by a browser from a server. Um, and why is there a three? And then also what was one and two? So web one, static pages, read only, not interactive, more consumers, less creators. Um, web two, interactive, social web, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, read and write, gave birth to more creations and creators, largely handled by big tech firms. Um, Mr. Sweet, when you were first introduced to the internet, what were your thoughts? Yeah. My boss went around talking about stuff in the net. It was really cool. We didn't really know. Did you exchange? I mean, because it was just a way to get emails to each other. Yeah. But it's a way to get news. Commerce. Was it thought about commerce at all? Did um, did you send your first email in the nineties? Oh, I can't remember. Um, no, in the eighties, we were able. We were able to communicate within the company. Okay. With yeah, there I forget what it was called, but we could send messages within the company not outside the company okay my own personal aol i had aol um i said that the first time
Oh, I can't, I can't remember. Yeah. Was it like strictly business? You just communicating with clients and like uh, other professionals, or were you like texting your your brother or something well, on it? No texting. Yeah, I mean messaging your brother. E- emailing, not messaging anything. It's all email. Okay. No, um, I don't remember. Like, like students did and things was like much later. Yeah, I, I can't keep track. Yeah. <laughs> First email was intro company all within USA, not outside to other people. Yeah, they had that server, I'm yeah, sure. Just send messages to each other. Was that with USA? It was in within USA, yeah. No. Cool. We had to pick up the phone and call people. But we didn't have any cell phones, so each time we were away from your desk, you got a vacation from people bugging you. Did you get a bunch of phone calls whenever you're back? They like just voicemails um, and stuff. Well, voicemail was even that didn't exist. Really? Until they didn't the have 90s. a message? Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, if it's from there, it just rang. Yeah. Wow, I had no clue. That's pretty cool. Did you have a secretary at your position where someone answered the phone call, like, hey, he's not um, in right now? I have avoided secretaries when I got promoted. I just, I That's interesting. Because I could type on my emails, I could type on my papers. I wanted technicians, I wanted analysts, like Michael. And so yeah, um, yeah. I, I now after I left, I hired all kinds of people. But yeah, <laughs> if I don't, I don't need my I can do my own trips. I can do anything else. It was they weren't really useful to. Yeah, that's good information. Um, so moving on, why Web three, Web two centralization is a big thing. Um, I'm going to talk about it in my book, but the entire premise of Bitcoin was basically built off these. Um, I'm not going to call them punks, but that's what they want to be referred to. Um, gosh, I forget the actual name for them. Cypherpunk. There you go. There you go. You know a little bit. Cypherpunk. Um, so cypherpunks in this book were the whole premise of this. Um, and yeah, Julian. And uh, I talk about Eric Voorhees on here a little bit. Um, yeah. There you go. There you go. So um Moving on, centralization, there's just a big, been a humongous pushback on it. Um, so decentralized web runs on blockchain technology, although not always. Um, read, write, your own. No particular companies owning the data, platforms and applications not owned by central authority. Key features of Web3, um, they're built on an open, built from open source Software, trustless, no intermediary required, permissionless, no authorization. That's spelled wrong. Like I said, they're probably from somewhere else. Secure, not owned centrally. Um, privacy, no direct data breach. And yeah, so uh, OSHA did a thread on dApps, I guess. But um, yeah, and uh, that's basically what people want to call the future of the internet but we'll see if it, it actually is. Um, I think a good test, and I mean, obviously this is speaking very plain, but in 10 years, I, th- I think it would be interesting to see where we're at with these applications and NFTs and stuff. Um, so browsers and search engines, I don't know if it was you uh, who corrected me. Honestly, I didn't really know. I'm not a humongous technical guy, um, believe it or not. I didn't really know the difference between a browser and a search engine at the time. So I did actually do brush up on a little research. Uh, so a browser, meaning Firefox, Internet Explorer, Chrome, is a program to display websites. While search engines, Google, Bing, Yahoo, and DuckDuckGo, um, commonly used for privacy, are a particular website that provides you with search results. The theory behind decentralized websites will be no filtered, in or censored search results um yeah exactly um no filtered uh censured search results no central authority used privacy and anonymity so as we can see um a lot of this like this is a humongous thing um with the cypherpunk and even with normal everyday people um having your information censored um, is a big thing. Tor browser, yeah, Tor is a great one developed by um, the US Navy, I believe, Tor browser. Um, 
That, that was a great one. I've actually used Tor Browser a couple of times. It's pretty interesting. Um, no central authority used, um, as in the case of some of the, the information I'm going to give below. Privacy and anonymity. Um, DuckDuckGo likes to give that, but unfortunately, recently, DuckDuckGo said, they actually said on Twitter, it, it wasn't them in general, but it was their CEO. So if you know DuckDuckGo, it's known for um, being that alternative browser that you want to use if you're going to look up something controversial. But they actually, the CEO actually came out and said that they censored some results, which was really mind-blowing and there's been a humongous internet push away from these privacy people to go away from um duck, duck, go. and honestly whenever i saw that i was actually exposed to um one of the applications i'm gonna talk about below but yeah so um some of the downsides for google is uh not only does google keep a search history forever by default their trackers have been found on 75 percent of the top million websites which means they're tracking most everywhere you go on the internet. And that actually is from DuckDuckGo. So I have a little funny story this week. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, funny story of the week. So I was at HEB walking down the snack aisle and I saw peanuts unsalted, um, already like cut up and stuff. So it's just the peanut itself. And I was like, oh, like, I need some protein. This would be great to mix in with some of my meats. Um, let's, let me get my, let me get some peanuts. And so I got my peanuts on, I want to say Tuesday or Sunday last week. And I eat them throughout the week. It's not a big thing. And on Friday, I was at home and there's maybe a little bit of peanuts left. And I finished the peanuts, not five minutes later, I'm at home relaxing and I hop on Instagram. And one of the first ads that hits me is for more peanuts. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I like to talk to myself, but I don't talk to myself out loud about eating peanuts. And I'm pretty positive I didn't say anything about peanuts being finished or I didn't even Google peanuts this week. I don't know how that happened but as soon as i finished my box of peanuts i got hit with an ad to get more peanuts that was very interesting and um pretty crazy <laughs> so going back um what are dapps word document via email let me open up my email and uh we have a little article that i want to go through with everybody about what dapps actually are so let me open up my gmail what are dapps can you see it, Professor, on the Zoom? Okay. So this is taken from brave.com. Um, most apps today run on centralized networks, blah, blah, blah. We talked about this. Um, but so these centralized networks raise the data security awareness and a bunch of concerns. Um, blockchain networks are decentralized, eliminating the need for big tech intermediaries. Both shared consensus and automated smart contracts make this functionality possible. Um, for example, let's say you want to send a crypto to some friend with dApps, decentralized applications. You log into your wallet, you select the amount. Um, and basically this is how the, the contract takes place if you wanted to do it over an exchange. Um, with Web2, here's an instance if you wanted to send the money, um, it would be processed occurs on the centralized network, um, which means the bank handles every component of the transaction, they own the data, and if they decide the transaction is valid or not. Um, I mean, honestly, like, I, I think the it's pretty efficient, like me and uh, Mr. Sweet were talking about the use of Zelle. And I mean, it's pretty much instantaneously um, up to certain amounts, though. Um, I know I use Zelle for my roommate, I, uh, I'm on I'm the leaseholder. But I, I do have a roommate. He pays me rent, and it, we do use it on Zelle. I want to say there is there a thousand dollar limit. Do you know the limit on Zelle? Well, it depends on the bank. So, like the USA, they limit me to two thousand. My brother's bank has to do seven thousand. Oh my gosh! Okay. Yeah. 
What's the difference between Zelle and Venmo? Uh, Venmo. Um, they're just two different corporations like PayPal. Um, PayPal is more merchant-based though, um, business to consumer, I would say. Um, Venmo is definitely consumer to consumer. Zelle, I would say, is consumer to consumer, although I do know some businesses that are taking it. I mean, this is just one of the things I'm throwing out of my head, but I do know um, the investment society business accepts dues in Zelle. Um, but I mean, it's not like that's a, a le- I mean, it is a business, but it's not like it's a legitimate business as such um, Starbucks. But I, I think Venmo, there's a card that you can get. Uh, maybe you can use that there. I don't know too much uh, besides that, just that there are two different applications. Zelle is integrated through um, different banks. So you can, um, instead of doing like wire transfers, you can just use Zelle. Um, yeah. So moving on, decentralized apps are blockchain based equivalent of these traditional applications. Um, this is a lot of highlighting, but I mean, just bullet point basically. No single point of failure, unlike traditional dApps, unlike traditional apps. Decentralized applications are more reliable because of the blockchain network span multiple nodes. And I was thinking about this. I think it's really awesome that this is a thing because say you're um, a server gets hit, the server would be down, Google would be down. But if you're using one, like some of them I'm gonna show you like Bra- uh, Brave, or if you're using uh, Presearch, say, I don't know, Norway, gets hit with, um, gosh, this is super extreme example, I understand, but like a solar flare or maybe like the grid just goes down. Um, And say a company's grid was in Norway, um, if they have these nodes literally elsewhere in the planet, um, it would still be running. Uh, So if Instagram crashes, all the users lose access to the app because they are centralized, but less likely a dApp will go offline because each node needs to fail simultaneously. That just goes back to the discussion of geopolitical. Um, This could help some of that um, and be a lot more stable, which I I think is gonna be a big thing in the future, especially. Um, So open source, the decentralized nature of the blockchain technology requires source code accessible to all network members. Um, Literally anybody can run a node on majority of the, these applications, um, there's full nodes, there's half nodes, there's, there's all type of nodes, um, depending on what application or blockchain we're going to use. Though. So in an ecosystem without intermediaries, users must identify and verify each app to avoid scams and exploitative malware. Um, then we can do this because it's open source code available to all members. Um, so if you're really invested, you'd probably read the code before you sign on to something. and you'd be able to see. Uh, Decentralized consensus mechanism. Without a central authority, blockchains must utilize consensus mechanisms to ensure the validity of all transactions. Whenever a dApp transaction occurs, the entire network is responsible for verification. Um, Utility tokens. This goes back to that that Brave token, that BAT that you can earn, and also the the pre-search token that I'm gonna go over that you can earn. Um, DApps integrate a utility token that guides platform economics. For example, many utility tokens enable DApp governance in app transactions and reward programs, among other use cases. What do you do with BAT? Can you convert it to anything useful? You could. You could use an exchange like Uniswap that I'm going to go over. It's a DAO. Um, you can use the rewards that you earn, um, and you can convert them to something else if you'd like. If you want to hold it at BAT, you can. That Gemini exchange that I was talking about, you can use the money that you earn surfing the internet, send it to that wallet and stake it and earn 4% um, APY, which I think is pretty cool just for searching the internet. Uh, uh, Okay, how are the search results quality compared to Google? The search results quality are pretty good. Um, I wouldn't say they're superior to Google. I actually moved away from Brave because the user interface application for me on my mobile, um, my iPhone just wasn't, my standards, um, but I do think that they showed a lot more uncensored material 
as such to Google that um, may censor some results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you do you personally use uh, Brave? No. Okay. As opposed to a wallet extension on Chrome. Do you do you personally use Google? Is um, like what I'm talking about, like appeal to you is privacy a big thing, censorship a big thing, or I mean, I I have Google application. And if I need something, I just Google it. Um, I'm not a huge privacy nut. I have nothing to hide. Yeah, me neither. Um, yeah. Uh, so now that we've defined what ADAP is and how they work, we can start to explore. So the types of DAPs. Um, this is on the Brave website. So if you wanted to, you can actually Google this. Um, just uh, what are DAPs? Um, moving on, what are they used for? While they look familiar on the front end, the back end exists on a decentralized database instead of the centralized server, which is exactly what we've been talking about. Um, and that's pretty much it uh, for this article. Yeah, cool. Where can I find this article? Um, if you just go to uh, brave.com and then type in what are dApps, here you go, right here. What are dApps and what are they used for? It's all right here. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so going on, an example of a dApp decentralized application, pre-search, it's, um, here's their motto. Um, one of their slogans on the websites, search privately, resolve, receive better results and get rewarded with pre-search decentralized engine powered by blockchain technology. We boasts. I'm not too sure what that is. Web Oasis. Okay, okay, yeah, I've heard of Web Oasis. Um, so this is actually a nonprofit community ran um, on the blockchain, those different nodes that we were talking about earlier. Um, they actually had a Medium article. I don't think I plugged it in, um, but it was it was actually written by Presearch instead of, I didn't mean to put research. Um, so here's a little thing about their customers. They return often and spend a significant amount of time, almost 10 minutes and four pages, four page views per session. I wanna say I personally uh, do my Wordle from the New York Times on uh, Presearch. I've I've been switching around. So I do have my Google Chrome just because I've integrated everything on Google Chrome. Um, but I also, I did use Brave for a little while. I never connected a wallet to it. I didn't really care that much, it's pennies. Um, but I did delete Brave to try pre-search. And I will say me personally, I've actually gone to like pre-search. Um, Come to like pre-search and I, I use it pretty much every day. But here's their uh, total engagement. I think these are some pretty cool numbers. They're headquartered in Canada. Um, total visits, 9.3 million. I don't, I'm not too sure what a bounce rate is. Average percentage of visitors who view only one page before leaving the website. So I, that's, I don't know if that's low or anything. I, I wish I would say. Uh, it, it doesn't give us a, a ranking on that. Um, pages per visit, here you go, 4.34. Wallet is built onto Brave. Yeah. Um, average duration, nine minutes and 49 seconds. So here we go. The last three months, um, I guess it's a little out of date, or else it would show February, but 11 million in November, basically 11 in December, but really jumped down to 9 million in January. Not too sure why that was. Um, here are their big targets. I want to say English was a big thing. Um, they're English users, but 23% in the United States, Brazil at 4%, Mexico at 4 Colombia at 4 Venezuela at 4 um, But yeah, it looks like a lot of Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking countries. Um, you don't really see too much on, uh, what about communist countries? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't see any on there. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they actually run nodes though. Um, but yeah, um, so I'm actually going to go to the website really quick just to show you the layout. Pre-search. 
So pre-search is pretty cool. You can use their search engine. Um, if you wanted to just Google some YouTube it, if you wanted to use Google, um, you can just use Google, DuckDuckGo, Etherscan, CoinMarketCap, and even search on Twitter, all within this one browser. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I haven't really taken advantage of all of those though, but uh, I wanted to talk on their privacy policy. So yeah, here's a, does the internet ISP see the results? Uh, I wanna say it says it here. It doesn't. I don't think they do though. Um, I want to say they could see where like information is sent to, but I don't think they see the results. If that makes sense. Um, so this privacy policy. Here we go. I want to say it was just updated. I read through it a little bit. Yeah, it was updated earlier this month actually. Um, on the first of the month. So anonymous data collection. Here you go. Uh, we collect certain data points which are disassociated from any account, IP address, or specific timestamp information. Uh, here we go. I want to say, yeah, fraud and abuse signals. Here we go. In order to prevent fraud, they implement... Here we go. Here's, here's a certain thing that I think is pretty cool. Fingerprinting of certain behaviors on the platform. What does that mean? Ooh. Um, so here's the information that they do say they collect. Um, email address, password, one-way encrypted. Uh, any information you provide. Information provided when making a purchase. Account referrals. I want to say they send you $25 for referring a friend. Um, I may be wrong, but I want to say that was it. Um, or it might be 25 of their token, actually. Let me take that back. Um, the search engine providers, you select your IP address, um, search events, when a search was conducted, how many tokens were earned, and what provider was used. So maybe that answers your question. Um, and I, I think it's a little different from some of the data that they can collect from the United States to the EU. Uh, which is pretty interesting to read. But yeah, and then here's California residents. May reach the compliant assistance unit. That's pretty cool. Um, oh, you know what? Here's, I think this is, oh, that's not it. But here's a, here's a little article that touches on that, um, that pre-search that I was mentioning. I don't remember how to get to it. Decentralization, thanks to the characteristics. Decentralization reduces stress concerns. We've already touched on that. Pre-search search engine, here we go. It's not just a search engine. It's a decentralized community effort and nonprofit organization will be owned and operated in a decentralized way by the Camino community. Um, I wanna say that's a DAO, I think. <laughs> pre-search has a basic search bar and offers a choice, as we saw. You can either use Google, DuckDuckGo, um, the YouTube. And then here we go. You can make up to a dollar and five cents a day. Wow. It pays users for searching. Um, here we go, per search with a cap of this. Um, this might be outdated. It might be less, it might be more, um, just because of the up, it goes up and down the price. Um, affiliate programs and pay 25 pre per referral. There we go, it wasn't $25, it was actually 25 pre of their token. Um, yeah, so unfortunately to withdraw your coins, you would need to have a wallet to transfer them into, and then you'd need a minimum of a thousand pre um, in order to take them out. Yeah, so that, that was a cool one. And then my personal experience, I kind of already touched on it, but I think it's a great one. I'll probably continue to use it um, just for experimentation until I find the next one. And then touching on Brave, Brave is a privacy-focused browser which automatically blocks online advertisements and website trackers in a default settings. Um, and it's written in JavaScript, Swift, C++. Unlike pre-search, uh, 
it, yeah, I want to say they're a private company. Um, they, I want to say they, they do run nodes. So they may be, they they might not be as centralized as we think is what I'm trying to get at. Um, but their main thing is anonymity, privacy, utility token is the bat website. And I kind of told you about my personal experience. I think um, that Brave is a great application. Um, I feel like it just needs to be a little bit more user-friendly though. Um, but let's check on the price of that. I, I definitely don't. I'm not like a big holder in the bat. I, I don't have anything. Um, let's see what the price is. And base market cap. Wow, so it really rallied today. Look at that. How do these companies generate revenue if they're not monetizing your search history and delivering ads? So I want to say actually Brave um, creates its it creates its revenue by delivering ads, um, but their own ads um, whenever you begin their session. So let's look it up. So like pre-search, it was a nonprofit. Um, but yeah, Brave makes money via banner ads. So they'll create their, they'll have people pay them to put their own ad up, but they'll block other websites, ads, uh, subscription fees, affiliate commissions, um, selling digital and physical products through the online store. But yeah, look at, look at that, that's pretty cool, but it is definitely way down. <laughs> Let's see how the year to date looks. Uh, $1.25 and we're at, where are we at? We're around uh, nine cents. Yeah. Um, so going back, decentralized anonymous organizations um, or the DAC, decentralized autonomous corporations, um, DAO is a decentralized anonymous organization, blockchain based organization governed by code. There's a big thing that code is law, according to um, that was a big thing in like 2019, 2020 for sure. Um, there was a big incident that made people think otherwise. I'll go over that. I think it made a mistake. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what was it? If you don't mind, I, I may have. non-anonymous, decentralized, and not anonymous. Okay, yeah, um, Google DAO. Yeah, I mean, I think there's different names, like such as this one, but yeah, I, I definitely probably, auto-anonymous, yeah. Yeah. Um, you are right. But I do know that Gary V, he actually, um, he calls it this sometimes. Um, he's a he's a big, big player in the game. He um, he was on that Nelk podcast. I'm not sure if you were here for my first uh, class, but yeah, Gary V's a, a big character. I want to do a whole thing on like people in this space for sure. Um, so yeah, the... Uh, is a blockchain-based organization written code. It's community owned by its members with a built-in treasury that nobody has permission to use without approval of the group. It's member-ran, owned by communities that operate within central, without central authority and is ran on the blockchain. Example being charitable organizations, which I'm gonna to touch on, Big Green DAO and the exchange Uniswap. Um, so either in voting, either everyone is equal or it's by um, the amount that you stake um, meaning how invested you are into the company. Um, yeah, here's a big green DAO. Is the first nonprofit philanthropic DAO. Big Green DAO is a USA 501c3 nonprofit that believes growing food changes lives. We're launching a DAO, decentralized, anonymous, autonomous 
organization. I don't know, am I pronouncing that right, Professor? How do you say that? Autonomous. Autonomous organization. As an experiment in democratizing and decentralizing our grant making. Um, so Musk, this isn't Elon Musk. It's actually his brother. Um, I'm going to touch on him in a little bit more over this article that I, that I had read. Um, but Musk wanted to experiment with the potential for a DAO because in theory, they sound like a great idea. Would you consider this DAO to be Web3? And I'm going to touch on it right now. Uh, let me open up the article. Here we go. Um, his name is Kimball Musk. Uh, he's Elon Musk's younger brother. He began this big DAO. Um, an offshoot of Big Green, the Colorado-based school gardening nonprofit that he founded in 2011. The DAO is a sort of digital foundation that plans to take money from donors and dispense it according to a strict set of rules encoded in the blockchain technology. Um, so if it works, their group could provide theoretically an easier, faster way for small nonprofits to get funding from big donors, big donors that are otherwise out of reach. The DAO, which has launched with a million dollars in funds from us, will be required to distribute um, a certain percentage. Uh, okay, starting with at least 20% in the first quarter. Um, I don't, I did a bunch of research. I didn't find anything um, that he distributed yet. Um, but I honestly didn't really look at that. I was mainly looking at um, DAOs. So put simply, a DAO is a community bound together by rules written into the blockchains. So financial transactions and other interactions don't need to be monitored by a third party. All votes and key transactions involving group members are publicly tracked and verifiable. DAOs recently got attention from a group called DAO Constitution DAO. Constitution DAO tried um, and failed to buy a copy of the United States Constitution. Um, not too sure if you guys are familiar with that story, but Constitution DAO basically um, they raised millions of dollars in hopes of buying this copy of the uh, Constitution. And unfortunately, it didn't fall through. It fell through. <laughs> so they were outbid by Mr. Ken Griffin. Um, the Big Green DAO main innovation is that it allows both donors and grant recipients to cast votes to decide on who gets the money and how much of it, which is pretty great to see. Um, yep, crowdfunded eat. Um, I think this is a big thing, especially in the space of uh, nonprofit organizations. I know I listened to uh, Mr. Joe Rogan a lot on the Spotify, and he discussed with um, a good friend of his, Mr. Joey Diaz, and they were talking about how much of these, how much these organizations, nonprofit, actually give back to the community. And there are some organizations out there that literally only give 30, 15 percent of the money that are, is donated to them to um, the communities and purposes that they serve. Um, the other expenses just either go into buildings. I mean, just your everyday expenses. And sometimes the, um, some of these big CEOs just get bonuses. And they were talking about actually how a friend of theirs um, actually ran a nonprofit and he had a nicer car than um, this millionaire himself, <laughs> which is pretty funny. So I really think that um, if the charities, if this works, this experiment works, it could be really big um, in the charitable world because, as we can see here, this um, this initiative is going to allow both donors and grant recipients, those who get the money, to cast votes on future decisions. Um, so each each donor receives a governance token, and when funds are given to a new nonprofit, that recipient gets one as well. Each of the tokens, which are ran on the Ethereum blockchain, has a voting power of one, so everyone's vote should be uh, equal. In theory. Um, the fund the DAO distributes, it should be given more and more that the more that they give, it says no one talks about the gas fees. A lot of money is based because of gas fees. Yeah. I think, uh, big exchanges like Uniswap are trying to fix that. Yeah. A lot, there's a big cost in transact transactional costs, which unfortunately was a big thing for, um, the community. They were like transaction costs, transaction that cost that it's not as big as, uh, sending a wire transfer through a bank, blah, blah, blah. It's faster. All this other information, but um, there, there's been a big problem. And I know that um, Mr. Vitalik actually wants to switch away from proof of work and actually go into proof of stake for Ethereum. So uh, hopefully some of these um, 
problems will be addressed. And so this uh, gentleman says that who's helping with the big green DAO says money will be trackable, votes will be transparent in a way that doesn't happen with the traditional philanthropic system. I just can't stress enough like how amazing this this could be if I mean it sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, a DAO could address this issue while also making the grant giving process itself easier and faster. Big foundations often don't have the time to write lots of small grants that are appropriate for more modest or local groups. So it's tempting to write only big grants that do get those big um, those big news spots and everything. But if the review if the review work is performed by a network of nonprofits, the individual burden is lifted. Grant seekers and hopefully token holders nudged by the token holders still need to submit an online application to the big green DAO, which is something that we're going to see in the, in the Uniswap case. But um, I just think it's awesome to, what, it, what can be done with these DAOs. Um, so yeah, I mean, would you consider this Web3? Uh, I mean, I definitely do think it's potentially disruptive, very disruptive for the uh, philanthropic organizations seeing that everything could be transparent. Um, there's votes uh, for donors and those individuals who have been donated to. And I know the article actually makes a case for if you're being donated to, typically you know other organizations in the group. Um, so you can actually give money to those who, who might need it a little bit more and who don't get those uh, attention. So here's another uh, decentralized exchange. It's called Uniswap. And uh, I thought this was funny. This was on the, uh, the market cap. So this person only bought this coin because he liked unicorns and the mascot for the, uh, the coin is unicorn. So it just goes to show you. Uh, and gosh, uh, let, me, let me open up this. Oh, let me go back. Uniswap governance. So this is Uniswap. Here's a little bit about the ecosystem. Swap, earn, vote, and more with hundreds of decentralized finance apps, integrations, and tools built on the Uniswap protocol. So here's a bunch of uh, the things. They got wallets. They got, um, they have these dApps. I mean, you know, I'm sure you know OpenSea, um, but yeah. Let's go into the governance. That's, this is what I wanted to talk about. So the governance protocol, the Uniswap token enables community ownership and active stewardship of the protocol. Uni holders govern the protocol through an on-chain governance process. So there's one that I'm not talking about and it's called SushiSwap. Is there a way to stake using Uni token? I honestly don't know if you can stake Uni token on the website, which I would imagine you can. Um, but I, I want to say you might be able to do it on Gemini. Um, but besides that, I, I'm not too familiar with this uni token. Um, I do know it has been a big um, bubble within my friend group. Uh, there was a sushi swap, which was pretty cool. Um, my friend actually is a sushi swap member and he has voted on proposals. Uh, so he's a part of that decentralized organization. Can you easily convert from Gemini token on their platform or do you need to move it to Uniswap? You can use the, the Gemini. Uh, I'm sorry, can you, can you elaborate on what you're asking? Like, can I just uh, convert Gemini's dollar to Uniswap on their application? If that's your question, then yes. The token you are seeking on Coinbase. Uh, I'm not saying anything on, on Coinbase personally. I know Coinbase is a great exchange though. Uh, okay, the token you're staking on Gemini. Yeah, so I mean, you can just unstake it. And if you wanted to, um, you can actually buy Bitcoin with the Gemini dollar. You just go in there and it's a different option. Um, you can literally buy anything with their Gemini dollar that's supported. So if Uniswap is supported, you could buy that. Um, so yeah, here, I wanted to touch on this, um, where is my article? 
I know that in order to actually bring up a proposal, you needed $22 million in liquidity. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to say that you actually needed like $22 million worth of this coin in order to actually propose something. So whether that's completely decentralized, um, I mean, I'll let you think about it. But wrapping up, this is the uh, book podcast of the week. This is a book called Digital Gold by Nathaniel Popper. This is actually a photo, a photo I took in, um, what was that? Actually, I want to say I was in Cozumel. I was visiting, I was visiting some family down there, having a bunch of good times. Um, my dad actually absolutely hates me because I read books on vacations and he's more of the type to go and like socialize. Um, I mean, I socialize, but, uh, I prefer to read a good book every now and then. And so I was on this cruise just reading this book and he was getting frustrated. He was like, I paid all this money for you. Use the slide. I was like, dad, I'm 20 now. Like I'm using a slide anyway. So, uh, Nathaniel Popper, the writer of this is a journalist for the New York times covering finance and technology from San Francisco. He previously worked at Los Angeles times, the forward and let's go travel guides. He studied history and literature at Harvard university. Um, I read this, this photo was taken in 2018. Um, and the, the title underneath it says, Bitcoin and the inside story of the misfits and millionaires trying to reinvent money. Um, I will say that they actually go really in depth on the beginning story, talking about literal um, face-to-face -face meetings with congressmen back in 2012, uh, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, here's a little bit about Eric. This is one of the members that they really talk about a lot inside the book. Um, this is just a little bit about his life. He was a University of Puget Sound, Puget Sound. Do you know what that is? Um, um, I've heard of it. I don't know where. Oh okay, yeah, I I want to say this is in the book the first time I probably heard of it. Um, okay, so the name of the city. Yeah, it might be. Washington State. Oh, okay. Yeah, Puget Sound, Washington State. Yes, yeah, so a city or a place. Yeah. No, there are no transaction fees that um, converting it back to U.S. dollar. Um, unless your bank has one, uh, Gemini doesn't have one. Um, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think so. If there is, it, it would be uh, pretty minimal. Um, anyway, so yeah, back on the book. Um, this was a really crazy radical quote that I was, I was reading. I was like, really? Uh, I want to say this guy's actually super radical. Not super radical, but he's pretty radical for um, the environment that uh, Bitcoin grew up in. And I guess his mentality is just different than whenever I came in. Um, but I, I don't want to say he's anti-legislation, but he's like the less legislation, the better when I'm actually with the Winklevoss twins and saying the more legislation and more regulation, we can actually have a viable product. Um, so you do not have to top. You do not. Okay. It's right here. You don't have to try to vote your way into changing the world. He will tell anyone who listen, if Bitcoin works, then it will change the entire world in a decade without asking anyone's permission. So we'll see in 10 years if, if he's right. I read it in 2018. Um, so I'm waiting for 2028 to hit. So maybe, <laughs> um, here's some other quotes from the book that I thought were pretty cool. The gold standard was the most popular global monetary system at the start of the 20th century. Um, not only did gold link paper money to something physical, uh, the standard was served as a mechanism for imposing restraint on central banks. The Federal Reserve and other central banks could print more money only if they managed to get their hands on more gold. If they ran out of gold, no more money and no more spending. Restriction was suspended during the Great Depression, so the central banks around the world could print more money to stimulate the economy. After World War II, the world's leading economies went back to the quasi-gold standard with all currencies having a set value in gold. Though it was no longer possible to actually turn dollars in to collect physical gold. In 1971, Richard Nixon finally decided to cut the value of the dollar loose from any anchor and end the gold standard permanently. The dollar and most of uh, other global currencies would be worth only as much as someone was willing to pay for them. Now the value of the dollar arose from the commitment of the United States government to take it for all debts and payments. Um, yeah, I thought that was a great quote. I did. Uh, 
I mean, obviously I knew that gold was no longer being back, but um, that was just one of the bigger arguments for the inside the book. Um, uh, here's a little thing um, about 51% power attacks on the network, but I thought this one was really cool. This is that, um, that 70,000, $10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza story. Um, it was a guy named Laszlo and he was uh, aiming to get food delivered in exchange for Bitcoins. I uh, thought that was pretty cool. And then here's a little bit more on Laszlo and the, the computer power. So he had actually mentioned, uh, I thought this was really cool. He messaged Satoshi. This is way back in the early days where Satoshi was still on the forums, the creator of the digital currency as we know is Bitcoin. And um, he was actually being one of the main guys um, putting power into the, the blockchain. And he was getting 1,400 new coins a day, which is a, a lot of money today. <laughs> and um, but yeah, so he actually sent a message to Satoshi. And in responding to Laszlo, Satoshi was clearly torn. If one person was taking in all the coins, there would be less of an incentive for new people to join. Um, he said, I don't mean to sound like a socialist. Satoshi wrote back, I don't care if wealth is concentrated, but for now, we get more growth by giving the money to 100% of the people than giving it to 20%. Um, I just thought that I don't care if wealth is concentrated is a big thing. But yeah, that's my uh, my topic for the day. Barclays is good. Anything that's written in the last six months that you see there on that site, you can just email to yourself. And those are all be good to read. Resources. Mm -hmm. They're doing exactly what you're doing. They're just doing it in a paper, but they're essentially going to take what they're doing. You just kind of summarize it down in bullet points. Let's say you did have a labs for your paper four. You could certainly quote some of these papers in, in your paper. According to so and so from JP Morgan, uh, the real key to their growth is X. Or, mm -hmm. And if you want to, over on the source, just type JP Morgan and find bring the JP Morgan ones up. They tend to be the better ones. Narrow it, but they're right here. One that says health care conference. Boy, that one could be a really good one. It's only a page long. Like Abbott as a heads that allows for exposure to both recovery and procedure volumes and a longer than expected tail of COVID-19. Testing cells have left Abbott with a windfall of cash, which is in the company to drive shareholder value. They're, now this is Jacob Morgan, so mm -hmm. this is objective. This isn't, and they're extremely positive. Um, more than welcome, but still from them. Okay. If you quote them, you have to say where you got the idea from, but if it's a generic thing, Talking about COVID, you say, Hey, I think I wonder if COVID's good or bad for them. Here you have Jacob Morgan, the people who follow this company 50 hours a week, you know, on a job. They're saying, Hey, it's still good for them. You know, you can quote them or you can genericize it and make it your own. So that's there's a lot of really good stuff. So I don't know how many of those you want to download and send to yourself. Maybe anything back to October. Looks, looks interesting. Some of them the same model update. You kind of get to click on it and see if it looks like it'd be valuable or not. Yeah, that model update looks really good as well. Actually, that looks really good. Anytime you see something that says investment thesis, mm -hmm. you see that on that second page. Investment thesis. Yeah. That's essentially what you're trying to do. What's what's your argument for buying this company? So we continue to see Abbott as both a relatively safe investment and one of the best positioned med tech companies that would long term with multiple sources of durable ice growth cells. Now you can't say that in your presentation and get away with it, that you, you know, plagiarizing. Right. Um, but you can certainly put it in your own terms if you see the same thing. We're kind of giving you ideas to look for. So we already said that, yeah, safe company, right? So we already talked about that. 
but also fast growing. What, what better can you get? A safe company is growing fast in the right areas. That looks, that looks great. But if baby bo baby boomers are decreasing, right? No, like they're, they're still growing. Yeah. And then and China is definitely aging. India is not aging. India is still producing a lot of young people, but they won't right. be aging in the next 30 years. US and China and Europe are all aging. Japan is definitely aging. So no, you, you still got that growth for the next 20 years. I'm a baby boomer. I'm at the very, very end of the baby boomers. You know, hopefully I'll maybe live another 30 years. That's that's a lot of growth that I'm gonna be buying in products, unfortunately. Yeah, I would email that to yourself. So you see how to send mm -hmm. it to yourself. You just hit the send button, you put your email in there, up a little bit higher in the red. Oh, I see. You just oh, okay, yourself, cool. Send to send message. Yeah. So since the Bloomberg, it's more than anybody can learn. You just get into it and just start playing around with it. And you'll find stuff in Bloomberg you can't find anywhere else. Capital IQ is just amazing what they have. Uh, graduating this semester? No. That's all right. So, are you working this summer? Or are you intern? Or? I, I know, but I'm, I've been trying all, I tried the all last semester. I had a high IQ. Well, I'd say if you, know, if you have time, you get one more and Capital IQ on the resume. Yeah, you can. But Bloomberg, you have to be in here, but Bloomberg has resources. So there is something called Bloomberg Market Concepts that you can do for free from the UTSA library, and you can do that from home. It's better to do it here so that you can actually do the Bloomberg screens while they're showing you. But you can learn that. And then Capital IQ, um, if you just go on uh, YouTube and type Capital. IQ tutorial. There's one from Corporate Finance Institute. So Corporate Finance Institute, I would put that down as a really good one. They have a great capital IQ, and you can you can load that. You saw how you got that. When do you graduate? Um, probably in the spring, like not About 2020. Yeah. Yeah, if you can get capital, I mean, actually learn it. There's so much more to it than what we're using. So this summer, I'm, I'm actually going to learn how to IQ. I'm going to watch their video is excellent. There's like six or seven of them, uh, and they go in detail. You can almost, we're seeing that you can do the same thing with Cap IQ that we're doing with Bloomberg. And that's on the UTSA library website? Well, um, the tutorial's in YouTube. Oh, okay. So on YouTube, just do Capital IQ tutorial and find the Corporate Finance Institute. Okay. They have, they also have uh, Excel. This guy does a lot of tutorials and all that stuff. So I would, if to do the tutorial, how would you present that? On um, on one word market concepts, you get a certification. For this, you just have to say, you just have to say, you know, Capital IQ and the resume. I used to not to push Capital IQ, but a lot more firms are using it now. In fact, it's kind of taking over from one word. So you really want both of them on your resume. Um, and it's easy to get, you know, you just put a few hours aside and just, just watch the videos over the summer. So maybe do two hours a week or something, you would have it. You have it well enough that you could put it in the resume without actually worrying about, you know, exaggerating. <laughs> but you got to do something before you put it in the resume. So, you know, the Blender Market concept is not a bad way to get it in the resume. And yeah, those are the two I think are the, the most pressing. Get to learn, and it's a good excuse. And with the Abbott Labs, it's a good excuse to learn. All right, well, think about it some next week. Um, see if you can start coming out of those, those bullets. Uh, I'll try to do some research myself. I, I might watch that Abbott Lab uh, on YouTube tomorrow on my bike to see what he has to say. He looks really energetic. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> I was uh, looking at the companies real quick. Yeah. Um, right now when I was sitting down, I noticed that Clorox has a really high growth. Uh, well, that's probably because of COVID. Yeah, I think it's the 2020.
It went up a lot. Right <laughs> I guess everybody needs toothpaste when there's a pandemic. Watch out for mergers. Although they probably didn't do much. Mergers? Um, yes, the buying of the company by the company. Um, this Clark's announces big. How long was it? Song. Or and nine companies. But all four acquisitions came from private equity firms. It's possible. Okay. Yes, there was a lot of about them. It's an interesting company where it's somewhat one product and you know, competitors like market mm -hmm. um, and practice people and they just can't do it. Some what we call the economic moment if there's some way that protects them. Interesting, but it's not a product outside of COVID that you expect to grow really bad. Philip Morris and Turning Brands, you gotta decide if you want to be in the tobacco business. Yeah, because Philip Morris, Philip Morris ranks number two. Yeah, but it's cigarettes. You gotta decide where to engage with that. It has the presence overseas and mm -hmm. I mean I think so. That's pretty well known and has been growing all that fast. Cigarettes has a lot of users, so <laughs> and it's pretty expensive. I think a pack of cigarettes is like if you go to the gas station, it's like twelve dollars. A lot of it's taxes too, but yeah, overseas <clears> they've been growing fast. Of course, we'll take part. Two page two cigarettes. Colgate, Palmolive, Clorox, Campbell, Green Park. That's cool. Fairly brand names, household names, <laughs> but growth is really going to be an issue of overseas. Pepsi's a little more complicated because, you know, Campbell Soup really is. I was looking through what else Campbell Soup has, and it's. This, um, oh, yeah. Boy, they don't. Biscuits soup, is complicated. That's it. They don't care. What else? Um, um, well, I mean, it's a healthy product and it's a good brand name, mm -hmm. but they've got a lot of uh, store brands that are competing with them. Walmart, HB, and Kroger's. Um, this one too, I was looking at it. Kimberly, Kimberly Clark. Yeah, Kimberly Clark, a lot like Campbell. But it's like a uh, staple products. And then Turning Point came up again. <laughs> it's a big company. There's just a lot going on there. $42 billion company. It looks a little expensive, but then you kind of expect it because you expect it to be really low, low risk. So low risk companies look expensive just because. Sure is. I don't remember what all. Turning point brands. It's uh, cannabis. Scott, toilet paper brands. They have a lot of brands, right? Yeah, this is the one that has like a lot that comes with it. They have rolling papers, cigar wrappers. It's well, it's a lot of it's paper related. So you know, so it's paper related, toilet paper, um, diapers. They do sell adult diapers, so that's kind of a growth area. You're talking about uh, Kimberly Clark. Kimberly Clark, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. it's kind of Procter and Gamble, but but related to paper products. Uh -huh. Well, I think right now what they're selling is, I mean, it's it's what's selling right now because of the time we're in. But like in five years, I don't know, the stock would still be useful. Yeah, I mean, it's, all of these are companies that 
Um, if you pick one, we will probably want to bring in the uh, data from Capital IQ and just. Mm -hmm. uh, I can log into Cap IQ. Sell because you have, you have Is um, Bloomberg down today? No, it should be working. Let's try Cap IQ first. Yeah, Bloomberg Clock, I recognize almost all of their brands. Kimberly Clock, I've heard that one before. Kimberly Clock. Diva, Scott, Huggy, Huggy. Certainly, they, they benefited from uh, mm -hmm. COVID. You know, we're looking for growth. So, growth for a company like that is going to be in that really global kind of stuff. So, we're just not going to suddenly sell a lot of their product in the US. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I know they're, they're global. Uh, no, I don't think. Yeah, worldwide. Basis. I know this one also um, worldwide. Well, Campbell answers. You know, all of these get Campbell. Sorry, all of them. If they can get into China and India, um, they're selling a fairly inexpensive product. Mm -hmm. it's just a product that everybody uses, so they can start selling to the two billion people in those countries. That's a great growth story, but they they may not be those in those countries. It's got really, really hard competition. Mm. Okay, well, Cap IQ is not letting me log in for some reason. Yeah. I'm going to just try to get Bloomberg. Bloomberg doesn't get the same details. Oh, oh, wait, I think I know why. I changed my password. <laughs> Oops. I was also um, looking at who has, who's a holder. Uh, this company right here, J J M Smucker. Smucker, yeah. I don't think they do much more other than jellies. Yeah. Might. Well, I think a few banks own them. Seven products. Ah. Uh, Fruit spreads, peanut butter. What? Yeah. They sell goober. And toppings. Oops. Mainly just spreads, right? Anything the word spread goes with, they do it. Mm -hmm. Goober is not a product I'm not familiar with. I've ever bought Goober before. I've heard of their uh, ice cream toppings. I think Goober is the one where it's like a mix. Yeah. I it's mean, I don't terrible. do that. that yeah. <laughs> that's not for me. Most of what they sell, they sell though has smuckers on the names. But yeah, I mean, it's a pretty basic company, right? It's not much. They sell jams, essentially. Okay. Um, uh, oh, wait. It's a, good, it's a good brand name. It's a high reputation. But Mm -hmm. Again, the growth is going to come, you know, they might come in the U.S. because they're not as big as the other guys. $14 billion company. But... I think with Cap IQ, Sorry, which one we're talking about? Uh, um, I was. We can do Kimberly Clark. Kimberly. Yeah. Right. I smart. It doesn't have the highest growth, but it's a good company. North America. Side North America. So they don't really break it up much mm -hmm. beyond that. About 50% is North America, which I don't know if that is Canada. Is that. They don't really give you that much breakout, but they do have international, but you really want to know if they are in China. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can actually even just Google that. Yeah, Kimberly Clark or China. Locations. 
Yeah. Operating time since 1994, and the park now has four manufacturing facilities. Clark has his name <clears throat> just set, set on diaper cells in China. Are we not allowed to log into the Cap IQ from this gig? You can. You probably have to go through the library, though. Oh, the library. That's probably why. You have to use your USA uh, you you account. Yeah. Clark looks like they have some time exposure. Let me try Campbell soup. I just think Campbell soup would sell really well in China. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. not. Yeah, Campbell soup is just not outside the US for some reason. I don't know why. It makes sense to me. That's <clears throat> the soup's not out of the US. Now, why isn't Camel Soup expanding outside the US? They're like 95% US. We're in Australia and that's shut down this evening. Yeah. Wait, it says Campbell Products Worldwide. That's weird. You said Australia they only. Seen them it says worldwide, but I don't. I don't think I've. I don't think Campbell would be a China thing. Yeah, Pepsi's in Mexico. And yeah, they're all over the place. Pepsi's probably your most international. They definitely have a China exposure. It doesn't show India, though. It's good to assume they're, they're in India. Uh, about half their cells come from outside the Including three billion in Russia, which I don't know what to do with that. That's interesting. Do you so think the war looks like? Like, yeah, Cambridge, Clark, Campton, Pepsi are your most international. I'll Colgate. I don't know much about Colgate other than the toothpaste. Oh, they're introducing nitro Pepsi as well. Nitro, okay. what is that? Smooth, creamy, delicious. <laughs> so carbonated? Mm -hmm. I think it's like cream yeah, soda. soda. Boy, is it high calorie or is it healthy? Um, let's see. Nitro coaching. Nitro Sounds interesting. Mm. Okay, so it's a foam. It's okay. I think it's like cream soda. That doesn't sound good. How to pour it. They have to give me instructions on how to pour it. It's a little too complicated for me. It's a little too complicated. Chill the kid. Pour it. Pour hard, what? Yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> then admire it. Does that mean it has extra carbon? Carbon? <laughs> yeah. We'll be proud to pour it hard out of there. I don't know. Is it like almost solid? That doesn't make sense. Right. But it's not alcohol, right? It's, 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 yeah. it's not an energy drink. It doesn't look like but Draft cola. Wow. I don't understand that one at all. Okay, so their products. Now they do more than drinks, though, too, right? They yeah, so. They have Frito Lay and some others, or they sell the law. Yeah, the real sugar or the real sugar. Colgate. Caffeine. Colgate has, has some. The actually palm. pretty exciting uh, international, including emerging countries. So Colgate's pretty international. Mm -hmm. I would avoid US ANA health sciences. Oh, this one? Yeah, that one looks like a multi level marketing company. Yeah, so can Metafast looks interesting. I just don't know that much about them. Metafast, what do they do? Physician Super Weight Loss Programs. Nutritional yeah, I don't know if they compete with Weight Watchers or what. It's a really small company, it's very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I'm not so big on nutritional supplements because I'm not convinced that you actually do anything. 
Um, I think it's kind of like cheating the system because you can do that naturally. Or like diet pills. I don't think yeah. you should do that because then your body could. They say they have internet based physician, medical practitioners. <laughs> That's, not... That sounds interesting. That's um, not good. Lifelong transformation, long healthy habit at a time. We tried Weight Watchers before, and boy, that didn't work for us at all. It was before Oprah jumped in, so she would have probably helped us. Or the five in one meal plan. That's one, if you don't have personal experience with it, I, I can't, it makes me nervous, right? Do you know anyone that's on that program? I, I, I to be honest, I first and sweet, um, a lot of the people I know think that stuff like this is just, it just doesn't work for them. Because yeah. it's just honestly the same thing to go to the store and do it yourself. So yeah, I don't I mean, know. Weight Watchers, and it's just maybe some discipline, but. I don't know. I feel like I mean, this one's these, interesting. It's got internet based physician and medical practitioner network of exactly what are they doing. Maybe we should try their website and see. Yeah. So, are you on their, web, on their so website? So, this is their diet and weight management quizzes. What? Feature. Because there are no fast. Uh, <laughs> I did metabass.com. That must not be their website. Oh, this is on web and this is like a review, I guess. Metabass1.com. So what is Metabass? Metabass. They ain't eating for weight loss. Metabass is a professional pre-insurance examination provider. Yeah, there's another competitor called Metabass, but it's in Hong Kong and Malaysia. Well, so it's kind of international. Boy, well, that's interesting. Uh, there's like blogs about it. How Metafast is a weight loss program designed to help. Oh, you loss. see, Metafast is restricting calorie intake. It's more about how many calories you need a day, I guess, yeah, with the they, amount of protein. They say holistic and well being. They, they don't have diet weight loss as their main. So, mm, their main source of nutrition that they Cell is from meal replacements, shakes, snacks, cereals, and bars. That's what they so they kind of have like this stuff. Yeah, like the lean cuisine. Without knowing, you know, maybe you should go on YouTube and say, Yeah, let's see see if anyone has testimonials. (laughs) YouTube is always a place to go. Oh, they have before and after. Manifest weight loss, uh, how to die. The important. truth about Octavia. By the stance that dies in order. Congratulations on taking car or point counting. Our doctor-approved, nutritionally sound five-in-one plan is perfect for every lifestyle, oh, and it's simple. Any more delicious meals every two to three hours, yeah, and one week. Yeah, you actually works. I don't want to invest in something that's again that will probably yeah. take a lot of time, and if it doesn't work out, then you waste the time. And okay, so she did a one one week one. So you know, start with. Oh. Do you want to be, do you want to be associated with uh, he has a, a tobacco s- at all? Um, tobacco, I don't, I think tobacco is one thing ever since, like, it was very popular before. So they had, it, like, the cowboy thing that would make cigarettes look, like, really nice. But now I feel um, people are starting to be more against it from yeah. the medical thing, medical perspective. So I the just US think. Is back. I still think smoking is You can probably go to some tea stuff and get data on smoking. Um, it, it, it still got still definitely has its um its growth story. Yeah. Pipe and smoking on some tea stuff to see what comes up. Smoking. Oh. Smoking rate. Keep your what? West states with the highest rate of smoking rates. Huh, tobacco product rates. report 2020. Smoking prevalence. 
Why? Yeah, they have something on smoking around the world. Number of countries based on strength of tobacco monitoring smoking worldwide. I have a whole report on that. On smoking globally, that new smoking world consumption of cigarettes. Right, so the world. Consumption is down about 10% since 2009. It's been declining globally. I would say do it by country, though. I think um, the thing about tobacco is that I think it was really popular in like early 2000s to like 2010. And now I feel like people are gravitating more towards the new forms of smoking, like CBD and well, cannabis. Well, cannabis and even paper. Oh yeah, the eBay. Some of these firms have some cannabis exposures. Mm -hmm. Look, you just have to decide if you, you know, some people just don't want to deal with it because they know it's not healthy, but they've kind of decided. But yeah, um, uh, there's definitely growth there overseas, but uh, I definitely like Pepsi. I think there's just drinks. Yeah, Pepsi's interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. We say Clorox is more international, right? Yeah, has, I like Clorox too. Very black or not so With the LATA, what's the Latin countries? What? LATAM countries, Latin countries. Oh, let me, I have it right here. Yeah. At the end, um, that's probably Latin America. Oh, I don't know. Latin America is American. I don't know if the M is. Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, South and Central America. I don't know what the M stands for. Maybe that's Mexico. Mm -hmm. So South America, Caribbean, and Central America. Yeah, those are good places to sell for the Clorox to sell the. Yeah, those that's are a really good. Area. Those areas are still growing. Mm -hmm. because Clorox is not that expensive, so even though their incomes may not be as high, it's. I feel like Clorox is like a middle ground. It's not too expensive, but it's not too cheap either. So it's like you kind of get what you're paying for. Well, and they have somewhat of a corner on the market, so it's somewhat of an economic mode argument. Yeah, I need to I probably yeah, I mean, it's, check it's them out. It's kind of a boring company, but at the same time, it's, yeah. it dominates the product line and it's growing in Latin America. So be nice to see if they were in China, but the Clorox. They China. could expand to China if they wanted to, sir. Yeah, so you're you really need to just kind of pick one. Mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna go with Clorox. Okay. That's the one I wanted to. It's been on our list before, so we're almost like it. Mm -hmm. Let's look back at why it's on the list then. And uh rank twelve. Oh, no. Average on turnover, really strong on working capital, good margins, like like you mentioned. Yeah, that's like margins. Return on capital is kind of kind of mediocre, and risk. Uh, I don't want to be too much. Kind of in the middle pack on some things, but really strong on margin. Mm -hmm. That may emphasize the fact that they, they dominate the market, so their margins are a little wider. Revenue growth is 6%. That's pretty strong these last few years, although, you know, it's probably COVID induced <laughs> a little bit. We can look at their revenues on a blackboard and you know, one In 2020. Oh, yeah. Well, you can see COVID right there. 
their revenues jumped from 19 billion to 28 billion. <laughs> and then now they're back down to 17 billion. So that's uh, market cap, excuse me. The revenues, oh, boy, I was looking for Oh, yeah, the market cap definitely jumped a bunch, but the revenues jumped about 10%. Kept growing in 2021. They have fallen back the last few months. The profits flat, but did jump up during COVID. Yeah, you definitely see a COVID bump there. Yeah, they did. But also, it's on the way down. Um, my only thing I is, I guess, is you know, people are going to keep buying these products. You know, the next pandemic scare is certainly going to be out there. I'd like to see more growth overseas, though. But, um, So in twenty yeah twenty twenty two in twenty twenty they yeah they had really hard growth three point two and now they went down twenty twenty. It's predicting that they're gonna go back up. Well, they'll get they'll get back up to their COVID bump, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Maybe the international, but you know, they're not, the international is not that strong. Yeah, I think it's more of a U.S. thing. But if they're in Latin America and they're starting mm -hmm. to focus on those countries, then you know, that's certainly a story. But that's been pretty flat. It did jump up your last 12 months. Yeah, because I know there's a few brands in Mexico that compete with Clorox. Um, but Clorox is like a pretty strong company, I want to say. Yeah, it's definitely a brand name everybody knows. Mm -hmm. It's easy to analyze it because I really don't think they sell much more than that one product. So, like for the financial analysis, um, there's this one part. See product wipes and sprays, and that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. They probably do stuff for uh, laundry. Yeah. I wonder if they have measures. Yeah. So this is a one product company, so it's pretty straightforward. They analysis. have a Merger with so your growth story is the world's much more focused on pandemics and cleanliness. Mm -hmm. They're expanding in Latin America, which is a really good growth area, good population growth. They could expand overseas, but it doesn't seem to be in there. So I think they merged. I mean, it's it's a perfect. I mean, you're doing consumer staples. This is about as consumer staples as you can get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact they're a one product company means that they're going to demand how uh, to defend that defend that product. They're not going to let any, you know, like Procter & Gamble try to get into this. Mm -hmm. And they essentially just took Procter & Gamble out. So they're pretty <laughs> aggressive keeping the competition out. Yeah. In any one of those in that list, except for the USA and A. I think I'm going to do with Martin Brown, Martin Broward. Was that they agreed to principal acquire business and assets of the Martin Browner Brower mm -hmm. Corporation of Chicago? Mark, uh, Martin Brower, uh, B O B R O W E R. Martin Brower of Brower. Chicago. Our jobs. So they bought Martin Brown or they just uh, I think they just acquired assets. Business, uh, wait. it had agreed in principle to acquire the business and assets of the Martin Brower Corporation of Chicago through an exchange of common shares valued at 48 million. The Clorox? Yeah, the Clorox company. Wow. It's a logistics company. I think Clorox would have that expertise. That's kind of to me negative. It's boy, what, are, what advantage do they have in that market? Mm. Oh, wait, 
I did this article. Not oh. our material, was it? I'm a bit of a bigger book back, which is similar. How long ago was this? Million. Oh, yeah, 48 million. I want to know when this was, though. I don't know if this is recent. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, it must be that big. Oh, First Brands Corp acquired. So, Burt's Bees acquired as well. Burt's Bees First Brands Corp has link. I don't know if it's true. Uh, well, what do you want to do now is. Um, Wait, is this correct? I'm not sure if this is correct. Because it says that they acquired. X formulas. Hold on, let me move this thing. Mm -hmm. 2012, 2007, yeah, they're pretty old. What's the 2018 one? 2000, this one is Nutrinex. Nutrinex is a health and wellness company. Manufacturers and markets leading dietary supplements. Oh, dietary supplements. Yeah. yeah. E commerce channels. Oh, that's where. So go on the Google on the Borax report, and that's the next place you want to go. Let's get, get their annual report. See what they're saying. Uh, 2021, right? 2020. Yeah, 2021. Female chief executive officer. Oh, wow. Oh, go women. Not wise. What did they own the hidden dollar brands? Maybe they do. They have broadened out. They do brand themselves as like disinfecting products, vitamins, minerals, and supplements, bags and wrap wraps, water filtration, food, grilling, and cat litter products. Why are they so hidden value brands there? Yeah. Oh, Brita also. That's a good brand. Uh the water. They own that. Says. Wow. Markets some of the most trusted and recognized as a consumer wow, brand. Brita is uh, pretty popular. Um, I know this one too. I've heard about it. I don't know what it is exactly. For new life. You definitely want to read their annual report. Maybe not work for work, but like you know, certain sections one another. Would their annual report be in Bloomberg or in Cat by Or would oh, that just be Siegel. okay? Just load it and develop it yourself. Focus is on cleanliness and healthiness. So yeah, they, they also care. brand to like bringing people together. Yeah, they say that. Clorox always has their commercials, like, you know, people helping each other. Okay. So I think that's also. But they do have some pretty impressive. Yeah, Brita, Clorox, Pine Salt. So it's big too. Pine Salt is huge in Mexico. Yeah. I think it's called something else though. I'm glad. So they do trash bags. They have Hidden Valley Ranch. I'm just surprised they have a food. That's the only real food I see in there. Rainbow Light. I don't know what Rainbow Light is. Rainbow oh, Light. Food. Um, it's a woman. It's like oh, supplements, okay. multivitamins, um, light supplements. They got a few really bizarre things. Yes. This valley in there, and then the supplements. I wonder why they would. Oh, Britta makes sense. Burt's bees. Meal cell. Have you ever heard of this brand? It's like collagen, stuff like that for your skin, your nails. Okay, so it's kind of skin. It's like, it's like a beauty brand. Reduces wrinkling. Okay. That's kind of unusual. 
or you know, most most of it's house cleaning products, which is fine. Cells to corporations. All right, so it's a more diverse fund than I was thinking. Twenty-one percent health and wellness. Twenty-seven percent household. Health and wellness. Thirty of that is cleaning, or thirty-seven of it. So thirty-seven is cleaning. Also, that's sixty-four percent. Hidden Valley is the only food product they have. Yeah, which is weird. They have a bunch of like health products and cleaning services. And yeah, but their their health Valley. products are a real small percentage of their business. It's less than ten. Yeah. So it looks like you can really focus in on the, um, you know, Hidden Valley is um, 9% of the average they didn't have Hidden Valley. That may be something that could sell off. That seems to be not quite a fit for them. Little footprint. Has paid off several times over. Hidden Valley Ranch net the net the company forty four hundred and fifty million since Clorox bought the brand. What year did they buy? Um. And, yeah, I wonder why they did that. This seems kind of weird. At the time of the sale, the most popular product was the flavor packet, the buttermilk packets. Yeah. Mm. Um, they do have a. A plant in China. They do a plant in the Philippines. They're in U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Yeah, I was um, to use. All their R&D is in the United States. Okay. Company, yeah, we'll have to learn some of that. So, so your goal right now is a. Um, yeah, our, I, it's so getting more to start reading through it, trying to figure out this company. The number one thing you're looking for is growth. Okay. Where could they grow? So it's international, is it new products? I think they definitely have also sub companies that can help them as well, like these little companies. Um, a lot of them are kind of affordable. So I think uh, for like a middle class standard, that generates like more opportunity since it's more affordable for people, like they're the sub brands. Yeah, the sub companies that yeah. they have. We want to try to figure out who they're competing against. Obviously, obviously with Hidden Valley, there's just a bunch of competitors. <laughs> yeah. But there are products like Pine Sol and Four and I know. Okay, well, let's mm -hmm. go for it. Sounds like a piece of company. That definitely fits your category of consumer staples. Um, so read the annual report, you know, you can also in Bloomberg, mm -hmm. um, if you go to Bloomberg and type the company, CLX, hit that function eight key and then type C. Function eight and then. And go on to the companies and just type BRC. You'll see if you can find some research reports on the companies. Here's a good one here, Clorox. On the right path, they've not growth and recover profitability, but timing is hard to predict. That's that's a good one right there. So type type BRC there at the top. Enter. Get that second one by Jake Morgan. That's a really good one right there. Bartlett's one's probably pretty good. They got a sell rating, which is interesting. So you're what you want to buy. Yeah, on the right path. They're gonna look at that really good stuff right there. Focusing on rebuilding margins, but this will take some time. Pricing front manage a highlight at 85% of the See, one or two rounds of pricing. To a long term algorithm. So they're long. So it's a, like so a long term investment. There's a good one to read right there. I email that to yourself. Mm -hmm. Let me try to connect. So you got two companies right there, Barclays and David Morgan, I'm going to sell on this one. So. Mm -hmm. Are we relatively early in the planning process? Corax is not a secret to the cost of inflation. So Corax is making strides and building out its own. 
forward and anticipated next month. Yeah, the Barclays one and the Jacob Morgan one are the ones. They're very negative, though, so they're, you're going against them. Yeah, they're 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 going against Reading a yeah. I'm just going to email this to myself real quick. Stuff all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay. I remember I had to look at this again over the weekend, but I remember most of what I did. So I think sort small. So you can Etsy up there, ETSY, all right? I was talking about that company. I think so. I think the sectors I do like are these hotels ones, like the food, those ones, I like that sector. I like the. I don't know how I feel about this internet. I don't even know this was consumer discretionary. It probably used to be under tech, but uh -huh. yeah, it really does belong. Got gotcha. you. And then I was looking at retail too, specialty retail. Yeah, yeah, that's another. And then I think these are the same thing, just not in order. Yeah. And then the automobiles, the only thing about them is that like I don't know how profitable they are, especially like oh well, you got you know, yeah, they have so much that's why that's real expensive. Yeah. Or, yeah haven't made yeah, they haven't made much growth. Thor, like, Thor, Thor is really interesting. You said Thor? Yeah, they've grown so ridiculously fast. But, uh, I've never heard of it. Let me look it up. We've on Thor before. It's kind of a baby boomer. They make RVs? Yeah. Okay. And they did really well during COVID. I don't know how much of that COVID they just continue. I never looked into what you were talking about, the people renting the RVs. Shit. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I guess you know what I'll do one company from hotels that I'm familiar with and then one that I'm not and then I'll do a specialty retail that way I have three so I'll do the hotels I'll do Chipotle let me do Chipotle so let me yeah Chipotle I was doing yeah I had a I did a what did I, do? I did a call option this summer on their earnings report and I made it quite a bit of money off of it. So well, there is a like business breakdown podcast on video on the, or podcast on them, the same yeah. one that we did for the yeah, yeah okay. they have a one. It's I listen really to really it. Good. It's got, it, it does talk about some stuff that's pretty interesting. And I think I'll do let me think of one I haven't heard of or one that I'm not. Let me do international game technology. <laughs> I'll do Chipotle and I'll do I know you were talking about last semester Dave and Buster's how they were really high but you didn't know how they were so like they looked the model made them look so good yeah I've only been in that place a couple of times it's just so <laughs> expensive have you been there ever? I have been there not recently but I have I went there maybe like in high school like two or three years ago maybe yeah. But I mean, maybe they have other things that generate revenue. I doubt it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't get know. the concept itself, but it's just not my thing. It's mm -hmm. I really love it. I'll do Hyatt too. Hyatt. Yeah, they have. Um, what was the one? There was a really good podcast at one of the hotels. What's it? Marriott. Or... I can look it up. So I think it started with the W. But I can't remember. And yeah, probably was. See, yeah, I guess so. When the motels loyalty matters. Yeah, they're talking about their loyalty program, which was really amazing to me. Do you believe in loyalty programs? Well, you know, I've, I've got, I'm part of their loyalty program. I just never noticed it. But according to that podcast, it has a huge impact. And I remember it really does make their customers come back to them. Mm -hmm. 
And is it like a monthly membership type thing, or is it? I don't like, think it costs them anything. I think it's just, or they use to get discounts. Okay. okay. No, I'm a member of it. I've never paid anything, so I, I don't know. Okay. I, I think I'd have to go back and listen to that. Got gotcha. you. Business breakdown. I don't even and think that's not a bad thing to choose someone that's on business breakdown because mm -hmm. it gives you a lot of information, a lot of stuff to work. Let with. me see if it's even on here. Maybe it's well you gotta you gotta line you highlight it. Oh that's true. Okay, I do have it. Is that the only oh, I just didn't have data. Probably yeah. You can try to add it back and see what data was missing. Last. Oh, I did this wrong. Oh, I did it. Oh, my God. Uh, yes. They have yeah, negative. So just, just missing a lot of data for some reason. They have negative sales growth. Well, that's your bug number. The same doesn't exist. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, if it doesn't. Oh, okay, I remember. If it doesn't bring out a number, then. Hmm. Okay. I don't know why though. You probably update this with recent data too. Let's see. They have that in. Oh no, let's see. No, they don't. Wow. They must have gone private and they've just not come back out public. You think so? Because their market cap didn't exist in 2017. So they must have around for a long time, obviously. But you can't have three years of sales growth if you didn't exist. Period. Their sales growth, and Bloomberg does have it, their sales growth has been really strong and did drop off quite a bit in 2020, as you'd expect. Yeah, there's definitely something strange going on with that company, so you may want to avoid it just because you don't get data. Gotcha. Okay, so I'll do Hyatt, Chipotle, and then I'll do specialty retail. I'm really interested in this. Um, do I have 1 800 flowers on you? <laughs> yeah last year my friend he was doing like a little project for himself and he noticed that every year around valentine's day and mother's day their stock price goes up a certain percent so he did then he put out a month out call options and he was able to make some money on it but yeah you think the market would know yeah those two things but i don't know if his was just like luck or it was actually caused by the holiday season I mean, it shouldn't happen because mm -hmm. the market knows those things. That right. Um, I don't use them anymore because they're expensive. I can go by H E B and get a much nicer arrangement than like one fourth the cost, not half the cost, but one fourth. But cost. I think their, I guess, allure is that they can get it yeah. delivered, and it's like that's their main. I'm just this one because I'm expecting. I'm just yeah, it's a lot of money, for and they them. die in a week. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I like these interesting. Yeah, I think I'll put that in there. I'll do five. I'm not doing any, ugh, I kind of want to do um, nah, let me not do game stuff. <laughs> uh, I think they've been lucky that they've kind of come back into like. Yeah. Popularity, I guess. But yeah, they've got some new looks to uh -huh. quite as and they're collaborating with bigger names too. Yeah. Like they're giving out brand deals to like athletes and stuff like that. The stock or the actual shoe? The actual shoes. Oh, okay. No, I never had the stock. So I have Chipotle, Hyatt, Nike, and
I was really impressed with the power of zone, but I don't know. You think a cruise line might be good to look at, even though the pandemic is still kind of harming them, even though I do know some people have gone back on cruises recently. Yeah. Um person like Carnival, because those are the ones I've been on. So <laughs> I've been on a few. They're really boring. Remember, really? It is a baby boomer thing, but people do kind of enjoy it. Did you go by yourself or you only like I take a group, I can okay. take for most of it just take a group of people and oh man. Which is good. Those were fun, but why around the boat? It's like, I think you can eat. Yeah. You can play yourself aboard a lot. You got to go to the shows. Yeah, we did some of the shows. Possible durable. Lazy boy. Oh. The food wasn't as good as I thought it would be. It gets old after like the second day. Yeah. It's the same stuff. And the excursions, they were fun, but they're kind of a hassle because you got to get off and on the boat. Yeah, you only get like eight hours max to like really do whatever you want. And you're always worried you make sure you get back on time. Mm -hmm. And then they have to yeah, check. That's you. the first time I ever did mountain biking. I got me hooked on mountain biking. Where'd you go? Um, it was around the Caribbean. I can't remember where it was mountain biking. We did road biking in uh, Cayman Islands. Probably across some of the where we did mountain biking. It was fun. I've never mountain bike before in the ride. It's pretty cool. Then we need Target. Huh? Target. That would be my fourth one. Yeah, Target's always questionable if it's staples or discretionary. It's kind of been the point. But you could probably argue that it's discretionary. Because they have a lot of stuff that. They're certainly more expensive than Walmart. But I think they're more like. They have dollar, dollar General is definitely not discretionary. That one should be the staples. staples. But I think they're more, they expanded into the grocery. Like they were first kind of just like a department store and they expanded into grocery. Yeah, so that makes them more staples than discretionary. I think you're, you're kind of on the edge right mm -hmm. the discretionary staples. So. so you think it's fair if I include them or no? When you can, it's just uh -huh. kind of a little, you know, grocery was definitely fits in the category. Yeah, because they're like kind of. In between, yeah, 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 I feel um, and definitely Dollar General doesn't. Really I heard that Target's are doing this thing where they're kind of like you know how they have Starbucks in there. I heard there are some new ones they're putting in like an Ulta, they're kind of making it like a shopping mall where they have different brands inside the yeah, actual like Target. Yeah, 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 that would make sense. That's why I'm kind of interested. So I think I'll just do these four so Chipotle, Hyatt, Nike, and Target. So I don't have information over the that. I, oh, that was cool. Didn't know you could do that. So your goal is to go get their annual report and, mm -hmm. and see and then look up any research reports on them. Got you. So like uh support my spell correct. Oh, I know where the L comes. Is it TL or L? So chip and then O T L E. A T L E. Do you eat them? I have. I like it. And it's definitely well run burn once they got out of there. What was it? E. coli? Is that what they were? Yeah, that's been several years. I think um, it was like 2013. There is a uh, recent JP Morgan and Barclays report on them. You want to probably send those to yourself. Yeah, let me do this. And so, you know, uh, you get, get those reports and email them to yourself. Mm -hmm. That's a good reason. Are they on Bloomberg? Yeah, just okay. BRC on Bloomberg and okay. you'll see them. So it probably has some good reports from Barclays and JP Morgan. They're, they're about a month old, but that's not too bad. Did that guy ever in consulting ever come to speak to the investment? He's side? kind of going to try in two okay. weeks. He's got a conflict and we can get Zoom to work. Do you know his name? Right Michael Kincaid. Is a big part oh, of I think I, I think I just connected with him on LinkedIn. Yeah. I might have. 
He's from, he lives in Dallas, right? Yeah. Okay. He works at McKinsey. No. Um, BCG. Um, the other one. Bain. Um, Boston Consulting. Yeah, okay. I want to do that. I don't know why. It's just intriguing to me. Yeah, I don't like starting there. But mm -hmm. you really? All right, so you got, um, to both, you got two really good. Okay. That you, can and you think the business breakdowns would kind of give me some more information on them too? Yeah, I'll, I'll just open. I don't think the other ones have one. Gotcha. BRC. Target is a firm that's really turned themselves around. Got some reports you can definitely read. Um, Target Wyndham, or no, Hilton, you said? Hyatt, Hyatt. Hyatt. Let me search. Boy, I get cool. Oh, what's up, Trey? My bad. I saw you walk in. I just forgot to say hi to you. Oh, okay, sure. So basically, we just picked like four stocks we're going to try and focus on for the sector. So I think it was Target, Chipotle, Hyatt, and Nike. Yeah, they all, they all have good reports out there. They all, yeah, you should definitely get the reports. And How do I search this little database here, like to find the one I'm looking for? All right, so uh, you have to change which one of the screen you're showing. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Uh, I just go down. I, I like Barclays. I like I like JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll look for that. Which one are you in? I think I'm in beer. Let's see. Let's see. I'm just in the. Which company? Uh, I don't think I typed in. So type in try Chipotle. So Uber is considered a consumer discretionary company, right? Uber? Yeah. I would think so. Yeah, it should be in there. On the Chipotle and then by BRC. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So you see the Barclays and JP Morgan ones, those are usually the best ones. So JP Morgan has a whole managing costs. So you can click on that and email it to yourself. So mm -hmm. no not as they're much more positive on target. Mm -hmm. Um, Hyatt. Sales. Nike. They got buys on Nike. So they like Target and Nike. They don't like Hyatt. They don't like Chipotle. Sales of a profit today for pricing and Medicaid. Well, management increases. So I would. Try to get you know two or three reports on each company from JP Morgan and Barclays, maybe another one. Most of the ones, some of those are not very good reports. Right. Um, Deutsche Bank can be good. Deutsche Bank. We've got a former UTC state working there. I keep looking for her name. She's not doing any reports. Yep. So really at this point, it's these BRC reports and the AN report. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things you want to do to see if you can find anything. So it's really just a matter of reading now. Uh, we can do valuation. Uh, there's two type of valuations. There's this kind of cash flow. We could probably take one session on one company and do one. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the relative valuation, I've got a file we can just load and we can do that real fast. I have one, one Excel file that does all of that at one file. So we can do that real fast in like 10 minutes. Get, get those reports emailed to yourself. Maybe you and Trey break them up. Just kind of, you don't have to read them word for word, but mm -hmm. looking for it. It's all about growth. You're looking for what's the growth story. Probably it might be expanding to other countries. The target it might be expanding to Canada or something. Hyatt, it might be for the franchise model and maybe some Airbnb kind of stuff. You know, you're trying to find that. That story that's 
they've got another leg to jump up. And Fred Moore grows this. Gosh. Mikey, it's. I don't know what they could possibly do. I mean, and be coming with some new products. I mean, I mean, I know they've kind of trying to tap into that sustainability market, but I don't know how that's going for them. To be honest. It's more leisure type of shoes. So. Yeah, but they're one of those companies that can price their products high and still get people to buy them because of. Yeah, although I used to think of them as being the expensive brand, but mm -hmm. if I go to New York and buy new, new shoes. They're not that expensive relative yeah. to others, like Adidas or some of the others. They're, they're not really not high, high, high. You recommend Bloomberg Intelligence? Those ones are. Um, that tends to be a bunch of data. You can click okay. on it and see, but it tends to be organized. But you really wanted more words. Than Got you. Than just you know, a bunch of data. It can be. It's just not well as you know, JP Morgan and Deutsche and Barclays are not your favorite. Gotcha. Okay. And you can just keep following to yourself and read them. And their annual reports, you know, you can get that just off the internet, Google, Nike, Nike annual. That I could use like Yahoo Finance for it. Yeah, they're they're all over the place. Okay. So annual reports are pretty big. Pass forward is DTC. What is DTC? What's Google for? Direct to consumer advertising. Uh, direct to consumer. So you order it online and they send it to you and they don't go through Foot Locker. Mm -hmm. I, I remember reading something about that, but that is a big deal. I heard they're building more stores, like Nike stores, mm -hmm. and they're taking some of their products out of these Foot Lockers to kind of yeah, it could be a disaster for Foot Locker. Yeah. But don't you think, uh, well, I don't know how Foot Locker that, is so heavily in the malls. You think maybe yeah. A disaster as well. I'm trying to think. I feel like Foot Locker allows them to get their products more out there than them having to spend the actual money to build a whole new store and hire employees. But direct to consumer, they can ship it right from the warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, that can certainly, and probably COVID really helped bring that forward. True. So, yeah, Nike's interesting. Uh, all four of those are interesting. I tried. I tried. <laughs> I think it's just kind of on the edge of belonging to the category, but the others definitely belong. I do like it though. I'm thinking about buying it because it's not super. I think it might be. Let me check what it's true. A few years ago, I would have awarded it, but they did a good job of oh. surprisingly. I don't think they could do it. I mean, I used to go to Target a few years ago. It was like I was the only one in our store. It just didn't seem like there was much activity going on. So this where we just focus on reading and okay. bullets. Try to get three or four, three to five bullet points on each company related to growth. Mm -hmm. And then next week we can start talking about valuation, development valuation. Okay. The only football charts. Is this it? H? I think so. There's some good reports. All four of your companies have good reports out there. And there's a good buyer buy there. Oh. <sighs> Look, the second way is can be can be good. It's a little mm -hmm. you want something a little broader than that, but it can be good to read through. Gotcha. You don't want to go probably back the next last year, probably just stay around this area. Yeah, stay in 2022, especially if they did reduce earnings. I tend to. If they release earnings in February, I don't want to read before they release earnings. Because mm -hmm. it's kind of older information. But that one's talking about the earnings. Yeah, you can email all those to yourself. A lot of those will be available on UTSA Library as well. 
Okay. Um, next text or something. That's pretty easy to see. Mm -hmm. And once you pick your company, you know, you got the growth story at the very end, you can jump out this Satisa and find some graphs that support mm -hmm. what you're doing, whether it's retail spending or buying on sports shoes or whatever. Big thing on supposedly is going to be the DoorDash story. How much of their sales are going to DoorDash and how much does that eat into their margins? You don't really want to understand that. But they do their own. They advertise it like on the app. They say you can order in. I think, but they use Uber Eats on their app. Well, I think maybe they have multiple. Last time I tried to order delivery through the app, it took me to Uber Eats. But they usually give you like a coupon on it. So. Yeah. So how much is that? Into yeah. Their profit, their margins. But it might. Be, it must be worth it for them to pursue it. Like they might be making more money because of it. Well, that's what the um, increased sales that, that, uh, podcast talks, talks about. about. Okay. Yeah, the Uber podcast. I thought it was interesting because I remember, like at the beginning of this semester, you were talking about um, networking capital requirement, and yeah. then they kind of talked about memberships. And I was thinking, like, if more companies were to implement memberships in such a way, it would increase or their net working capital requirement be, would become more a source of cash because they would have an increase in deferred revenue. Yeah, yeah, under revenue rate for some places gets huge. But I don't know, like, what type of member, because I know Uber has, like, their Uber One membership, but it just, it really just makes the, the like, rides 10% cheaper and you pay, like, oh, so like, like rides. If that, I mean, I don't know how... Like how they would price that though for unlimited rides because yeah, yeah. it could be like a hundred bucks but then you have someone who uses it every day and you're losing money yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah you got four companies that all are well covered by the big, big players so that and they're the ones that really know these companies. That's what they're. Mm -hmm. That's what the sales side does. They know this really, really well. You don't have to agree with their assessment, mm -hmm. but they'll start to give you the insights that you should be focusing up. There's something you should be focused on. It's going to be in there. Gosh, gotcha. you're right up. What is my? Let me see if I can find it. You can email it to yourself directly from there, just by hitting that send button. Really? Up above higher. Up in the red on the left. Oh. It says send. You can just email it to yourself. Send message and just type in the email. And really? I was over here saving it. I mean, since I have them all saved, I might as well just yeah, you, you, copy you all of them. But if you've got a big one, you might just do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do that. This one. To your, to your oh, okay. Yeah. Just get on one word. It's <laughs> open. It. Yeah. <laughs> send. It's so just send. Okay. And these, I think this should be in downloads. So. Have you read research reports before trade? Um, I've read a couple before, but not not as much in depth. Like I've been reading food groups and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, those are great if you do that before an interview. Just yeah. you know, insights in most college students that I have. And by, I started investing with an app called Titan, and they actively manage my portfolio. It's kind of like a hedge fund, but for regular retail investors. Uh -huh. And so they really keep me informed on the companies and stuff that they invest in. So it's pretty cool. Um, I don't think there's a referral code. I think it's just the app is called Time Invest. I think anyone can get can download it. 
So I've only been on it for like less than a month. I just found out about it myself. Well, like, yeah, it's like it's really cool. So do they have option trading on there for it? Um, I'm not sure they have. I don't think they have options trading. So well, like when you invest, like you can invest with as little as a hundred dollars into their funds, and basically it's either stocks, crypto, or they have like uh, an opportunities and a crypt and a your class. <laughs> We're right. doing uh interesting. I'm learning lots of these things. We're doing weight average cost of capital, right? Yeah, cost of capital. Did you ever post that mortgage thing on Excel that you were doing oh, on? I, I thought I did. Because like, I was looking for it over the weekend because me and my dad were thinking talking about something and I couldn't find it. I was like, dang, this is if, cool. I, if I did, I put it in a miscellaneous. I'll have to look. I might okay. have forgotten. Because I only saw the the like the Excel applications, and then I saw I don't know what else I saw. Oh, when I got there. Okay, I mean, thank you. Yeah, all right, I'll see you. Appreciate it. Have a good one. All right, well, I'll see you in like five yeah, minutes. So, uh, for previous classes, uh, what we did was we went through the historical financials, a little through the inputs and drivers tab where we uh checked our in place income, uh, as well as tagging, as I mentioned before, and we filled out this little income section all the way from net effective rent to total income. And we went through a little check method and it's stuff that we have uh, done in our previous classes, just trying to actually enhance what we learned into like real world uh, models. And so today we're going to be going back into the inputs driver uh, inputs and drivers tab uh, to try to finish up. And so what we're gonna do is we are going to go ahead. So if we are right here, we're going to start this. So first this property is, we purchased it in 2015 acquisition date, or we purchased it in 1231, 2020. Um, this year bill is 2015. So what we're gonna do with our revenue assumptions, we're just going to, Assume for right now we're going to start this. Uh, we're gonna have we're gonna hold this for ten years, and so when we go over to the year, we're just gonna uh, put a, uh, we're just gonna hard code this, and we want to make sure that this is blue because remember hard codes are all blue, calculations are black, and then green is hey uh, I pulled it from another tab, and so what essentially what we're gonna do is just track this all the way to ten. So I like to do previous year plus one. I, I just believe it's faster rather than just inputting one, two, three, four, five, six manually. And then the occupancy, we're just going to assume that right now in year one, once you get to year one, it's gonna be 90% occupied. So that'll be 10% vacancy. Uh, so we're just gonna hard code that as well. And we're going to assume that this is going to grow at least 1% every year. If you get to this 93, we're just going to copy this down. And right now, these are just assumptions. We can always go back and fix them if, you know, our, our numbers don't really reconcile with each other or we feel like we should increase our occupancy rate. But our rent growth, um, for year one, we're, since we just acquired this property, we're, we're going to say, hey, let's keep these rents pretty low because we want to make this very attractive to potential tenants because 10% is a pretty pretty big vacancy rate, uh, but, but it's average as well. And we want to just condense that. So we're just going to keep the same uh, rent growth. So we're just going to assume that's going to be 0%. And then we're going to go just assume that it grows every 3% uh, three from here on out. Go all the way down. Actually, we're going to assume in year two, let's just assume 2% right now. And I like to keep these to at least one decimal place because you may get those uh, tacky numbers at 2.5% growth rate, et cetera. So going to our other growth revenue, we're going to assume the same thing Rent growth is only going to grow 0%. So that's a hard code as well. And then after that, we're just going to assume that 3% here on out. And now we're going 
good on that. We're going to go ahead and now take a look and continue with our CapEx, capital expenditures, uh, revenue assumptions. And so, like I was mentioning before, we started, we got this property 1231-2020, and we're just going to assume that we're going to start this uh, three months after we acquired this property. So, three, uh, so 31 And then our duration period, this is just going to be how long it's going to take uh, to renovate our property. But before we get into like filling all this out, let's let's go back a little. So let's assume that the business plan for this property is, we are underwriting is to buy the property that hasn't been renovated since 2015, since it was built. Right. So during that first year of ownership, we're only going to invest six thousand dollars in uh, into this into renovations. And then we're going to do this by achieving a $125 rent premium. So by, like we were just doing, let's start by laying out our schedule. And let's assume that three months after, our, after we purchase a property, uh, we think that the duration of how long this is going to take is going to be 12 months. So in order to find our end date, what we're going to do is we're just going to pull... We're just going to use the uh, EO month formula. And so what this EO month formula does is you take your start date and it tracks out how many months the order duration you want it to go. So we want it 12. So we're just going to, we're just going to reference from cells just to ensure that people know what's going on. So that's pulling correctly. So we're going to say this is going to start here and in next year and we're going to be done renovating all units. So going on to our unit renovations, let's assume that none, no units have been renovated. So what we do right here is we're just going to put zero in here. And for the remaining units, we're just gonna take it from 150 right here, perfect. Or easy or better yet said, since there, since we have to figure out what remaining units are left, what we have to do is we have to do this. So we can take our, our units, unit number, so there's 150 units, and we're gonna subtract this from the units that have been renovated. After we get that, we need to start tracking for our unit renovated uh, in months. So what we do is, since we have no uh, units renovated just yet, we're assuming not, we're just gonna take this and we're gonna divide it by the duration. And so we're gonna say, hey, we're going to, every month we're going to renovate 13 units. And so if you, uh, for, for the cost in the unit, so uh, prior to when we started this, we said that we were going to invest $6,000 into renovating these units and we're gonna to wanna to achieve $125 rent premium. So this is where these come in play right here. So we're just gonna hard code these $6,000 and we want $125 rent premium. And in order to get our ROI, um, so we're gonna go ahead and take our rent premium and divide it by our cost units. And we also need to annualize it because we're saying this is gonna be done every month. And we don't, well, we're gonna say it's done every year because we're not going to be adding a rent premium every single month. If we were to do that, we would probably have a very high turnover rate. And that's not something that you want when you acquire multifamily property. So we get a 25% ROI and 20 to 25% is generally accepted ROI unit renovation in the industry. So if you do see anything that's different, you should probably question your partner or whoever's doing this assumption to see if the cost or the rent premium is reasonable. So now that we have that, we can finally move into our model tab to see how we're gonna drive our pro forma. So as we did before, we went through our net income, uh, got to our total rate of income, and total, total other revenue and total income through our trailing three and trailing 12. So prior to that, why we did the 
T3 and the T12 is because we didn't want to handicap our property because let's say if we had three bad months, that's really not going to show how this property actually performs. That's why we pulled from the trailing 12. But now we're actually going to start pulling from referencing a lot from other cells. So right here, we have units renovated and units, uh, units unrenovated, as well as units effect, unit unrenovated effective rent and renovated effective rent as well. So what we're gonna start by doing is, we're gonna start by thinking of the units unrenovated. So in order to do that, what we do is we take our total units, which is that 150 right here. I'm gonna lock this. We wanna subtract this by our units renovated. So to give us 150 because right now this has zero. And in the first year, remember we assumed that nothing was being pulled from here. So we're gonna pull this from our inputs and drivers tab. So units renovated right here. Let's see where it is. Um, after that, we are going to, so right here, this is just, since our units are renovated are going to change over time, we can just put this as a static formula in here and hold the formula steady. So uh, for the units on renovated, we can just, I'm just gonna copy this all the way just to month three. Yep, it's pulling correctly. And this, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. So what we're going to be doing is we are, uh, let's see. So we need to pull. So once we do this, uh, we need to start including a timing trigger because one, we aren't going to renovate 13 units every single month for our hold period. And our hold period, we're assuming 10 years, right? And that's just gonna be too long. Uh, our duration link is just too short for even to even do that. And then uh, if we were to renovate 13 units, we'll need an uh, enormous amount of units and the property, but we don't have that. So this is where that little timing trigger uh, comes in. And uh, let's see. And so our timing trigger, it just really says only add the 13 units that is greater than or equal to our start date and when our date is less than our end date, then that's just set the balance. So here's how we do it. So we're gonna take our, uh, our previous income, we're gonna add this to go to our inputs and drivers tab. And we're gonna pull this from our units unrenovated every month or units renovated every month. We wanna lock this. Then we wanna multiply this, go back to our model tab. I'm gonna multiply this by the date, which is uh, let's pull it from right here. Okay. Our date. And we want this to move uh, every column. So let's lock this the correct way so we don't get a, a, a messed up uh, equation. And we're going to sit in, uh, as I mentioned before, we're only going to add the things that are greater than or equal to our start date. So greater than or equal to we're gonna go right back to our inputs and drivers tab. And our start date was right here. We're gonna just lock this cell. And we're also going to go back to this. We're gonna do the same thing right here, lock this every... So we're saying, and, oh, I gotta get back in here before it messes up. And when our date is less than less than our end date. So go down. Oh. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. There it goes. And so you see uh, that this, we, we can see if this works once we get to year two, because it should not be pulling anything. 
Oh, so there's something wrong with this. One sec. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's working correctly. So now we can just copy this formula all the way out. And we can see that now we are finally getting our units to renovate and this is not flowing correctly. So I just missed something. Oh, one second, I need to get back into this. There it goes. Uh, just got to get rid of this. Okay, and after we get that, we are going to now look at our unrenovated effective rent. So we take our unaffected from our inputs in Jarvis tab. Right here, why is this doing this? I'm just gonna come back to this one. Before we do this one over here in a minute. Um, I always mess up that formula. It's just a lot of, if I lock the incorrect cells, then uh, it makes it a bit difficult. And as I mentioned in our first few classes to stay away from long formulas, uh, and sometimes it's necessary to do long formulas, but when you do a long formula and you mess up on something, it could, take a lot of time to try to find where, you, where you're going wrong, but we can go right back and get right back to it. Um, so in order to get our uneffective, unrenovated uh, growth, we need to pull this from the inputs and drivers tab, which, which we just did. And um, we need to start using a index match formula. So we're gonna start with our rent growth and we're gonna start with indexing our array. And so what we're gonna use right here is Oops, why is it doing this? So what we're gonna do right here is we're going to index through our inputs and drivers tab. We wanna take uh, rent growth, index this. I'm gonna lock this right here and then we wanna match our go back to our model and we, we need to match it by the year. So right here, or we're gonna use year one for right now. Make sure this is locked in the right place. And we want the lookup array to be years and lock this. And since we need to annualize this, we're gonna divide by 12. And let's see if this works. Okay, cool. So the reason uh, the reason why I divided by twelve is the formula without the uh, without annualizing it. It's still two percent as we put right here. We say year two is going to grow by two percent. But the reason why I like to uh, divide by 12 is because if you think about the dynamics of multifamily property and how we're talking about occupancy and how it changes over time, uh, rent growth isn't just going to happen for a specific moment uh, in the years. So what we're trying to do is bump rents every time a unit is uh, turned over, which is vacant. So if, say if we want to increase rent by 2% or 3%, we're looking to increase that space and aggregate of the turnover unit. So this is the reason why I divide by 12. I just think it's uh, a lot, a lot easier uh, 
to look, look it up. And I'm just going to pull this through year two. We're not pulling through year uh, year 10. You can if you want. Just We just want to see how the formulas flow for right now. And so now to get back into our renovated effective rent, we are just, we're going to add this one as a $25 rent premium. So we pull this straight from our inputs and drivers tab, since we said that we want to do this. And the reason why you may be wondering why we're about to add the renovated uh, premium rent to our un unrenovated rent instead of our renovated rent is because we don't want to add a rent premium to our renovated units. It's because the rent premium would also be increasing with that. Now, the more conservative approach is to add your rent premium to your unrenovated, unrenovated units so you can bump rents throughout the entire complex if you're behind on your timeline. So let's say if I can't get all these units renovated within 12 months, well, we're still going to bump bump uh, rents up all throughout just so we could stay on our uh, revenue timeline. Uh, so what we do right here is we're going to oh. so now we're going to index. So we already index match this. So we can go back up into our, what we do right here is we take it from H11, which is our previous income, multiplied by one plus that growth rate. That should give you 120 through that, and we can just go ahead and drag this all across. So that's pulling and we can see that this is working because now it's gradually increased. Put this in throughout. Yep. Now to get our renovated effective growth. Um, so what we do right here So we're just going to do this, which would be 11 plus our, I did it incorrectly first. So we need to add this, lock this, and now we can drag across static formula. Oh, this is not pulling correctly. Uh, we, we can just leave this right here for right now, and then we can drag later because this is going to be a little bit different. Oh, well, I don't know what happened. Okay. There it goes. Now, this should work. Yeah, it's working now. The catch. Explain the... Um effective renovation rent? Um, so essentially like when you uh, want to renovate a, a property, like you're going to be purchasing more items and you also need to get paid for that, right? So you're going to add a rent premium. Uh, and we went in ahead and did a $6,000 investment as we said. And the reason why we added um, our un unrenovated effective rent to our rent premium is we we want to take a more conservative approach uh, and add it to all unrenovated units just in case we don't get all uh, units renovated in time, we, just so we can keep up with the timeline. And okay. so at 125 is on one month charge. It's it's a uh, every every year. It's going to be done every year. It's if we were to do that every month, then it would be very high turnover. We'll probably. But you're the charging an extra one twenty five a year or one twenty five a month. Well, uh, the it would, it's only mainly going to take effect in more of the uh, the renovated units at first. But it, as I mentioned, as we if we fall behind, we have to like start bumping up rents to 
you know, as the market increases, uh, the dollar decreases, all that. It's just a more conservative approach on how we do things. And so once we figured, once we got this, so this is finally all working out. Make sure that everything's pulling correctly. Okay. And so now we're just going to get in, uh, go into our income section and do our net effective rent. So what we're gonna do is, we are going to take, as I mentioned, so it's going to be this. So take this multiplied by this. And we're going to add this. Which, we're, which we need to come back to in order to fix this. So maybe that's what we should do first, this. So right now it's giving us 182.998 and a gut check on what we can do right here to see if this is correct is we're going to go ahead and take our net effective rent divided by the number of units. And what it should do, it should match up to our unabated effective rent, the one Yes, you see that that's working right there. So that's a good gut check that we can do, but we need to come back and do this. And so in order to figure out our units unrenovated or units renovated, we need to uh, place that timing trigger as I mentioned. And how to do that is we're going to take our previous year, we need to add this, go to the inputs and drivers tab, oh, wrong one. inputs and drivers tab, and pull this from units renovated. We're gonna lock this, so multiply, open parentheses, go back to our model tab. Go back. back to our model tab and we're going to pull from here from the days month and year we want to lock the column so it moves throughout we're going to say or yeah lock the number the this is you're locking the row sure I thought this is row right here. Is the okay. okay. Want dollars. Okay, let me check this. We're gonna say greater than or equal to go back to our inputs and drivers tab. And look at our start date. Because this is where we're gonna start everything, we're gonna lock this, close this, multiply, open parentheses, go back to our model. Same thing right here. Column, we say this is less than or equal to our, just go back to inputs and drivers tab. Oh, don't want that. Our end date, and we want to lock this. So the, the model times the input greater than or equal. If it's less than or equal, it's, it's not going to multiply. Well, I've never seen that form before. You're, you're showing me something how hard to learn a lot in your phone. <laughs> oh, well, this, this is just like, we don't really need this. So but it's just like, it's not pulling correctly for me for some reason, because this needs to be zero right here because we are saying we're starting 
in month three, so three thirty one twenty one. So I'm not quite sure why this is not working. Like so what's it saying is that outside that range you want to do zero, so it's not flying by zero. Oh, this is why my okay, I put it in incorrectly. So this needs to be this needs to be 21 right here. This needs to be 22. Okay, this should work now. Um no, it didn't. It's it needs to be pulling through for every month. So this needs to be locked like this. Yeah, you don't want to lock it second one, right? Yeah, uh you sh should lock the second one. It, we could we'll see if it works if it pulls from month three, and as it did, it pulled from month three. So in order to lock the column, you need to lock the uh, the number, the number, because it goes rows and columns in the middle. Both are absolute. It locks everything. It acts as an anchor for that. But now that we finally got that rolling, um, we can just go ahead and finish this income section, and then we can next class we can go ahead and finish the whole thing. Um, since have 10 minutes left, we're gonna try to knock it out. So um, with our vacancy loss, we're going to use an index match formula. And um, this one's gonna be pretty confusing, but it should work. So we have to do an index match formula in, in order to find vacancy. It's up, vacancy is opposite of occupancy. So what we're gonna to need to do after this is we're gonna to have to put a, a one a negative and one minus because uh vacancy your non-revenue units is money that you're not making you're missing out on right so let's do index we're going to go to our inputs and drivers tab and we're going to pull from our occupancy lock this and then we're going to match go back to our model to our model pull from our year we want this to move every column and our array is going to be yes and lock this we want an exact match Okay, so let's give us one, and I need to multiply this by, by my net effective rent. Because again, this is the money that we're losing out on. And since it's a uh, vacancy, oh, oh, this went in the wrong place. There we go, and then, so um, since we're doing vacancy, as I mentioned, vacancy is different from occupancy. So we need to put a negative in front and one minus index match times the net effective rent. So negative one minus, and this should give us 164. Why is this not being negative? Before the times at the very end. There we go. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was 10% of the Yep. So now we need to go to our non revenue units. And what we're just going to be do, doing, this also needs to be negative because it's a non revenue unit. So do negative, and we're just going to take this from our inputs and drivers tab. So if we go to our inputs and drivers tab, is it not working? That froze on me. Um, okay, there it is. There's negative. Let's get our inputs and drivers. Oh.
to take it from non revenue unit. Yes, so right here. Yes. Let's just go ahead and lock this like like that, and you'll see why. Just so we can copy and uh, paste special throughout. And we're gonna go back to our model tab. We're gonna multiply it by our net effective rent. And we need to lock that net effective rent or go a little crazy. Yeah, and then now we can just sum these up. So now what we can do is in order to save time, we like to use our pay special, which is the alt ESF formulas. Yeah, and that should work. And so the bad debt is it's, it's the same thing as non-revenue units. So you take it from your inputs and drivers tab, which is that 0.7%, and you multiply it by your net effective burn. All right. And after that, you just sum throughout and then to pull correctly and down. Get through this in six minutes, probably not. You might have to save it in the same way. Yeah, okay. Can you go to the right, where you're on the right, line nine? Line nine. I kept copying that over. What happens when it goes above 150? It should cancel out. Cancel out. So it, it should cancel out because as we mentioned, our duration is 12 months. We're only going to be renovating units, 13 units to be specific, every single month. So if it goes above this, then it's probably something in your model is flowing incorrectly. So what I what I can do is I can put this in the chat, or you can probably put yours in the chat to see what, what's going on. Well, yeah, if you, if you put yours in there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can't mine for some reason it's stopping at 165. So I did something. Let's see. Let's put this in the chat real quick. Have to work right there. Are you pulling from the correct uh are you pulling the row or the column? Yeah, I'm yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, email you the file and then we'll go ahead and finish this. This should probably only take probably like five, 10 minutes. So next class will probably be fairly short. But yeah, I'm at the review. Yeah, you're using um, there's a few Excel functions that you're using that I've seen before. So stop and go through them. Yeah, exactly what, especially that greater than or equal function. That you're doing. Yeah, I plan to after this, after we go through this, going back to like the fundamentals and getting a little bit more comfortable. Um, and I want to try to get through one more case study again uh, before all these classes end. Just so everyone's comfortable with all the functions and just being more efficient within Excel when we start doing our case studies. All right. All right. Good. But that was about it. And I'll go ahead and save this. I'll stop sharing. So we're just going to be doing like visual basic stuff today, like user okay. forms. So we got the developer tab. You got the developer tab? Yeah. All right. So in the developer tab, we're just going to go into Visual Basic. Um, and then we're going to select sheet one. Actually, no, we don't have to. We're just going to click insert in the top left and click user form. And then we want to rename like the box, like the title of the box. See how it says like user form one in the top left. And to do that, we're just going to go to the left down into the left into properties and we're going to find where it says caption it says name also but that's like the name for it like in the spreadsheet 
So we want to change the caption and we're just going to change it to loan input data. Uh, you could put spaces because it's just a caption for the box. And then, and then if you don't see the toolbox up, then if you go to the top, uh, there should be like a little tool icon that you could click on next to the question mark and that'll bring it up. And then we're going to put in a label, which is just the A, the big A. And then we're just going to put it in the top left corner and drag it out a couple rows out and a couple rows down. And that's going to be the label for our first like input section in the user form. And then you can click on it. And then we're going to do the same thing to change like the caption is just like go into properties and type in uh, let's do client's name. Just hit enter. Uh, type, didn't type it in. There we go. And then next, we're going to put in a text box, which I believe is the ABL thing next to the big A in the toolbox. Um, I'm just going to put that like right next to client's name and drag that. And then I'm going to change the font to Arial to match like the like spreadsheet font. So then you just go down into properties where it says font, you click on it and then click the, you can either double click or click the three dots. And I'm going to type in Arial in the search bar. And then I'm going to, I'm going to change it to font size nine also. So, and then we're gonna have like another field and it's gonna be for the loan amount. So we could just copy and paste these and then rename it once we've copied and pasted it. So I'm just gonna select both of them. You don't have to select, you could do one at a time, but then I'm gonna paste it and it should just paste underneath. But I'm gonna change the caption of this one to loan amount. So you gotta make sure just the, the text box, but just that's highlighted. And then you can go into caption, change it to loan amount. And then we need a button to like finish out, like to like have it closed. So we're gonna go back to the toolbox and you're gonna pick the command button, which is like under the big A. And I'm just going to stretch it out all the way across. So it looks good. And then you can change the caption on that one. I'm going to change it to OK, just so it could be like a little OK button. I'm going to change the font and size on that the same way we did it with the other ones. So just going into properties and clicking on the little three dots. I'm going to put it bold and size 14. Size of the box, so it's the second thing you did. I, I clicked on the button button, so the second thing is this thing, right? Oh, no, it's the one to the right of it. Well, I did that, and they gave me the button. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what that's what it is. It's the same thing twice. Yeah. Oh, are you going for the second thing? Yeah, oh, no, 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 that's uh, the ABL. So, yeah. This one here. Uh, the one to the right of the big oh, that one. Yes, sir. And those you don't need a label or anything. They're named text box one and text box two, respectively. So that's what we're going to use when we go and start uh, coding stuff. And then, so to code the OK button, you could just double click it and it'll pull up. A little um, coding area. So uh, in the middle of private sub and in sub, we're going to type, and you could just, I'll type it first because it's got to be exact, but sheets, open parentheses, open quotations, 
loan a more because it's the name of the sheet close parentheses close quotation period capital a activate okay enter and then um, to tell it like what cell to put the data in from the text box i'm just going to type cells six comma three so that's the sixth row in the third column so that's going to be like the the box that's like above our little chart on the spreadsheet so cells six three equals text box one and that's going to put the name into the spreadsheet for us and then we want to do like the loan amount one two and that's i think in yeah cell b1 so it's going to be cells two comma one equals text box two and then to make the user form go away once it's done just type in user form one which is the user form we're working with dot hide So that should be it pretty much for that form. And then we could go back into the spreadsheet and we can make a button to, uh, to pull it up. And we're just gonna go into developer, insert, and then, so there's form controls and ActiveX controls. And ActiveX controls, we're gonna select the command button. And then we're just gonna drag it out. So then to change like the caption for that, you right click it. And then where it says command button object, hover over that. And then it should say edit to the right. You click on that. And then I'm just gonna put data initiation form. And then to change the font, you right click it and then hit properties. And then it's going to look like the properties box from like the VBA. So you just do the same thing. You go to font. And then I'm going to do bold 12 point. Just bold 12 point. It doesn't really matter too much. That's just what my notes have. So that's what I'm going with. So, and then to code the new button, we could just double click it. Then, so under private sub, we're just going to type user form one, which is the form we just created, dot show. You should be able to go back in and test the button out. Um, if you click it and it doesn't work, it's probably because you're still in design mode. So in the developer tab where it says design mode, just make sure it's unchecked. Uh, it's right here under controls in the developer tab. So then you could just type in a name Text boxes are not big enough. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think I type sheet and it needs to be sheets with an S. I don't think that's the 
Um, so in the developer tab, uh, you should see a visual basic button in the top left corner. Yeah, but it's like I'm stuck in this thing here. Yeah. Hey, click on the Excel button, like in the on the part on the very bottom. Right. Yeah, no, sometimes it will just pull pull up in the back. So it should say when you close it, it'll stop like this command will stop the debugger and you just hit okay. So now when we do it. Still not working for me. Do wrong. Oh, I put it in the. That's my bad. I accidentally put it in the wrong cell. So, kind of visual basic. Where it says cells two comma one, it's going to be one comma two. Let's try that again. So if you look in B1, it won't format it to the dollar format. So you kind of got to get creative um, and like kind of tricking it how to do it. So I'm going to, in the macro page tab, just type in loan amount blessing. And then, bless me. yeah, that pollen's been killing me too. My whole like street is covered in it. So uh, I've typed loan amount in A20. So I'm going to go back to the first page and I'm going to set our loan amount cell B1 equal to macro page B20. So it should go back to saying zero after we do that. Oh, actually it's gonna be macro page B20 divided by one. Yeah, that's, I guess how it just, how it reads stuff. So then we need to go back into the code and tell it to get the, uh, get the value for, or put the value into cell B20 when we uh, do it from the form. We could just, okay, not yet. Go back into the Visual Basic Editor. And then on the left side, double click user form. And then we could right click on the okay button and hit view code. So we're just gonna change a couple things up. So under the cell six comma three, we're gonna put sheet with an S this time, because I messed that up last time. Then macro page. Dot activate. Where it sells, says cells one and two. I'm going to change that to 20 and two. So it's Oh. 
So what we just did is it's going to activate like the macro page sheet and then it's going to go to that cell for it. And then, right, yeah. So under user form hide, we're going to type sheets, loan a more. Huh? I don't think anymore. Oh yeah, I mean, I've just I only know this stuff because this is what they're teaching us. And then under that, just so it um, goes into like a normal cell, we're just gonna make it cells one comma one dot select. So it'll just put the it'll just highlight that cell when it's done. And then we should be able to go back in. And it what? That's twenty two equals text box two. Oh, there's only one M in a more. That's where I messed up. I should know this. I'm a finance major. So I don't know if it gave you an option to debug. Yeah. But then it, it for me, it just highlighted that. Then I just double checked my notes and I had it wrong. What was it? You had two M's in a more? Yeah, I had two M's in a more. I only have one. Mine's showing me that she's micro page, so I activated it wrong. Mine's working, so. Sheets. Everything's case sensitive too, I think. I haven't exactly the same as yours. Uh, you've got the R and the C in macro. So then it should work. And we should have it all nice and neat in the uh, accounting format. Oh, so um, in the in, on the top of the uh, chart, it oh, just puts it in there. So like if you were to like just to be running somebody's like things, so you could print it out for them and hand them like a piece of paper, just boom, bam. Yeah, that's all I got today. I'm just gonna go in and change the text box sizes, even though it doesn't matter just because it's bugging me. All right, on the uh, what, show me how you did B2 because I forget how to do that. So, B2, you just you just right click on the well, I've done this a bunch of a long time. You right click and just say, um, pick from drop, drop down list. Honestly, I can't remember how I did that. This is from the fall. I'm pretty sure I have the instructions somewhere, but I'm pretty sure It's a it's a combo box. Uh, it's in developer and then yeah and then insert combo box. Let's see if I can.
Okay. And then if you right click it and hit format control, it'll show you like the input ranges. So I guess A2 to B6. So where was your input range? And are all those terms thirty-year mortgage somewhere else? Yeah, they're they're in the macro page. Okay, all right. So I think the link. Why is it asking how many drop-in lines for the combo box? I remember when we put this spreadsheet together, there was a lot of stuff that we had to do to get like rows hidden from the, so like if you only have like a, a three-year mortgage to get it to like not show any zeros or anything. I remember that was kind of tricky. I don't really think Excel is probably the best like tool to learn how to code on just because some of the like logic is not the most intuitive. Well, you know, well, for, like uh, I do my charity, I have to do contribution statements. Boy, it could take me forever, but I, so I go out and YouTube, learn this thing about data, data validation. So I started using that. The problem is if you save you get out of the file, it doesn't work the next time you have to reactivate it. So I put a whole series of comment boxes because I only do it once a year. So step one, step two. Oh, how to reactivate it. And reactivate it's a, a number thing. But once I learn how to do that, why it takes me. Or you could maybe you could even write a macro to like reactivate all that stuff. Yeah, I probably could. Or but, even, I mean, it takes me like two hours to do the whole thing. And we've got you know over hundred downloads. So it, it moves really fast once I get it going. But I would have never, I didn't, I've never used data activation before. And now I go, oh, wow, that works really well. But I'm sure there's like 40 other ways I could have done it. So. All right, very good. Wow, that's good. Thank you. I've been trying to start this Excel project using like uh, NOAA, like weather data, like tide, wind, water temperature, and stuff. And you can find like the CSV data on their site, right? Like dating like all the way back. But if you go do a web query, it won't let you pick it up because you have to click a button on the web page to like pull up that data. It's not just on a web page. So I'm still trying to trying to figure that out. But I'm trying to put some something together where so they have these tide stations that they measure like wind velocity and direction, water temperature, air temperature, tide level, um, barometric pressure, stuff like that. So where it would just like collect all that data, like hourly or whatever. And then, you know, you go out fishing, right? And then like you mark your coordinates and your time and you go back and cross-reference it. So you could see like, you could start putting patterns together, right? And then you could like run analysis to see like, like, okay, what is like the correlation of like fish catches here? Like, and then like the coordinates would, you know, you'd put those in and then it would just find the closest station. I haven't worked it all out yet, but. Uh, cells and a collection of range of cells can be named for ease of reference. There are two ways to name a range of cells on the formula ribbon. There is a defined names tab uh, that allows you to manage name cells and ranges. Click on the worksheet tab entitled database in the file. If you have not, have not already opened it, go to cell A1 if you're not already there. Um, for most configurations of Excel, use Control Home. I might just by holding down the Control button. I don't know if it worked. Control Home, I use all the time. By some actually holding the Control key, uh, key down while holding the home while hitting the Home key to quickly highlight the entire data data set. Hold down the Shift key and hit the N key followed by the home key. So shift and then home. 
It was, it was use control, home, simultaneously, holding the control key while hitting the home key. Okay. Next one, though, in there. It said uh, to quickly highlight the entire entire data set, hold down the shift key and hit the end key followed by the home key. Shift. Oh, I've heard that before. And you're doing that? I'm trying to. Shift in the home. I've heard that before. Is it working? Because mm, I. Yeah, because he's like, I wasn't able to, like, on my computer to. Like it didn't work because I thought I wasn't using a window, so I was like, maybe it's gonna yeah, work here. In, um, oh, it does work. Okay, try again. Shift. Shift. In, um. in. Shift. 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 You, oh well, that was what uh, you you highlighted, and now the next part is to like rename what you've highlighted. It's our it's set the workbook has it set as database, but alternative alternatively, you can go to the name box on the upper left <clears throat> below the toolbar, click anywhere in the drop down box, and type in the range name data set data. You no longer, um, you have now referred to the entire set of data in cells A1 through R224 as data set and no longer need to remember the exact cells in which the data is contained. So yeah, once you, no, it gives you the two options, database or data set. Yeah, but because it, it, when they gave me the, the file, it had already been pre-named data set, database. Yeah. Uh, one way to sort through a data set is to use the sort and filter tab option um, in the, on the data ribbon. Suppose you want to sort the companies in the data set by age. Click on the sort icon in the sort and filter um, to see the resulting dialog box. Now click on the drop down box next to the sort by and click on company age. Notice that the sort on default is values and that the order default is from smallest to largest. You will also see that the box at the top, top right is checked for my data has headers since Excel has recognized that the columns have titles <clears throat> to them. When you click okay, you will see that all rows have been ordered by company age. Uh, since several companies have the same age, you can add another level of sorting based on another criterion, such as net sales. Repeat the previous sort command. So sort, and then add a level, and then you want to do it by net sales. And I also made it from uh, net sales, and again, the order recognizes that this column defaults to smallest to largest. If you then change them by the, the them by to company name, the order default will change from A to Z. Where's one? What's this one now? Another one? Oh, okay, okay. By company name, I think. Oh, from A to Z, um, and then click OK. Each record and company and its data in the database will now be sorted by age and within each age category sorted by sales. Now, you, if you are restricted only in companies that have been in business for 10 years or more, you can restrict your attention to those beginning at row 91. Not in order, is it? No. Let's see, I had it.
It didn't move it, right? Or yes? Oh, no, it did. It yeah, it's, it's just you got a lot of cells that are blank. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're going to go to get to that part. <laughs> okay. Each record um, will now be sorted by age and within each age category sorted by cell. Now, if you are interested only in companies that have been in business for 10 years or more, you can restrict your attention to those beginning in row 91. No, however, that at row 178, there follows companies with a space listed as in the company age, not a blank. If you wanted to further define the data set with those sales in excess of 1 million, you will need to sort, you will need to eliminate the companies in rows 1 through 90 and rows 178 to 224, and then do another sort of sales of the reduced set. Through the use of sort, you can Reduce the set of specific subset and perform calculations. Average, minimum, standard deviation, et cetera, based on the reduced subset of companies. However, the original data set has probably been destroyed unless you are very careful in segregating your uh, subsets during sorting. Another means of sorting the data through the use of filter uh, on the data ribbon, bring up to the Excel file and click on the filter button. Bring up, oh, let me see if the other ones, hold on. Oh, yeah, they've been clear. Filter. And you will see drop down bu buttons in each of the column titles. Click on the company age drop down button. A, a dialog box appears that has all of the different values for the company age that appears in the column checked. Since there are so many, you need to decide whether it is easier to. Uncheck the boxes that you don't want or to check all the boxes by clicking on the checked button by select all and then checking those for the ones you don't want. Let's select all firms with an age of 10 or 10, more than 10 years and checking the cells zero to 10. So zero, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, 10. Uh, and then go to the end of the, then go to the end and unclick the blanks. There. Thank you. Only companies with more with an age of more than ten years will now be showing. If you next click on the drop down button in the column entitled net sales. Uh -huh. um, let's field. You'll see the option for a great, uh, greater number of filters. Um, clicking on this hovering, it will, list, will reveal a list of options. Click on greater than, and then greater than allows you to, um, to change the criterion from greater than to other options. In the drop down box to the right, enter 1 million. with or without commas, in which Excel was, will delete, and then click OK. Uh, you will be left with only 11 companies remaining that are both at least 11 years of age with sales greater than 1 million. Notice that the row numbers of these 11 companies indicate that the firms that are not showing are still in the range of A2 through A224. If you try to perform calculations with these companies using arrays, you will also include all of the hidden company data as well. Click on the filter icon again, and it will take down the filter drop down buttons and unhide all the rows. Filter clear. Okay. When the filter function is a way to see filtered data, it simply moves. It simply hides rows and does not allow you to perform calculations on the subset that you have filtered out. Advanced filters lets you to cop, extract, copy the data that you want to another location. In the advanced filter, you will need, need to first set up a criterion range, specifying what criterion you want to use in the filtering data. In our subset, we go to cell T1 and set it equal to F1. F1. Mm -hmm. Um, 
or copy cell F1 to cell T1. In the cell immediately below, type in the criterion greater than, do not use quotation marks. These two cells are defining the criterion as selecting all restaurants with a company age of more than 10 years. Now click on the advanced option of the option of the, of the bottom right filter of the ribbon. On the dialog box, it appears that you first need to specify the list range. If, one, if the one that you want is not showing, you can either click the spreadsheet icon to the, to the right and highlight the cells that you want to make up the data set or you want to use or type in the range cells such as data set. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there we have it. Yeah, oh. Let me see if it works with set. Oh wait, oh, yeah. No, no, no. I got you. Was it? Oh yeah, it was still there. Okay. Copy to another location. Copy range. Yes, I know that you can bring it out of the thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice life. I think I know where you're going, but Let me one more box. Oh, okay, okay. Let me go back because sometimes reading these instructions are confusing. Um, now click on the advanced um, option of the bottom right of the filter button. Advanced. Um, on the dialog box that appears, you will first need to specify the list range. If you want, if you want, if if the one that you want is not showing, you can click the spreadsheet icon to the right to highlight the cells that made up make up the data set that you want to use. It's already there, and then the and in the criteria range, click on the spreadsheet icon and highlight the cells where you put the criterion for the filter, and then click. The iPad so it's like my range is here, and then copy to another location. Oh, send it back here again. To do something else, I having trouble with it today. It worked. It worked, but it's to pay the ah, but it's fine. You can see the filtering. Um, so it only brought the ones yes. Okay. By clicking, by hitting the end home key, the cursor will move to cell T319, where it's, that was where it's supposed to go. Um, then you will move the cell to A30, which is just below the last row of output. If the cursor, if you put the cursor just one cell and hit and key the cursor um, up, he, you will be at the top of the output range of filtered companies in cell A250. Now move to the cell J321. Because I ruined the other part. Okay. J, it, to go to cell J. Three, oh, here. Oh, what should I do? Here. Just what's up. Um, and type in the name in minimum sales. Minimum. Um, minimum. Um, move the cell to K three 
21. And calculate the minimum age of the filtered companies. Um, equal men. It's these. But it's not that I moved it off. Okay. It's here. Oh, I can do it today. I I think it ruined it by me have placing the data set in that area without. Yeah, it, it seemed to put down below. I think you, you just go over to to the right and just do it down there. So the bottom of that new yeah right there like in what are you doing on that cell? So like A E at the bottom of A E go down there. No, hit escape. Oh. I just. Escape a few more times. And then just click here? Hit escape a few times. Yeah, right down there. You can go down there. And you just highlight everything that happened. Showing you that, you know, now you can do it just on that data. So you don't need to go that far down. They must have assumed you're going to place that down below. Yes, I think that. Go back up. Where did it go? Where's my oh there it is. Okay. So equal minimum. And try it. Well, um, I don't think you want it there. Oh, okay. On there, but just sit, just sit your key. Here, here. I'll put oh, it. Wait, you can move it over if you want to. You can just put it at the bottom of, not there, but off to the right. Oh, then there it is. There it is. Yeah, then go over there. Yes, I think it was. So at the bottom of that a, column. A, e. And you will see five, uh, 59,963 indicating that the company with the minimum amount of sales has been in business at least 11 years is 59,963. Type in average sales. Or just below it, yeah. Average. This will produce an average sales level of 1,037,686 for firms that have been in business for more than 10 years. We'll refer to these numbers later. Filtering in the two criterion, in, with two criterion, and if there are two criterion by which you will want to filter the data set, both of which must be met in order to be included, a second criteria must be stated. Go to cell UI. So, you know, I have to move it this way. Insert UI. And set it equal to K1. It probably would mean U1, not UI. Oh, yeah. Where's my head today? Same thing you did in T1. In cell U2, type in greater than one million. Okay. 
Uh, no quotations. In order to indicate that the company's net sales must be greater than one million. Now use the advanced filter from the toolbar. <clears throat> advanced. And then the criterion range. We want to highlight. Both. Copy to another location. Okay. This is telling the program to cut. Oh, we already copied. Um, Telling the program to copy all the records of companies that have been in business for more than 10 years and have had net sales of 1 million. Now click OK by hitting the end home. You will go to, uh, it tells you another data, like another row where I can place it. Yeah, you can put it somewhere. To the right. Well, you can do it down below. Yeah, you have to just decide. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. you did it. All right. Yeah. You will see that there are only 11 companies that have been in business for more than 10 years and have more than 1 million in sales. If you want to filter the data to include companies that either have been in business for more than 10 years or have sales of more than 1 million, we need to adjust the criterion. Go to sell you two. And move the context. Um, to sell E3. So cut. Uh, leaving you to blank. Now use the advanced filter. And then it highlighted the same database and then the criterion range. Please. And then copy to another location. And then we'll can you see it? Oh, there, there you go. Copy yeah. to here. Yeah. Okay. It'd be nice if it would take you there right after you have a pay. That's mm -hmm. obviously that'd be the place you want to go. That's the main problem, but yeah. Where did I leave off of? That was like a kind of board kind of thing? Or like, yes. Okay. Uh, now, to highlight, now this time the program will copy uh, the records of companies that have been in business for more than 10 years or have had net sales of more than 1 million in rows. Well, give the set of rows, but it should be, it lists the, they might be like, they might have like one, be one year old, but they do have the 1 million in sales. Right. Or they have 136,000, but they've been in the business for yeah. 11 years. Now, if you go to sell, what's this? To, oh, it, it does the same thing if you go to like a certain business and it gives you a other data. Okay, filtering with text. Now go to sell V1. One and type in. I won. Fail suit. Um, in cell V2, type in T, no quotations. The criterion indicates to select all records in which the company operates in a state with the letter T. Click on the criterion filter. And so we're going to do that part. Again, the green range, but we're only looking for copy to yay. Okay, now all states are. Um, all the companies that are either from Texas or Tennessee, the asterisk indicates that the companies, oh, 
let's put it in answer. Beginning with T followed by any letters or any letter or letters. Change the, the T in Sylvie to, to question mark. To question mark A. The question mark. Arizona, California, Let's see. That'd be the last one you do. This range. Yeah, I think something got typed in. Yeah. Not working with me. I don't think you typed in a location. Let me just check if I, okay, if I have. Huh? And copy. We'll put it here. So I was just going to bring in California, everyone. Mm -hmm. I only had like two other like formats to show with the filtering, but we got that's this. I don't use filter much, but because it, it does make the spreadsheet a little messy, right? Because you got stuff all over the place. But something you need quick and dirty, that would be a good way to do it. And like a job that I had before, they would give us like the like the entire databases, da databases, but they would make us filter them like manually, as in you were ruining the data set from like just moving yeah. stuff around. Like deleting rows or something. Yeah. yeah that's good. good try that with the investment society with their models. I have to try it with filter, you know, have trouble with DNAs. We say filter everything that doesn't have a DNA work. We have to try it. I haven't doubt useful too much, so I have to really see, but it's it's possible and it has some value. So continuing on, I uh, read the annual report, so we didn't have to do it in class. I obviously didn't read all of it. There's still so much to read, but um I did go over the uh, vinyls section and I think they gave us this. I think we've seen it previously, but Breaking it down further, yeah. um, PC, they're actually the second largest. Um, and on the uh, JP Morgan report that I had read, they were talking about how the PC business, PVC business is continu continuing to be healthy. Um, demographics, trends for single family homes. Um, on the other side, they're constrained because of Europe, raw material and energy price inflation are pushing upwards. Um, so that's hurting them there. They actually had an acquisition, I believe in 2019, where they bought a PVC materials. What's up, Drew? We're reading over Westlake. Yeah. He pointed out that there was like a 38% increase over like the month of our stock. It was pretty funny. Pretty crazy. Yeah, like some big fluctuations. Um, yeah, and then moving on. So... They also are in uh, the chlorine and caustic soda. Um, I mean, it says here that it's for water treatment. And apparently there's a water treatment season. I didn't know about that, but they, they were pointing that out. I didn't do too much onto that. I'm just uh, narrowing like the actual definitions. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then, um, yeah, so they're also the second largest producer of the chlorine and caustic soda. Um, in the world, which is pretty awesome. And ethylene, this is basically petrochemical stuff from what I was looking at. Um, 
and they they produce that in one of their um i don't know um but yeah it's an important or industrial organic chemical it is produced with either natural gas or um, petroleum it's a mixture of gases basically um but they're actually a hundred a billion pounds short of this um and continues to look for other ways to further its balance in the portfolio over time. So I guess that uh, that really hinders them. I mean, a billion pounds, let's look at uh, their annual capacity for it is a billion, uh, 1.7 billion. So if they're down a billion pounds of it, I mean, that's very catastrophic, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we have a lot of good stuff. What I was gonna do today was gonna, I know you like to know more about the CEO, so I was thinking maybe we could define the CEO today in class. Did you find like a YouTube video talking? Um, I did. I actually haven't looked. Um, maybe not. You know, some of these companies are smaller, like this. They don't offer, but sometimes they speak at conferences. Um, like uh, yesterday, Gabby's going to do uh, Abbott Labs, and I found a one-hour interview of the CEO of Abbott Labs. So um, I don't know if you remember us talking, but uh, I don't think that's the, that's the president, um, Westlake CEO. I thought the yeah, that's the chairman. Chairman and co-founding founders are still there. Their last name is Chow, C-H-A-O. That's really interesting. Two of them. Wow, that's really interesting. You've got a founder still there. Wow. No, I, I didn't see them on this, unfortunately. Right. I see so the no CEO, They're saying Chow. Albert Chow is the CEO. Yes. I, I think Westlake Financial Services may not be where it Oh, yeah, that's definitely CEO. not it. This <laughs> is Westlake Corp. Try, try typing the CHAO. Albert there Chow. Here company. we go. Yeah, I knew this guy was there. I was like, what is that? But he's a co founder of the firm. So the page not found. If you do that in YouTube, that's a pretty unusual. Oh, he's on. He's on here. Oh, uh, introduction. Four minutes. Nothing too crazy. Four minutes. One minute. Two minutes. I want. I did a little more digging, and he actually. Uh, he's a big donor for. Um, the Houston Orchestra, I think I saw. It was either the orchestra or the, the plays. Oh, he's 73. All right, so he's he looks fairly young. And then his brother, his brother, James Chow, is 75. 73, so he looks younger than me. James is a chairman. Chow's a really player in chemicals. So, so the question is who's going to take his place if he's 73? Well, I guess our president is 79. So he's done it. Mm -hmm. It looks like he's a pretty important component of this company, a lot of chemical background. Uh, so 
a son of T.T. Chow that was at symposium, the T.T. Chow symposium. So this is a well, well-connected family. Born and raised in Taiwan, moved to the United States in 1980. Wesley, Andes University, Columbia, of course. Heard out a hostile takeover at XCL. Uh, okay, this is a uh, Boomer and Shaker. Not a billionaire. Yeah, so if you can buy him talking on YouTube, I don't, I don't see too much. So it doesn't look like so many people have the question. Yeah. Find a four minute one, just hearing him speak, get a little bit of a sense of the person. Number 40, America's richest families, according to Ford. The family's more curious, so it's probably what's a good one here. But... Who this family? I assume T.T. Chow is passed away. Died in 2008. Impressive. Well, I've never heard of them before. There with the Penguins, a lot of money. Just 73, so you got to start thinking who's going to take his place. Mm -hmm. you now, it's a little tricky. You got a founder that's still running the company. That's, you know, most people think that's a negative. But a lot of times, people that found a good company don't are good managers, but who knows? You don't know much about it. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Smart guy, obviously, he's got a strong background. Pretty confident guy. He's been doing some hospital takeovers. <clears throat> that a nice little compensation here. Yeah. Well, but he's worth a billion, so it's a chump change. change. <laughs> nice big one. That's like so. Yeah, you might have to. This next guy, Steve Stephen Bender. I wonder if he's on YouTube at all. I see he's younger. Yeah, Stephen Bender. He doesn't. He's not out there at all. Seen Westlake High School. So that's like, you know. Yeah, I don't see Steve Under anywhere, so I don't know if he would be the logical one to take his place. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot on him. It all it says is he's a CPA. He's a CPA, so he's just he's just the CFO. Wait, who's going to take, you got these two brothers, and who's going to take their place? I'm sure they're wondering the same. <laughs> it looked like there was a David Chow. Maybe it's his son. Yeah, there are many other Charles shown in the topics. Okay, so the chief operating officer is Roger Kearns. There's a John and a David Chow who are both directors. It doesn't say that they're director. I think the director. David is This is a two person firm. That's a little bit of a red flag. Yeah. To anyone else, he's. And Steve Bender is 65. Your youngest person is 46, and he's just. Uh, Uh, Roger 
Arthur Kearns is the most recent hire. He started in 2021. We do have some new people. What website is that on? I'm on, on Bloomberg. Bloomberg. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, this one looks like it's one of those firms where the the CEO founder is it's almost like Steve Jobs or something like that. You know? It looked like that David Chow gentleman had a bunch of experience. Uh, it said that he was. Uh, this keeps popping up. He was the company's vice president in. From Morton. Bryce and Morton, you can't be much better than that. Mm -hmm. He's got an engineering degree, that's probably good. Serve as the director of company basically. Still a family more, you know, you're kind of worried about 43. Youngest executive. There's John. Uh. That's interesting. All right, well, no YouTube help, but it's probably just because of the industry here. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so you've got some sense that this, this, this looks like there's a lot of housing involved here, right? Anything besides housing that's a major industry they support? Um, let me open up the let's look at the orphans. Let me open up the annual report. Our very first picture is a house and then water, so it's water treatment and housing. Water is obviously a huge issue. Water purification has water shortage around the world. So that's probably. <laughs> the only two pictures they had, right? For water in the house. Yeah. And then one showed um, some type of injection, it looked like. I saw a wind turbine in one of their photos. Yeah, I think we saw that on their, their website. Uh, I'm trying to get to Olfins. Cause they had, they did a big thing on. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, so you figure out what that was? I I think it's more epoxies, but I could be wrong. Yeah, Products. Here we go. There's some medical in here. Turbines, airlines, medical care. They're very diverse. So their products can be used in several places, and they seem to be an industry leader with the, somewhat of a big wig of founders. My father. Their father was like a big wig. So you've got somewhat of the, you know, the star CEO kind of thing. Yeah, so here's Olfins. Here's a, the end uses high clarity packaging bags, film, coated paperboard. Yeah, uh, I want to say uh, heavy um, consumer disposables as well. Many industries, it's hard to tie down. So they're yeah, it really is. Really essential to several industries. That gives them some diversification. Some are high beta, some are low beta. 
that's not bad. We're showing them as the largest or second largest in some of these things. So, industry leader. I think the only concerning thing I'm seeing is who's going to take this guy's place when he retires. It sure doesn't look like they have anybody in the wings other than maybe his son. David's going to take over. So, uh, not interesting. All right. Yeah, and it says there's a, another second largest producer. That's the three LDPE linear low density polyethylene. It's hard to talk about the industry here because there's so many. So you might have to talk about them in segments. These chemicals and they support many industries that are very diverse. And just have some summary of what industries you're seeing. And you might quickly see what you think about each of these industries. Medical, there's turbines, there's airlines, there's water, there's packaging, so the retail industry. The leader is top or second in each one of those. Should I? They've done a hefty amount of acquisitions in like the past three, four years. Is that something I should focus yeah. on? Yeah, definitely. If they're material and large, yeah. You kind of see what that strategy is on the acquisition side. What are they trying to do? Are they trying to expand on the chemical side? Is it vertical? Or are they trying to buy a supplier? Uh, you know, which way are they going? Is it horizontal or vertical? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it part of a well articulated strategy? Or the same as far as I don't know. It depends on. I want to say uh, their most recent, recent acquisition was up here with the uh, Poly. It said they. Uh, gosh. Twenty nineteen, fourteen. Global compounding solutions. This is where we have basis of being popular. Looks like another chemical company. On them, it's a definite plant, so that could be either a supplier or expanding an existing business, mm -hmm. or buying customers. Yeah, you have to look how big it is. You know, if it's a forty billion dollar doing forty billion dollar company doing two hundred million dollar acquisitions, maybe not. But forty billion dollar company doing a five ten billion, yeah, that's material. Still don't know. You know, what's the strategy? How big is it? How material is it? What's the you know? You may look at one or two of the biggest ones, kind of good example of what what they do there. So there is some acquisitions going on, which is always important. Yeah, I agree with that. Diversified industry leader, founder, CEO. It's getting up there in age. They do some acquisitions. Would not be bringing the sum of son as a replacement. That's kind of scary. An impressive firm, right? It's an impressive firm. We've owned them before, so we must have like something before. But if you can kind of summarize that and then you know research those things, and then it just comes down to valuation. You could quickly. Yeah. So can you touch more on why the sun might not be the best choice? Well, I just it just makes you nervous, you know, if they keep if you want the best person for the job, not necessarily. Some nepotism going on. Yeah. Um, he may really be the best person, but generally you get a little nervous that they're grooming their own family members. Uh, you know, Richard Hathaway's, I think his son, Buffett, 
he has children that are in the business. So then they got to they gotta earn their own key. Yeah, all of these guys are pretty up there in age. Got David and John Tao. John Tao. My last name was Chow, even though it wasn't related. I think I didn't really confirm. <laughs> yeah, probably gets you some attention. Oh, that's good. You're doing right kinds of stuff. You're just trying to summarize who this firm is. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is some basic financials, revenue growth, earnings growth, those kind of things that you do. That's pretty simple to do. I'll try to summarize as much as you can, and then it comes down to valuation. Valuation. Can do the relative valuation. I've got a file I can send you if you can do, it, do that. And you did the security analysis, didn't you? Unfortunately, yeah. no. All right, so it's a file I use a security analysis and you can in just a matter of seconds do all the relative value analysis. I'm assuming you might have a YouTube on it. You don't need a YouTube, you just pretty simple. In, you just plug in your company and its industry and it all, everything loads automatically. So yeah, it's really easy to use. And then the um, this kind of cash flow valuation, we can do that last. You do that, if those want to check out. I mean, are you not saying anything that's a, a serious negative on the firm that I'm seeing? Um, like I said, I, I'm pretty much have just defined defined the industry. I mean, they so far nothing too negative. Like we said, they are in some highly sick um, like departments, such as the consumers, and then they're really in diverse and other places. You want to somehow do a chart that shows all the industries they support. If you can somehow get a sense of the percentages of each, okay, that would be a really insightful. Uh, credit ratings are triple B, so they're not like stellar, but their investment grades that's good enough. So, yeah, it's just a matter of summarizing that in the charts. If there's any of those things that Statista could help you with, if you've got a pretty tough industry. Yeah, I was on there earlier. Um, yeah. So, it might be, you know, going into the revenue revenue growth and what kind of details you can do, you know, what's growing the fastest, where is it growing, what countries are they in, you know, so you could do quite a bit of analysis on the revenue side. Net income is a net income, you just say relative value analysis that, that we can go fast. Yeah, their stock is up quite a bit. Not a whole lot this year, about 30% this year. Right. Yeah, so that's a good idea. How much time do you have? Send you the relative value chart real quick here. Let's see if I can find it first. Once you see it, you'll see it's, it's pretty straightforward. Are you you're in the number, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me share that on the screen. This file. Yeah, you can just send it to that one. Um, the resendas dot is that the UTSA one? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll just forward it to my Gmail really quick. Oh, it says Walmart, so it's set up for Walmart. We'll quickly. And the relative valuation. Yeah. Is it a spreadsheet? Yeah, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Can you send it to me too? I'll I'll forward it to you. Okay. Yeah, I'll text you right now. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'm already in the problem. Let's, let's let's see if I can find your name, Andrew Hernandez. Yep. Student, are you? Um, well, do my if you have my personal AJ, 
Yeah. Right, so maybe share it on, on Zoom. Oh, you can't see it? Oh, sure. So, LB2 that's the 06 30 2005. That's when the firm has its first data. Or before that, it's definitely. And now change A5, change the WMT to WLK. Right. And then go over the G5 and type S5. M A T R. What was that stand for? That's the material sector. Oh, okay. Oh, so, wait, is that just an index? That's yeah. Oh, okay, okay. What I usually do is, you know, I go on to Bloomberg and type C O M D with my company. It gives suggestions, but the S5, like we're doing tech, you just write S5 and T and see if tech comes up. You're doing consumers, F5. So, what if it's like, let's just say I was trying to look at some reads. I would just do S5 read. No, S5 and R and just see what comes up. Okay. It'll drop down in, in Bloomberg. Yeah, I'll give you choices. Okay. Um, yeah, there's an, there's an S5 R L S T. There's a couple of others. So. There's an S5 R E A L. I think you want the level one index. So R R L S T, I think is what you want. All right, so you I mean look at what you have. So go go to the bottom of, of that, go to like the B, very, very bottom, control down. So if you look right now, man, that part in. I, I did control down. Yeah, the training is really, really cheap. So right now their PE ratio is seven. Their industry is eighteen. PE ratio is seven versus eighteen for the industry. Their EV the sales is. 173, the industry is 268. Their price of book is two versus 330. Yeah, they're trading amazingly cheap. Look at it versus the SP, they're really, really cheap. So, this is a really cheap stock, even though they're up a bunch. I don't know why they're so cheap. The other thing it does, uh, you know, we I have to show you how to use it. So, save this file and I'll show you how to. Um, if you don't, essentially, what you do, you take that entire thing. Up that entire sheet, you control C and paste it as values on the second page. Is there a way to test how comparable once they get to the rest of the index? Um, we can go into some Bloomberg charts and look. That's where that's what if, what if they're not perfect comparable? Well, um, there are other industries, so you that we did materials, we could probably just get the chemical companies, but there's a limit. Uh, if you want to get down to just key competitors, you have to build all this yourself and put it on. It gets a little more difficult. You say create a copy of this one, Professor? No, no, no. Oh, you okay. Ah. Yeah, you don't want that. Delete that. Okay. So go up to the top left with the little, the little arrow is triangle. It's not that far up. Down, down. So next to the A on the column. Click on down below that. No, down. This one? Click on that control C. Control C. Go to paste values. A1. And right click. Click on the this one. A1. Click oh. on the one, two, three. Ah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh. No. Uh, yeah, you lost. You lost. Go. Right click and just click on the one, two, three. Data and then the next one, the output is where it does all the analysis. You can see right now they're trading. Um, that's first of the S and P. So they're trading uh, sixty-seven percent cheap to the industry. That's where that point four four three is in C three. Historically, they've traded 25% cheap to them the s &P. So right now, they're 43% cheap to their history. That's 
versus the material companies. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or 57. That's on that's on this that's, index. That's the industry. Yeah. The okay. industry they're trading 40% cheaper. So historically they've traded cheap to the industry. They've traded 25% cheap to the industry. That's what the median is in B3. Yeah. But today they're trading 57% cheap to the industry. So they're trading 43%. So everything when you look at this, they're pretty cheap. They're, they're not cheap on the EV to sales, but they're in line. So if you go across to the right, all right, I'll be right back. But save that, that's what you need. For sure. You can see how quickly you get that kind of Thank you for the model. I have a, I have a, dude, I have a friend who like works for Alice Alliance and Bernstein, Bernstein or whatever. And he was telling me that one of the models that he gave us is like a $10,000 model. Like it's for sale for like 10K. I don't know how like accurate that is, but like, I was like, dude, what are you I mean, saying? This one right here is like kind of perfect. Like, just like everything I thought of, you just like addressed in five seconds. <laughs> dude, I know how crazy. Is this? Beat it, the doll. That's where you said we were lacking, right? You need to sales. Oh. Yeah, that's why the freaking stock know, going up 30 up, something, 40%. Yeah, I, I checked today, it's, it's up like eight and a half in the last like two weeks. It's tapering off right now. Yeah, like, I was last week it's been sitting. I don't know why. I was thinking about putting in some options for it, but it's a little too expensive for me. <laughs> you got 500. Yeah. <laughs> My only worry is that less like is, it's kind of its own thing. Yeah. Um, I wonder how accurate it is. Like, if we chose a different company just to see, like, how how we act, I can like go over and like stick a read in there. Like, reads are pretty combo across the board. I'm wondering if we stick one in, we can see how at least like how perfect it looks. Yeah. So I don't know if it's like the model that's for this. You see what, like, I don't know if it's a, what they call, like, an effect that hits everything or an effect that just hits less, like, uh, federal scudastic, right? Uh, I'm not familiar on that. But, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Just, like, use a re to compare it or what? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, uh... It's called an intrinsic effect or a heteroscedastic effect. So if it's if it's something that only affects uh, Westlake, or if it's something that the model reflects on all problems, right? Mm. So that's why I'm saying stick the read in there because reads are I mean they're typically like pretty like similar across the board. Hey guys, so welcome to Bloomberg first stop analysis day three. So today we're gonna go over some Bloomberg technique and concepts to get the data for you to analyze and research. We wanna start off with some concept about earning per share, which is EPS. EPS is a figure describing a public company's profit per outstanding share of stock, calculated on quarterly or annual basis. In higher earning per share tend to be better to lower one, actually always better than the lower one, because that means <clears throat> you get the company is more profitable. However, looking at my EPS itself cannot tell the overall health of a company. And this is the equation. Profit divided by outstanding shares of common stock on net income minus preferred dividends divided by average outstanding common shares. And I want to talk a little bit about PE ratio, which a lot of investors use to value a company. It's, com it's basically compare a stock price to its earning. Is the ratio of a company share price to a company earnings per share. And so the average PE ratio for SP500 had historically ranged from 13 to 15. 
And usually when people talk about undervalued stock, they think about all sales season <laughs> because you're paying less for every dollar of the earning. And apparently a lot of technology company right now have very high value, which a lot of investors even say is overvalued. But remember that companies in different industries usually have different PE ratios. For example, technology for the average PE ratio of tech sector this last three years is 29.1. And that's what we can see here. I'm giving three examples on three different comp technology companies. First, we're going to go with the higher one which is TSLA, Tesla, which 200 to 23.15. It's a very high, actually overvalued company. But in the same times, a lot of in people say that <clears throat> their gross margin is better than many of his peers. And some people even say, you can see more potential. So higher ratio mean overvalue, but it doesn't mean that the company is bad. Just some people see a lot of potential in it. And Microsoft, which is one of the, my favorite one with 33.06, is a around average PE ratio for technology. And it's also, a great company. <clears> the <throat> portfolio is very diversif diversified. And how about Tencent? Tencent is a Chinese company that <clears throat> they famous for WeChat. And imagine WeChat is like Facebook compiled with PayPal plus Spotify, and it's in every, everything is in one app for more than 1 billion customer of just one country. But the PE ratio of it is very low. And one of the reasons for this is because of the regulation that the Chinese government put upon these many techno, big tech in China. And the Formula for PE ratio is share price divided divide by earning per share. And of course, we have to look at the overall to value in actual stock. As you, can see, as you can see here, this is the revenue portfolio for Microsoft. It's very diversified with 26% and 25% come from Microsoft, Azure, and Office 365. And this is very big because basically every corporation use Microsoft mostly. Azure is basically a cloud service. <clears throat> and apparently Microsoft win the contract with the US government for the cloud service. 16% for Windows. And even though a lot of people are talking about how Microsoft Surface is getting more popular, but eventually it's only 5% of its revenue. Or here, we can see Tencent. It's just not, so WeChat, it just won basically almost half of their revenue. More than that, they're also a venture capital and a financial corporation. They invest in a lot of company overseas and in China, <clears throat> mostly in gaming platform, as you can see, Riot Games, on, which own League of Legends. Like, it's one of the most popular game in the world, and they literally buy 100% of it. Or Tencent Games, which is one of the biggest mobile online game company. Have you used their game before? I'm sorry? Have you used Tencent's game before? I mean, when I was yeah, I playing uh, PUBG Mobile, but it was like when I was in <laughs> high school. I don't have time for it. Texas, the game, you want to play from? 
Yeah. A tight ten cent on my apps. Uh, no, you, you have to search in individual game. Like for example, they have PUBG Mobile. I think they own if they even own the uh, Call of Duty Mobile. I think. <laughs> and of course, they own even forty percent of Fortnite, which is a big thing for a lot of people. Oh, as you can see. Ubisoft and Activision, which is the US com like overseas company. And here, I just want to give an example of Apple, how even their portfolio is not very diversified, but they are very successful in it. But as you can see, most of their revenue come from iPhone by itself with, with 54%. And okay, let's dive in the action. I'm gonna show you how you can pull up EPS in Bloomberg. Let's take Microsoft as an example. <clears throat> and so when you click MSFT, in the Bloomberg search bar. Can you see it in your screen, Professor Swift? Yeah. Click MSFT, which stands for Microsoft. Yeah, I always type your email up here, ticker MFST, and I don't know who that is. So we click on the 18, which stands for GP line chart. <laughs> As we can see, here you can actually overview the from the beginning up until now with the maximum range of these five years or even just a year from now. And what you do next is that you click on key events and you click edit chart. You can see the when you click on key event, I'm trying to shop EPS. So you click on e, key event, you're gonna try to go down to earnings and it's gonna pop up. So the most recently, the second quarter from January 15th at 25th. I'm gonna click on it. All right. The, <clears throat> and what you can do is that you can export the Excel sheet and to your device. And so what we're trying to do right now is to analyze the quarter two <clears throat> of this year compared to quarter two of last year. Highlight it. We rename it. You're fine, Professor Sweet. That's the right earning for them, isn't it? Yes, it's EPS. And next, like I say, EPS by itself doesn't say everything because here's a trick. For example, a company A can have the same EPS as a company B. But eventually, I mean, company A used less capital to generate that EPS than company, company B. So let's, let's go to revenue, which <clears throat> when I export it. So all you need to do is copy and paste it. This, it's a trick. It's a shortcut. Shift Control down. Control C. Turn this off. Oh, actually, I can. Yeah, maybe I can stop. Create a new worksheet. Control V. Yeah, and you really want to get those Vs out. I, I take the Vs out. B. Yeah, it's, it's seeing where it says 51.728B. 
Oh, so again, yes. I mean, you can do it using an Excel function to take them out. It's okay, Professor Weed. I remember every lesson you teach right, online. So M7. <clears throat> M7. Parentheses, left. Parentheses, six. Oh, parentheses, I'm sorry, E, E7. E7. Probably six. Oh. So this one? Gotta go down to the bottom. Just um, yeah, it looks like it worked all the way down. Yeah, so just um, oh wait. Yeah, all you gotta do is just copy and paste M M seven all the way down. If you want to, you can copy O up a few more rows if you wanted to. Can I put it here? And then right click and well, just click on E seven by itself. Right click. Oh, can, can I just click Control C, Control V? Well, no, you have to do right click. Oh. Because you have to paste it as a value. Oh. So open, yeah. Right click on E7. Right click to, okay. And click on the one, two, three. Well, no, on the one, two, three. Okay, here. There you go. One, two, and O7, you can copy that up. Get those. That little square and just drag it up. You can copy and paste those over in the G. Numbers because you can't do anything with that B in there. Excel's not to recognize that. I don't know why they do that. It's kind of irritating actually. At least now you have numbers. You do have to use that value function because if you just do left six, it doesn't know it's a number. So okay. the value tells it it's a number and then the six says take all the numbers six left. So if you get rid of that B, now you still have a B. No, you don't have any B. I think you got rid of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, works perfect. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna highlight this again to compare the Q2 to the other to the last Q2. <clears throat> Okay, before we continue to set up more data, I'm gonna go over to gross, gross margin. Yeah, that's good. So I'll kill gross margin represents how much profit your company has after accounting for the cost of good sold. And the key difference between gross margin and EBITDA is that gross margin is a portion of the revenue after deduction the cost of goods sold in avatar <coughs> exclude interest, tax, depreciation, and amortiz amortization in his calculation. <coughs> let's search, let's search for so here when you see measure, <coughs> check for avatar. And again, just export it. Control shift down, control C, go back to the old worksheet. Create a new worksheet, control V, click editor. Oh, oh yeah, I, I was supposed to do gross margin first, <laughs> but okay. Oh, did I write B? <coughs> Close much. And as you guys can see here, like, this is surface, like to see the percentage of the yeah. correct 
Yeah, the surprise. How yeah, the surprise, how correct is they expected. And as you can see it's very good. They've been beating it with everything, growth margin, EPS, 12% on quarter four of 21. Yeah. Their stock price is still. But the the P ratio is still good though. The P ratio is Well, it's high, it's 30s, so it's a little high, but it's helping. I want to stop sharing real quick. Yeah. So let's put the gross margin onto Excel. Just do it again. Control shift down, copy. And open the worksheets that we work on. Create a new worksheet, gross margin. Control V. Here we go again. We're going to highlight the quarter two. As you can see, they beat expectation for the last year. For Yeah, as long as I can see, they didn't miss any. And to explain more about ABITAR, I zoom. I thought I'm saying sharing screen one right now. Oh, that's screen two. Wait, can you see it now? No. Okay. So ABITAR stand for earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. <clears throat> and as you can see, each word is stand for what it is. Earnings before interest, tax, Depreciation, which is the cost of tangible or physical asset over its it, it useful life. For example, like lands, equipments, <coughs> buildings. And A stands for amortization, a type of debt that requires regular monthly payments. And to calculate EBITAR margin, you take EBITAR divided by revenue. And so that's what we're going to do on our Excel sheet right now. Let's delete all this. Uh, I did. It's right here. I, yeah, I, that looks like revenue still. Hmm, okay. My mistake. Over to revenue tag, I think it's the same numbers. Yeah, bring it all over again. Six twenty five, not six. Okay, yeah, just it look weird. Yeah, because when it's too high, it's kind of untrue.
Okay, and uh, what we should do is that we get it to B because the Excel cannot work with it. Yeah, so this one's a little tricky because um, you can't do them all like that. So you yeah, you, uh, I mean, I can just do like with um, it takes a while the key two. Right? Yeah, I'd probably just do with Q2. Is that that'll work, right? Well, you got the it's gonna be too big for two parameters, and I might leave the dot in there for 25 point, 26 point. That way, it's on the same basis as your parameters, right? Okay. So 26.2 million, 25 point seven. Let's take the B off and just do it on those those ones. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, and so remember that uh, what we're gonna use is the estimate and the current. <clears throat> like for example, with the EPS report comparison, EPS is the adjusted. So we're gonna use it to compare with the estimated. And just like how I say the uh, EBIT EBITDA margin is equal to EBITDA divided by revenue. So what we do, we take EBITDA of comparison <clears throat> divided by the revenue. We go to the revenue worksheet. We have a 51.728. Enter, we copy it. I've seen like 100% for the suite. And I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. All right. So you, you copy it. In, right. Why are you defining? You're trying to calculate the EBITDA margin? Yes. All right. So you want to take that 26, go up to the 26, yeah, go up to I, do equal. Okay. Uh, escape out of there. So the equal. Okay, I'll delete everything. You can get rid of all of that. You can start equal that 26.212 over there and then divide. You go over to your revenue. You divide by the 50. 1728. Oh, the reported one? Oh, if you're, yeah, if you want to do comp, sorry. You I, I did. Change, change the other one. So hit enter. Oh, that F over, yeah, change that first one instead of E, make it F. Yeah, change that, that first one. Is the yeah, it's like one. I did it before. It was... Yeah, I'll make it a percent, though. Go back and make it a percent. Hit in there. You're good. You don't have to enter it. Wait, like. Yeah, don't click on the, don't click on the formula. You just want to click on the cell. Click one, but don't edit it. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it's still 100%. That's the thing. F7. But you weren't over. Yeah, somehow you didn't click on it. So, the DAW 7. Revenue. Somehow you didn't get there. So, click on the 51 right there. Click on that and hit enter. There you go. There it is. Oh, so you have to click enter right away yeah, at the revenue sheet. Back. All right, you can copy that. I see. One. I was confused. There you go. And then you copy that one now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, those you want to, yeah, 
Yeah, you copy them down. No, you don't want to copy them like that. You want to actually copy I seven and just control C. You take that down and hit enter on I eleven. Yeah, like Sit this. Enter, yes. right. No, on I eleven. Sit enter. Yeah, you can do it. So you want to copy I seven down to I eleven. Control C. Click on I. 11 and okay the same with the uh, the same yeah with... we don't really look at the expected last year so you might just take that out entirely that's okay. kind of old news you only want to do it on the expected you want it on the first one you don't want it on the second one we don't care about the expected last year we only mm -hmm. care about the expected this year yeah, when they beat the they beat the expectation, right? Yeah, beat it, but oh, it's, it's a little lower than last year, but not much. No, it's actually higher than last year. Yeah, they beat expected, and they did better than last year. Yeah, that's really strong. Is this one of the strategy when they do this? So the uh, investor is that one of the strategy? Like they do it so the investor can be like, you know, have more trust. Well, I don't know what's control they have on that. I mean, there may be some of that. Fifty percent. Uh, MDOM margin is pretty ridiculously high. It's a really strong margin. Grocery stores are like 3%. <laughs> Manufacturers are 7%. So 50% is just ridiculously high. Yeah, you, you got it. That's your MDOM margin. Yeah. Good. Okay. And so after we have all our research, I mean, all, all of our data is here, <clears throat> we can search up for the news and the reason why they go up and down to predict the future. There you go, go to search power, click the company that you want to research on. You wanna click on MSFT and instead of the line chart, GP, you wanna click on CN, the company news. And yeah, from there you can have all the companies as you'll see. And one of the big news that I heard from Microsoft, I don't know if it's... Uh, here we go. Here's the straggler. Here we go. I didn't start yet. I didn't start yet. <laughs> All right. That will be my cue to start there. All right. Um, I'm on the... Yeah, number... Yeah, okay, you know, I have you here. I have you here. Yeah, J. I, I was wondering, like, what the J stood for. It's literally J. I, I get that now. All right, so uh, I figured today I, I was kind of gonna go over some like economic factors in real estate, right? I feel like we've, we've touched on a lot of technicals. Like how, how do things look like outside of like the immediate interests of the real estate owners and how it affects the immediate interests of the real estate owners. Um, but before I get to that, you know, I like to do my my weekly interview question, my weekly interview question. And uh, I'm going to do two. I'm going to recap what we did last week because uh, because I wanted to show Justin. All right. So um, I'm going to throw a property out there. So let's just say I have an apartment building. I have an apartment building. And I have two options with this apartment building, right? So I'll go on this one. Apartment. Okay. Option one is to condo the place out. Two is to lease. Um, I can condo it at a thousand square foot. I can lease it for sixty. I also know that all over here around the block, we have apartment B, which just sold at a five cap. So as the owner, what do you do? Do we sell or do we lease? Think about it, think about it. Okay, question, depends on their there's a lot of different things. Uh, there's no depending the number what, there. What's their plan? 
What's the number? Do they want to keep moving? Numbers are there. Numbers are there. There's no plan. There's nothing. This is it. That's all you need to know. Okay. Everything's there. What's your logic? Come on, man. You know I'm asking for math here. <laughs> you know I'm asking for math. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. This is all you need to know. These are two identical farm buildings. You can either sell it at a thousand square foot or lease for it. You got to remember the key here is that apartment B just traded for a five. Think about it. How do we come up with our cap rate? They know I overvalue. So we know, right? Just think about it. Think about it. What do we have here? Think about this, this formula that we have. We have cap. We have value. And we have NOI. All three numbers are there. It's two separate equations, but it's all there. We give up. Okay, I'll get into it since, uh, since nobody knows what they're doing right here. <laughs> Even though I, I specifically explained well, Don't you have to divide up like 65,000 to get basically the cap rate for the Close, close. Okay. Because gonna, these aren't realized values. These are hypothetical yeah, values. It doesn't matter because we're valuing it per square foot. All right, so I'm going to get into it. So the condo, right? You're too late. You can't talk. <laughs> The condo, right? We know the value, right? If you sell it, that's it. Value is 1K. Interesting part here is whenever we get into our lease, right? Square footage, our lease, another word for rent, you know, in, in, in simple terms here, this rent is our NOI, right? That's literally how much we're collecting for the unit, right? So, of course, we're going to do our 60. We're going to divide that by our 0.05. Looks like it was. Uh, 1200. Hmm? 1200. You're going to throw, uh, you want to go backwards. So, NOI, so that means our value is. Does that make you, does it make it clear there? Okay, I'll restart. Do the, do the algebra. 0 0.05 because our cap rate. Our cap rate, five cap means 5%. We have our NOI. Sure. We're getting the value. Write it out as the value that you're trying to find out as an X. In short, in the okay, okay, okay. So the value we're trying to find is, is this. So don't look at it as cap because we have cap. So imagine it's, 0 0.05 equals 60 over 60. that's the equation there. It's, it's it's basic algebra. <laughs> okay. I'm messing with you, I'm messing with you. <laughs> well don't laugh at me. I'm just trying to solve this. What's what's confusing? Do you are you not getting the, the concept or are you not getting the math? Like, where? Because you don't know what your square footage is. So how are you supposed to apply it? It doesn't matter, like, how many square feet, because we're right now we're talking about one square foot. That's, that's all the square foot there is. Like, there's, there's only, in this case, the transaction's happening, like, like per square foot. So, like, it, it could be, we could be talking about 100,000 square feet, we could be talking about 10 square feet. It, it, it doesn't matter. Because in this case, our unit is a square foot. So, I mean, we could say, you know, the apartment is 100,000 square feet, and then we multiply all these by 100,000, but the, the ratio is still there. You get know what I mean? We would just be multiplying the, you know, like our 1,200 again by, by 100,000. Takes a lot of stuff. Per square foot, then you can scale it up to say, for example, he has this much square foot in America. So it's helpful. Let's talk it through. Keep talking. Keep talking. Me? 
And do you get it now or? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think it's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. I'm sorry, I, I don't, I'm not trying to make this hard. I, I know I, I had an awful way of saying things, but. Okay, Let's start with step one. What's step one? We have the value of the condo. So we have the value of the condo, exactly. Drop that down. It's just 15 months. On the value of the lease. Our, our eight cap again, so another 0.08, this is 8%. percent we do our 70 over 0.08. Oops. I can't do that kind of math. 875. So once again, right, what's happening is, is we're treating this, this square foot lease, right, as our NOI. Obviously, real world example, rent alone is not NOI, so just, just remember this is a very simplified example. Um, we're using that as the basis of our cap rate. The value, right, is essentially what we're trying to find. Because if we're ever, you know, like, Comparing alternatives, we just we choose the highest value. Right? So it's a it's a lower cap rate better. So you can do a higher value, but um, it depends like who you are. If you're the buyer or the seller. If you're a buyer, a higher cap rate is better. Higher cap rate is better because that means that your NOI is higher in uh, in relation to the value, right? So essentially, like you're paying less for the building, right? Obviously, like anyone who's buying anything wants to pay as low as possible. If you're the seller, right, you want to be the other way around, right? You want to be selling it for as high as possible. So NOI is, you know, the same. You want to, you know, the, the larger the denominator is, the smaller the fraction. We have, we have that. Of course, I mean, like I said, real world example, um, NOI is not all rent, right? There's, you got to make some deductions, some additions, right? Uh, and... Obviously, like you got to remember, like if you're leasing something that's cash flows in the future in finance, we discount. So, like that number is also skewed in the sense that it's not discounted, right? All else held equal, very hypothetical example. Um, you're going to choose in this case the condo because you're getting the most. Cool, all right. I felt like that one wasn't as bad as last week's, so we're going to go over last week's again. Last, week. last week's took me a long time to figure out. Do we remember our cash on cash yields? All right, we'll do this and we'll start jumping into the meat of the lecture. All right, so. Yes, uh, I'm gonna have to like write it out. I, I don't know like my, my definition. So the whole joke I made last time was like, okay, Justin was being cocky. <laughs> Speaking of being cocky. I guess it, again for the second time nobody laughs. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's it's the uh, upper piece and lower piece. Of yeah, if, you know that's that's the point. Think so. Okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and say we have a one million dollar bill. Okay. 
So purchase price is one mil. We're gonna have how much are we borrowing? How much are we borrowing, Cassie? Um, we're not gonna ask you. Um, it's out of nowhere. It doesn't matter. What percentage uh, of the building are we borrowing? Fifty percent. Fifty. There we go. All right. Who's the bank? Who's the bank? Alex is the bank. How much? Uh, how much are you charging in interest, Alex? Five. Five. All right. All right. It's a tough market. It's a tough market. <laughs> yeah. Five percent interest. All we need. I believe that is all we need. <clears throat> No, that's it. again, it's like a theoretical example. It doesn't like matter. Yeah, realistically, right? Like this, it should be inclusive of like some things that we're, we're throwing in there. But this is a long. This is all we need for for the basic math. Okay, so oh, I forgot the cap rate. Um, we'll do a six cap. So I'm I'm, I'm feeling very uh, strategic today. All right, so. First things first, how much is the building making? Six percent of a million. Oh, yeah. That's your million. Uh, six percent, sixty-eight thousand. That's right, sixty-eight thousand. So the whole building. Remember, I made my little chart last time. One hundred percent of the building makes sixty k. Now we only put in fifty. We put in the five hundred. So this is the bank. Thus, uh, one million, so five hundred k each. How much are we paying in interest? Million dollar building. No, because we only borrowed half. Oh. We only borrowed half. Twenty five thousand. There we go. Is it twenty five thousand? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we only pay interest on what we borrow, right? So that twenty-five thousand, or in terms of, of a percentage, right? Twenty-five percent, right? Sixty k, and we know we're making uh, we're making six percent. Okay. So as of right now, the entire building makes realistically, after interest, how much? This, this three and a half percent, three and a half percent. So uh, the entire million, right? After interest, after everything, makes three and a half. That's our hundred percent. And once again, how much did we put in? 50. Us? Oh, that's the percentage. percentage. Yeah, yeah. We put in 50%. So we essentially do what? We multiply it by two. So our cash on cash yield is even. Easy. It's done. Do we want to do one more example? Or are we tired of math? No. <laughs> Fair. Oh, you do want to do another one. All right. They apply the two you they sell your data to apply. Oh, what's that? Why did you apply the five percent? The five by two? The five percent. So why did you Oh, because we only we only borrowed half. Charging you five percent interest on what you borrow, isn't it? Exactly. So we didn't. But you're borrowing. Half. You're still borrowing, like. We borrowed five hundred thousand. In terms of percentages, right? Because we did it on percent. Yeah. One hundred percent is everything, right? Yeah. We pay right. The whole building earns the six percent. We only pay interest on fifty percent because we borrowed it. Yeah. Right. So in terms of the whole building. In terms of the whole building's output, only two and a half percent goes to interest. If we put it in a dollar amount, remember, uh, 500,000, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's 5% of 500,000. 
25,000 on a million is to 2.5. Exactly, because what the building makes as the owner, right? We reap the benefits of the entire building, right? That's just how, I mean, that's, 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 that's any investment, right? Doesn't matter how much we borrow, we, we gain everything. We take the profits from everything, but we have to pay what we borrow. But that's a fixed amount. That, that just comes straight from the amount we borrow, right? Again, there's, there's caveats like the, the payment's not going to be, right? It's like it's yeah. interest and principal are going to be you know, two different things. But all right, we'll do one more time, one more time. And we'll get into our, our email. Cash and cash return of 7%. That is for the whole building, or is that for? Well, that's how that's literally like what this is saying is how much I make for my investment. So, what is that? How much I'm literally making. What does that mean? 3.5 is? Because the 3.5 is for the whole 100%. Oh, yeah. 100%. Now, since we only put in half, but we make all, right? The actual return on our investment that is that is the seven. The complication is going to be. Side of it. Okay. I know that is that is the most complicated part here. It's like what goes to where, but you just got to remember you only pay interest on what you borrow. But the owner makes the profits of everything. We'll do one more time. We'll do one more time. All right. We're going big scale this time. We're talking about downtown San Antonio. We're talking about a brand new tower that was just put in, and we're looking at $200 million. So the Drew sized you. Talk about the auction. Yes. <laughs> oh, the Rainier, Rainier Street development. There you go. It's development is different, but let's imagine that it's already done. How much is it going for right now? It's like 450, right? I didn't make it brilliant. All right, well, we'll say 400 make the number two. So first price, 400 sticks. All right. Um, it's a big chunk of money. Interest rates are not going to be five percent. I'll tell you that. The building next door, also four hundred million dollars, is running. It's a big, big old chunk of money. So we're going to borrow a lot of it. We're going to borrow a hell of a lot of it. We're going to borrow. 80%. Is that enough? 90%. Here we go. We're talking about lucrative investments today. 90. And take good. Guaranteed by Alex personally. Recourse. Recourse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, so where's our where's our start? Our lines can be a little bit this time, right? Our line's gonna be 90s and a little something like that, right? So this is us. This is the bang. All right, so of course, five percent of the four hundred million makes us how much a year? Twenty million. So the entire building gives us a whopping twenty million. Anyway, of course, we have our three percent interest that we pay to the bank, but this time we're going to pay a larger chunk of that interest, right? Or larger, to, well, yeah, of course, this is 90 million, right? So, I mean, to make this easy, what's 90% of 3%? 2.7. Our 2.7 is going to look long, so only that. Was I right? It's 2.7. Why, oh, stop? You sound so confident. 
not perfect. So 2.7, of course. That's coming out of our 20 million. So what does that leave us with? 17.3 pound per 17.3 million is what we take home. Of course, that goes on top of what? How much should we put in? Forty million. That's what we put in to your asking, right? Yeah. Actually, hold on here. Um, I did this in terms of percentages and millions. Are we doing this in millions today? Is that what we're feeling like doing? Because uh, yeah, I've already messed up the math. That's maybe a, a good thing to pay attention to. If you're in percent, you have to stay in percent. If you're in dollars, you got to stay in dollars. I usually just stay in percent because, well, we learned, like our answer is a percent, right? Um, so our 2.7 is actually 2.7 of the 400 million. And the 2.7 was 90% of the tree. Exactly. So what's 2.7 on 4 million? We'll go in terms of dollars, so that way it may be a little more physical. 400. No, no, no. no. Ten you did 0. 0.27. 10 million eight hundred. So seven point eight. So we're gonna do minus ten point eight. So then what's that give us? Nine point two. Oh yeah. Remember, we only put in ten percent of the four hundred million. We put in forty. Right. So in this case, instead of dividing the percentage by our percent, we just divide it by 40. That'll give you our yield. So 9.2 on 40, I don't know what that is. Something close to like 18. So there you go. 23% cash on cash. It's real estate, baby. We lever up. Aren't you 2.7? 2.7 is, it's, remember, it's our interest. But this is 100% interest right here. Yeah. So it's like an easy way to think about it is, is like just multiply the percent that the bank, that you, when we owe the bank times the percent. That gives you literally like how much you owe on the whole building. Because really, 90% of of the 400, which is, if we say 40, yeah, 360. So 360 times our, uh, what is it? Yeah, our 2.7 gives us the 10.8. It might be the 2.7. The 2.7 is, it's 90% of 3%. But why, I mean, so you're going to the bank and you're telling them I need to borrow $360 million. Aren't they just gonna charge you 3% on $360 million? Like that's, that's the part that I don't understand. Like why? Like because why? this is two point seven percent of everything. I should centralize that. Two point seven on the whole, the whole project. So you're so you're okay. So you're twenty million. We're not purchasing. So what back? Because we're the owner. You got to remember, we're the owner. What is the what is our number? Right. Four hundred forty million. You're thinking about the bank. We're not the bank. I don't care what the bank says. It's 0. 0.9 times 0. 0.03. Oh, time. Yeah, a quick way to do math, please. Oh, you, you mentioned oh okay. I assume you were asking. I thought you were asking. It's in the 10% denomination, so we're at 5%. You can just take 10% and then you have to get it faster. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like 5%. So he did 90, uh, 9 .9 of 3%, so when you do math, 10% of 3% is 0. 0.03. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was Okay, it's a lot. I'm sweating, dude. I'm sweating. You want me to do? You still don't get it. No, I, I, I get it. I get the concept, but like, 
why is the bank only going to charge you 2.7 percent interest? Because you're, you're it's not two points. And so you're, you're thinking about in terms of the bank still. But this like is 2.7 percent of 100 because we only borrowed 90. Yeah, if the whole thing. Okay, I see where I didn't make that clear. It's 3.3% of the chunk, right? I see what you mean if you say 3% of the 90. I should have clarified that as well. Yes, yeah, so if we do it like that, 3% of 90 is. Two point seven. I'm doing new numbers. It's, these numbers are bad. These are bad numbers. So you are charging three percent interest on the ninety. Yes, it's, it is. It is three percent of ninety. It's two point seven percent of the whole. Like we're paying two point seven percent. If that makes sense. So they're still charging you three percent interest. Of course, like, yeah. The bank is charging. Yeah, on on their sheet, it's three percent. On their sheet, it's three percent. To us, it's two point seven. Oh. I don't understand. Okay, okay. Because like, we make remember how I said we make profit on the entire building. Yeah. Right. So our our five right our five percent comes straight out of the four hundred million. That is 100%. 100% is 400 million. You get that. We're, 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 we're clear there. Okay, perfect. 100% is 400 million. So we make, right, 20 million as our 5%, right? That's our 20 million. We got that too. Yeah. We're cool there. But that 20 million reflects the entire building. You also get that. You also get that. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I see where this is, this is getting confused because we make, I, I don't know how to like reword that, that we make 100% of the building's revenues, but the bank, we're only paying the bank the percentage that they, that we borrow from them. I feel like my representation may not be perfect either. It's not that we're paying three percent interest on on, on nine hundred. So don't even pay attention to the ten. On nine hundred or ninety percent, not nine, which is three hundred sixty million. Yeah, ninety percent. Ninety percent. We pay three percent of ninety percent. Yeah. Which so of the whole, you know, if, if you think about it in terms of one hundred percent, that makes that percent that what we actually pay. Like, was it in an actual dollar amount? What's three percent of three sixty? Uh, Ten point eight. Sorry, ten point eight. Ten point eight in terms of the whole four hundred million is that two point seven percent. But if you really have, I swear to God, I will take as much time as you need. No, it's okay. I think I think I got it. I think I think I was just confused about like how. Well, let's let's do fresh numbers because. If we're looking at the same numbers the whole time, we're, we're just going to get wrapped up around the same math. We'll do 100 million. Uh, we really went, we went hard this time. <laughs> we went some like very like hard numbers to balance. So we're going to do 100 million this time. 100 million. Um, 100 million. I'll do my little bar again. We're going to do um, how much are we borrowing? Two percent. Easy, make it easy. That means we're paying ninety. We're not going to point to borrow at that point. Twenty <laughs> percent. We'll borrow twenty percent. That's just. Or we put in twenty percent. No, like okay, no, just do like um, like we're borrowing like forty percent. We're borrowing. We're borrowing forty percent. We're paying sixty percent. Okay, all right. Let's say that. So twenty percent LTV. Okay, um, interest. Sorry, good, good. Get number easy. And 
Will do. Capri. Cassidy's the owner of the nearby building. She just sold it at one cap. Six, there we go. All right, so 40% LTV, that means it looks a little more something like that. This is us, bang. 100 million, this time it's easy because then we know uh, we are 60 million and it's 40 million. First step. Value times interest. Well, we got around how much we make. Oh, you mean six cap? Six cap on 100 million, six million. Okay. Six mil. You remember that 2%? So, how much are we of the entire 100%? How much are we paying in interest of our 100% of revenue? Because we're paying 2% on 40 million. On 40 million. So we're paying. So, I mean, if, if you need to take the extra step, please do so. 2% of 40 million. Uh, yeah, of 40 million. Ten percent of 40 million is what? Four. It's four. So then divide that by five. I'm doing math in my head. I'm sorry. I can't do math. No, no, it's fair. It's fair. What did you say, point eight? So that would give us, right, uh, our, our eight. When we say eight million in interest, no, not eight, no, eight. That would be eight percent. Eight hundred thousand. There you go. Because it's point eight. Um, we pay 800,000 in interest, right? So, but putting it into the dollar amount, like that's a whole extra step. Just like, remember, we're just doing it so that, you know, we can see, right? In reality, that's just point eight. This is actually just six. All right, so on the whole 100%, how much are we taking home? Now, it's going to be our six minus 0. 0.8, 5.2. Uh, that was eight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, hold on. I don't even see where that was. That's why you convert it to interest. Okay. That's why, because you, when you leave it in percent, it, that you don't even need a dollar amount. I'm not going on that. I'm struggling with something. I was like, I was like, I. I turned on the Dude, we're in real estate. We are in real estate. We're not mad. Trust me. The only reason I know how to do this math is because I've I've done it. Right? It's like I don't I don't just like know math. So that gives us uh, five point two percent. But remember, the five point two is on top of our sixty percent and nothing else. So five point two divided by point six. 5.2% is just what we put in, right? No, 5.2 is what we made. That's what we get out. That's why out of what we put in or about that? Everything. That's everything. 5.2 is everything. So then what is our return? It's just 5.2 over 60.6. What is it? 60 million or 6 million? That's 6%. No, this is... Uh, yeah, it's 60 million because we put in 60 million. No, it's like real lot of zeros. <laughs> That's what I got. You said it'll be 5.2. It'll be 5.2. Point just point six because it's 60 percent. It's 8.67. There it is. Are you still cocky? Um, <laughs> 8.67. We're gonna do this every week. I feel like it's a, it's a nice little nice little exercise. All right. We spent a lot of time. Doing it. All right.
Are we fair, kind, racist? We still had like a topic to cover today. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. We're good. We're good. Um, if you want more practice with this, written out in a more uh, digestible way, if you go on my Google Drive on real estate technical questions, this is question number one. Number one. It is that important. Okay. Oof. Now to get into some factors, right? Some factors. So really, I wanted to cover how interest or how cap rates are affected by interest rates, right? So um, and we've all taken you know, our economics classes. We know that whenever interest rates rise, what does it say about the money supply? Slow, slow, right? And whenever interest rates rise, the cause, what happens to our demand? The demand also goes down. Our demand goes down too. So if we're just if we're thinking about real estate, right? We're thinking about how much we've just spent all this time borrowing. All these scenarios where we borrow just to maximize our returns, you can imagine like real estate is just very heavily dependent on interest rates. We need to borrow money. That's that's how that's how we stay competitive, you know, versus like the stock market, right? It's like the whole point is is like we're we're borrowing stupid, stupid, stupid amounts of money. That's why 08 happened. That's why, you know, if you think about like any global financial crisis ever, the East Asian financial crisis. Right, they were over levered in real estate. You look at Greece, Greece is over levered in real estate. Everyone's over levered. Well, I mean, that's kind of the industry, it's like we're meant to be over levered, right? That's, that's just how that's how we, we push returns. We justify the amount you borrow because of just like the relative safe nature of real estate investments, right? It's like as long as you have like a, a good team, right? I mean, like you know, educated experienced, you're going to make money, right? You're not going to lose. You're going to make your debt payments. And I mean, worst case scenario, as long as you're paying the bank, everyone's happy and the system stays intact. So, I mean, we just, we just saw how little we actually have to pay the bank, right? It's like in terms of, yeah, like it looks like a big chunk of our revenue, but in terms of our returns, it's, it's almost nothing. That's, that's sort of, that's the whole like concept behind this, right? And, um, Quick, quick, like side fact, right? Is is that real estate is the second most highly levered industry in the world? Do you know what number one is? Gas, <laughs> oil and gas, baby. Oh, right now. No, I mean of all times, oil and gas. Um, well, I think right now, real estate, it's like an average of like a seven x. Right? Like we we tend to borrow. Or, or finance, like it doesn't have necessarily have to be from a bank. Just money that isn't ours is seven times the money that we put in, right? In oil and gas, it's like 12. Oil and gas is like 12. But, you know, whatever. Let, let, let them die. There's a bunch of dinosaurs in there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Ramsey that. Ramsey, oh, yeah. Ramsey, I know. Ramsey knows. She's not even. There you go, man. You see, it's, it's just it's the nature of it all. But so, how does this tie into cap rates? Right? Well, I just told you, right? Like the demand to borrow decreases when interest rates rise. Whenever we're borrowing less money, that means we're investing less. If we're investing less, what does that do to the real estate market? That means the demand for real estate also drops. Cap rates increase because values are decreasing. Chain of relationships. This goes up, so this goes down, so this goes up, so this goes down, and this goes down. That's that's all I really, that was like my whole, my whole spiel today is that. It's literally, there's a lot going into it, but that's, it's kind of cool to think how like 12 steps before 
how all that stimulus money that we got two years ago is now affecting real estate markets. Where's Jay Powell and all this? Center of it all. Center of it all, baby. Yeah. Yee, yeah. yee. <laughs> That's all I have to say. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of like the, the core of, of my argument today. Um, hold up. All right, man. See it. Take it easy. So then, um, I mean, while, while we're still on cap rates, So of course, interest rates are, are you know, they tend to be a large determinant of how it's spending out. Um, the next thing, right, that, that kind of determines cap rates is what we consider um, our discount rate, right? Because all a cap rate is, is just, um, hold on here. Let me make sure I'm gonna say this right. I wanna do this right. Yeah, all the cap rate is, is it's just like a, a fancy version of a discount rate, right? Because in, in simple terms right now, I mean, this is like on an economic level. You may want to write this down too, because it's like very, very like high level real estate here. Is that your cap rate is your risk-free rate. Plus a premium, plus growth. Let's 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 chop that down, and yeah, we have like five. Minutes, so, this is the last. So, risk free rate. Where does that come from? The ten year, right? Easy. We're, we're, we're what's what, what do we get for free? Basically, what do we get for free? Step by step. Well, sort of easy, easier. Um, where's real estate going, right? Where's our real estate going? Where's this particular piece, this one building going? You know, we can say like, oh, okay, it's, it's gonna increase over the next 10 years. All right, everyone can say that. Right? Uh, it's gonna increase next year. Some people can say that. You know, COVID happens, you get a negative number there. But this is, this is less about the numbers, this is more about the concept, right? And in the middle of it all is risk premium, right? So, yes, like real estate's growing. You know, anyone can tell you that. Anyone can give you the risk free rate. But it's that premium that makes this whole thing a sham. And this is why there's no such thing as like a real cap rate, right? It's like, yes, you can take the NOI of the building. And yes, you could find what they sold it for. But that's at one point in time. And it's at the time where they sold or they bought. But like any time other than that, which is 99% of the time, how do you really find a cap rate of a building? How do you really know what the value is? No one really knows. You can get an appraiser, but that's just an opinion. That's one person's opinion. And they're gonna look at very like physical characteristics. They don't know the market, they're an appraiser. So that whole that whole chunk is where you know we come in as analysts and we sort of determine like what is the true risk premium right now? Like how much are we actually paying? Like yeah, there's a dollar amount that we pay to invest, but like, what is that dollar amount representing? Where's the risk? There's no such thing as like a riskless investment other than a bond, like a treasury bond. Like you obviously you have to pay more than more than just you know the, the value of the building. You know you you risk losing your money. But it's that's just you know. So that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole concept there. Is that, 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 that risk premium is just reflected in, in every value of a building. Anytime you see a value on, on a pro forma or on, a, on an acquisition model, it's, it's just that analyst's opinion of all these factors in, in one. That's all, that's all I really have. That's all I really have. Uh, okay. Why is there a speed rate for that? 
Okay. Don't think about the math. Like the, the math, yeah. like the, the, the numbers aren't real here, right? You can't. You can't What's be like. Yeah, like, oh, my risk premium is seven right now. Seven what? I don't know. <laughs> How do you measure risk? So you're saying cap rate is the risk premium, which anyone can get, right? Plus the premium that you can get. Right. So the risk premium is going to be the difference between the risk premium. That's, that's what I'm getting for my risk, right? Say that again. What? Isn't the risk the risk premium, right? For the second variable there? That's here. Yeah, the risk premium. That that would be quantified as like. What we get above the risk, right? So, like, if say we got 14% back, and the right, 10%, right, it's like if you beat risk, right? Like, if yeah. you're a positive investment, this is like the alpha, right? This is like the true alpha. This isn't again, it's like a, a very yeah. like non physical concept. It's just like this is where the value is coming from. This is like your gamble, like, you know, I could either bet on red or black, like, yeah, like that's where your 50%. You know, I mean, that's 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 how you double your money, right. You know, in real estate, this is your red and black, and that's where you're making your 17%. There. We'll call it a day. We'll call it a day. <laughs> like, yeah, this is a very, like, you know, like, well, it's, like, you get, trying yeah. to get in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it's not, like, meant to be got, you know what I mean? It's just, like, the, the concept. Oh, and there's, like, everyone's, like, that's, like, the going out cap rate. Um, I mean, like it's, it's yeah, like yeah, a cap rate, yeah. like any point in time, right? It's like you can find a cap rate easily by looking at what someone just paid for a building, right? Because like the number they're like you know, NOI is a solid number, and what they paid is a solid number, right? But if you're the acquisitions analyst, right, you're the one coming up with that number. You're the one coming up with the purchase price. You're like, okay, well, I'm not going to pay more than 100 million. Why are you not going to pay more than 100 million? Okay, well, because whenever I came up with my cap rate, the risk does not justify a proper return for a building that's $101 million. It's $100 million, and that's all I will pay. Now, again, that is just me. That's just me and my strategy. You know, you get to find someone at Blackstone who says, we'll pay $120 million because we have the best in the game. We're the best property manager. We're the best analysts. We have the best of everything. So we can justify that extra risk. We can pay for that. And our mandates, you know, we, we, can, we can still push out that 17% even if we pay an extra 20 million, right? Because at the end of the day, like, it's, it's not about, like, obviously, you got to maximize your profit, but it's like, what, what are your investors saying? Like, your investors aren't going to invest with you anymore if you're not pushing their returns. You know, me at, at, at Drew Cap, you know, I can only make, you know, like, oh, shit. I can make I can make that 17% if I pay like 80 right now. Of course, you know, top of the game, Blackstone, they can afford it. They can afford to hit that 17%. They have the cash on hand to do it when they want. You know, me, I have to wait. Me, I have to call the bank. There's time. You know, there's so many other factors, and that's where your risk is coming from. These, these are just like the non-financial. If you think about it, it's like how much time does it take me, the only employer, employee of my company, to call the bank? How long does it take me to get a loan approved? How long does it take me to get my property manager to do what I want? How long is it going to take my property manager to do what I want? You know, it's like all those things. Like if I'm a discount shop, like I, I'm obviously not going to have the immediate, like I'm not going to have the time or the resources to do things at the same level that a faster shop can. That's the whole premise. That's the whole, that's where this, that, that value comes from one company to the next. Eric? Sorry. Awesome. That's class. Man. I killed three quarters of the class. <laughs> they all left. Uh, I think for now, I'll just start the class. Hopefully, Jay will show up. Anyways, uh, welcome to my class. I was using censorship with blockchain tech class four. And in this class, I'm gonna go over a bit more about privacy and anonymity. Um, Monero itself compared to Bitcoin and, uh, the, and the overall illicit use of cryptocurrencies and the uh, use overall use overall in the, in the vol <clears throat> I explained that badly. The overall volume of illicit uses in the crypt of cryptocurrencies.
Is this you, Jay? Just starting class right now. I'll start with the disclaimer. All information shown in this class is not intended to provide personal tax nor financial advice. This information presented is intended to be consumed and used for educational purposes only. I am not an investment advisor, nor am I a tax advisor. I'm still a college student. Please consider your own personal circumstances and speak with professional advisors, independently research any data and information you may rely on, whether for making an investment or tax decision or otherwise. Welcome to my class. Uh, Jay, I have you in my attendance, so don't worry about signing in. If anyone comes in, I have to take attendance for them. But uh, you know, I school, school over some terminology, uh, blockchain terminology, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogcoin, Litecoin, Monero. Uh, this class, I'm going to talk a lot about Bitcoin and Monero itself. And uh, overall, there are tokens that are typically decentralized and open source. The goal is to enable the common man, realistically, though, is the tech savvy internet dwellers who use crypto to be able to use without the need intermediaries, without use without a bank, to be able to transfer funds or purchase uh, goods and services. The blockchain network uses size of public ledger comprised of various wallet addresses, a public and a private address. However, as we see right now, uh, it kind of varies between uh, each different cryptocurrency. This peer-to-peer -peer style transaction via individual wallet addresses characterizes most of the cryptocurrency transactions today. And the NFT question, I'm going over Bitbit, which is a non-fusible token, which means it cannot be duplicated, replicated, or replaced very easily. It can be stolen, though. You can be careful with that. As a couple previous hacks and uh, incidents with the NFTs I've shown us in the last, uh, from last semester, they're not, it's not an invincible form of uh, asset. And uh, each NFT is unique to each other, and each NFT token is different, thus allowing NFTs to be used to represent original artworks, collectibles, like digital trading cards, musics, and videos. Uh, the way NFTs are built allows to be flourished in a world of digitalized art and financial services too. Modern NFTs are mostly based on the Ethereum blockchain, but there's some other uh, blockchains that are, able, that are able to create NFTs too. Ethereum is special in that they can hold additional data information about a particular token, which is why it got uh, it's so popular with NFT makers. And with the verification of ownership, history of ownership, prices are additional data that are able to find on NFTs, which makes them more, which gives it the tangible value that a lot of people seem to try to, to find in it. Anyways, Bitcoin is a very good, uh, it's the first major cryptocurrency that we all heard of uh, as soon as the crypto boom happened. But the transparency of Bitcoin is actually a double-edged sword. Bitcoin is not entirely private and Public in a pub in the transactions from the blockchain is always public. Transactions be viewed by anyone in the internet. Just go to etherscan.net if I if I got the address right, and just use a view. If you got the proper wallet address, you can view all the transactions in it. Thus so taking advantage of the of the third <clears throat> of the third ledger that I talked about a couple classes ago. The Bitcoin is not anonymous. Bitcoin gives details about transactions between addresses. And we're using those addresses, you connect the details of someone to real life identity of someone. Particularly if someone is taking donations in a form of crypto, you can easily uh, trace them back. Here kind of summarizes it. So that basically Bitcoin announces every transaction. I had to censor the password here. And let's go a bit about illicit purposes of cryptos. How much of crypto is really used for illicit purposes? As uh, I got most of my information from a chain, from an organization called Chainless, who did a big, large study on this. Basically, it points out that although their scams within the crypto world is popular, particularly within the NFTs, as, as you consider, there's a lot of rug pulling, stuff like that, plus token. I'm not sure if you people, if you heard about that. It was popular in China and South Korea. It's a, it was a big Ponzi scheme, particularly usage around a, a, a crypto token called Plus Token, which promised to pay out a certain amount of pay out money every month. And a lot of people fell for it. 
And unfortunately, uh, there is a big rug pull, but, but the good thing is a lot of the perpetrators got arrested. But overall, besides that, only about 0 0.4 or 9 billion in terms of volume are used by criminals, which is not even close by the majority. 0 0.4 of the total volume in, a crypto, in crypto transactions. It's mostly made of scam pro projects and dark web markets um, transactions. And the report kind of goes hypothetically why exactly uh, crypto isn't that pop. It's being, it's being adopted by criminal elements, that's for sure, but it's not very, it's not that popular so as uh, people like to, to, to show. I think the, the report likes to say that the criminals are starting to realize that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are not anonymous, as I mentioned in, right here in the previous slide. And sooner or later, they can be tracked down and often has a case in the past, as I mentioned in the previous slide. I want to show another graph of this, how much of cryptos is used for listed purposes part two. As you can see, the transaction, listen, share of all cryptocurrency transactions really peaked in 2019, but it was only about 3%. And as you can see right here, from 2019, 2020, 22, and 2000, 2020 to 2021, there's a huge drop. Uh, I think one of the reasons for this huge drop is that a lot of governments got aware of what cryptocurrencies a blockchain really is, and thus uh, passed a lot of legislation. As I, as I talked about in my previous classes, class about that is that Bitcoin isn't exactly unknown to everyone anymore. Everyone knows what it is. And thus, there's a lot of defenses against it. Go on to the next topic. Why do you want privacy? I hope the video works this time. It didn't work last semester. For example, with the amount of data being displayed on blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's become easier these days to identify patterns, map real-life identities, connect between addresses, and uncover behavioral information about users. So if you don't like companies analyzing your data in order to map out your behavioral or purchasing patterns, you may consider using a private cryptocurrency. Additionally, since all address balances are completely transparent, you may become subject to attacks if you hold large amounts of Bitcoin. Another thing to consider is market prediction. If I know a certain address belongs to an exchange, I can track it for incoming transactions. If I see a large amount coming in, then I can assume that a big sell order may be on its way and short the currency for a profit. In a truly perfect market, such loopholes would not exist. And finally, we come to the issue of fungibility. Fungibility means that currency units should be completely interchangeable with one another. Simply put, if I have a $20 bill, it shouldn't matter to you where it came from or when it was made. A $20 bill is just a $20 bill, and it's equivalent to any other $20 bill you can find. However, in Bitcoin, for example, you can trace each coin back, even as far to when it was first created as a mining reward, which is known as the Coinbase transaction. So if somewhere along the way this Bitcoin was used for illegal activity, you may find some law enforcement agency knocking on your door as part of some investigation they're running. While this is all theory for now, it could happen, since Bitcoins are 100% traceable. So you might have different prices for freshly minted Bitcoins as opposed to used Bitcoins. For Bitcoin to truly become a currency, it will have to deal with this fungibility issue. On the other hand, a private coin that can't be traced has complete fungibility. As you can see, there are numerous use cases for using a privacy coin such as Monero. So what's the difference between Monero and other privacy coins like Dash or Zcash? Well, while other coins like Dash or Zcash offer the option for private transactions, in Monero, all transactions are private without exception. For example, with the amount of data being displayed on blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's become easier these days to identify patterns, map real-life identities. For example, I screwed up there. 
Sorry about that. Uh, difference between privacy and anonymity. I'll briefly explain it. Privacy is that you don't want others to know what you're doing. Um, anonymity is actions are public, but the identity is concealed. For uh, cryptocurrency, you ideally want a mixture of both privacy and anonymity to, to uh, properly get all the benefits of a crypto without, without uh, as the guy mentioned in the last slide, getting all law enforcement on your butt. I mean, you're, you're not criminals. I'm, I'm not assuming you guys are, but it's not always a good idea to broadcast uh, what you purchase and what you buy. Anonymity. Privacy means that you don't want others to know what you're doing. While anonymity means that you don't mind that people know what you're doing, you just don't want them to know that you're the one doing it. For example, privacy is when you lock the door to a bathroom because you want to keep what's going on in there, well, private. Anonymity is when you post data that can't be linked back to you on the web in order to bring something to the public's attention. If you look at Bitcoin, it's certainly not private. The Bitcoin blockchain is completely public and all transactions can be viewed by anyone on the web. If you want to keep your privacy in Bitcoin, you'll have to use transaction mixers, VPNs, and a variety of other methods. Bitcoin is also not completely anonymous. On the one hand, the blockchain shows how many Bitcoins were sent from which address and when. On the other, without any additional information, it's impossible to connect a Bitcoin address to a real-life identity, also known as an IRL. So Bitcoin is pseudonymous. Enter Monero. Anonymity. Anonymity. Monero. What exactly is Monero? Which is the, or the acronym goes by XMR. Monero is an open source and privacy-based cryptocurrency that launched in 2020, 2014. It was created to be an opaque, it's created to be opaque by disguising the addresses used by participants, details like identities of senders and recipients, transactions amount, transaction between details become anonymous. The usage of ring signals and stealth addresses usually are help with the privacy aspect. Users can mine uh, Monero like you can with Bitcoin but with their own CPU. No special hardware is needed. The word Monero means coin Esperanto. They kind of uh, really want to go for the international aspect there. Claims to be a safer network where participants pay little risk of being refused or blacklisted by others. As you can see right here, this graph kind of explains what I've just kind of said right now. Is that Typically, it's a private key and a public key, a verifying sign. But with the Monero, it gets a low comp, it gets a little scrambled. And let's compare that to Bitcoin. The Monero beats Bitcoin in terms of privacy, fungibility, and transaction fees and mining algorithms. However, it's not exactly a perfect replacement as, as the guy kind of presented it to be. Bitcoin beats Monero in terms of transaction speed, particularly that there's a lightning network. You guys heard about that? Scalability, adoption, supply, and return on investments and creation. Monero itself is it's a bit of still kind of obscure at the moment. So you only get about a thousand transactions per day, but Bitcoin gets about hundreds of thousands of transactions. Everyone is a lot of people are using it. It's coming popular. And there's this fixed supply of Bitcoin too, which is one of the reasons why it contributed to its return of, return of, <clears throat> return of investment since its creation over 24,000%. Well, Monero only got about 17,000, 1700%. It's still good. It's very good, but it's just compared to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is still, Bitcoin is still king. But however, I think which is one aspect that well, that does it's interesting about Monero is the transaction fees. It's only about two cents, but while Bitcoin itself is only about 39 cents, and that can be, and that can get more expensive or in certain times too. What does the speaker peak about this? Well, um, the future of Monero is an interesting subject. However, I wish to discuss Monero itself as only a proof of concept. I'm gonna use that term a lot during class. Where is these cards not Bitcoin? Yeah, I'll try to find something like that too, Jay. 
Uh, and we should discuss uh, for maintaining fugibility and privacy and slash anonymity in a blockchain. There is the possibility that Monero and Bitcoin may not survive the conditions of future. As you can see right here, as I mentioned, the governments of the world are very aware of what blockchain and cryptocurrencies are. And they're starting to tax it. If you guys did your taxes this year, if you guys noticed that there's a lot of questions regarding cryptocurrencies, yeah, they're getting aware of it. But if we understand them both as a proof of concept, we can use the technology of blockchain to be able to protect our privacy and anonymity. Hopefully uh, learning from our past mistakes and create a better crypto, crypto token. See, it might, Bitcoin and crypto Monero might not last, as I just said, but we might be able, we might be able to make something much better. Expectations. Anyways, uh, the video I presented earlier was, got, was from uh, What is Monero? A Beginner's Guide from a 99bitcoins.com, 99bitcoins channel. And uh, I also took some sources from, from some graphs from uh, Exodus and Investopedia too. And uh, the analysis of illicit use of crypto is uh, particularly from chain analysis report, which, uh, which, <clears throat> which they do have an official, they do have it for 20, 2022, but however, they kind of have it as like an email, you have to sign up for the email list in order to get the report, which is a bit annoying. Yeah. Is it lucrative to buy Monero? Uh, I don't know. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on mining cryptocurrencies, but uh, I think from, my, from what I've heard about and my experience is that I guess try to mine, if you have the ability to mine, if you have the ability to do large scale mining, it's, I think it's more efficient to mine uh, <clears throat> to not put all your eggs in one basket and mine multiple different types of tokens and see which one works better. Yeah, so basically mine Monero and Bitcoin if you can. But yeah, remember the mining GPUs are very, are uh, the market for this is very expensive at the moment. It's one of the, it's one of the side effects of uh, crypto mining becoming popular in, the main, in mainstream. This, just everything comes more expensive. It's hard to get into. Or just for CPU. Yeah. If that's the case, it's still though, it's not exactly, mining is still kind of a complicated deal to do, even if you just have a CPU. So you, the main problem is that you have to find a good energy source, particularly, preferably renewable. Because if you try to plug your mining rig to the electric grid right here, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a lot of complaints from that. Anyways, uh, that was a bit of a short presentation for today. Uh, again, thank you guys for showing up. And uh, Jay Hearn, I already have you in my attendance right now, so don't worry about it. Sign yourself. Okay, I think you can share now on your laptop. There you go. All right. All right, we're in business now. Okay. So, um, when I finally was able to log into this Excel, it asked me, would I like to download 100 templates from s &P? And so um, what do you think, sir, we should um, start at one of these templates or? 
Um, we do to where he, he, it's. Okay, let's look at a simple example of how we can use the formula builder to create our own template from scratch. All right, very easily up intrinsic value relative based on different inputs. And you can play with the assumptions. There's one ticker linked. I just want to calculate presentations or here to the ticker. So here we are in Excel. We have all of the prompts to install the SMP Capital IQ plugin. And we can access it here on the ribbon now. The first thing I want to show you is the pre-installed templates. These are very powerful oh, yes, for getting started. Here we go. Let's go to financials and then let's go to standard. That's it here on the ribbon now. The first thing I want to show you is the pre installed templates. These are very powerful tools for getting started. Let's go to financials and then let's go to standard. But once this is loaded, we can see that we've got a set of financial statements for IBM. And we can see that everything here in green is a capital IQ formula with this at CIQ syntax. We can see that we've got all sorts of items here with different time periods and capital IQ is pulling these numbers in. Now, if you really want to see the power of this tool, we can go up here to the ticker, which is what's controlling this entire template, and we can change it from, say, IBM to GE. And then it loads GE's financials. So you can see that this is a pretty powerful tool for creating profiles, creating presentations or dashboards for companies and quickly changing them. You could change the currency, you could change the date. Across here, you could change the fiscal periods We've got LTM here, that's super handy. Now let's try to recreate some of the stuff that's built here manually. You may not always want to use a template like this. You may sometimes want to calculate things yourself. So let's look here. This is 2019 year end total revenues for GE. Let's rebuild that number off on the side here. Let's go to formula builder. going to have the identifier of the company, which is the ticker, linked to this cell here. Revenue. Total revenue, that's the metric that we want. Absolute period, in this case, fiscal year 2019. As date, we will link to the cell here that controls the as of date. And for the currency, Let's also link here to US dollars. And so I'm gonna to jump to the video after this to where he's he's just kind of showing to where it's updating. It's working great on mine. I'm on the financial sn snapshot tear sheet. Okay. We can use the formula builder to create our own template from scratch. Start by using the identifier, which is the company's ticker symbol. We then want to get revenue. So let's go into the income statement here, select total revenue. We can select the 2019 fiscal year. As of date and currency, which will be the global default. Let's add the formula here and press okay. 
We can take this and fill it right with control R. And now we have the total revenue in 2019 for IBM and for GE. And you can see in the formula here what is being referenced. So if you want to disaggregate this into a more dynamic formula, you can strip parts of it out. Let's take a look at how to do that. So let's study the syntax here. You can see that it starts by taking the company's ticker symbol, which we've linked up here dynamically, so that's good. But then what we want to do is strip out revenue. And we can actually replace the label here with IQ total revenue. And then we can delete this and make a reference here, which we can anchor in place using F4 a couple of times. And fill that across to the right. So now this is looking a bit more dynamic, like our typical Excel formulas we like to build. Let's also strip out the fiscal period in the top left corner as an assumption. So we can now delete that from the formula and we can link it here. Let's press F4 once to anchor that in place, fill it right with control R. Top left is the current date at the date. Here. Let's change that reference in here. Right. Quickly format that. Okay, CIQ, company name, comma. Uh, not understanding A1 and B1. What are what are they telling me? One's the year, I get that. B1. Why is B1 and A1 telling you something different? All right, I keep going from this trying to go the right. So anchor with that four. Just quickly format this. We go. We've got a nice dynamic formula. So if we want to fill it in for EBIT and net income, all we have to do is go into the formula builder. We just need to figure out the CIQ code for EBIT. We can see that it's IQ underscore EBIT. To cancel. Let's do the same for net income. I don't, uh, I'm not understanding B1 at all. When did, I'm sorry, when did you need to explain B1? Been there? Yes, sir. Right, yeah, sorry, I must. And now all we have left is the current date as of date. And copy so that's today and paste here. Yes, sir. Why is he putting that in each point? Let's so we just five people today who can do it. I'm not getting data I'm doing here. I'm doing something wrong. All right, sorry. I'll have to watch that part again. All right. No, you're fine. Keep going. I just missed some data. Are y'all getting it? Oh, no. Mine's still loading on here, so it's it's like Sergio, did you get a number? No. The only and it's telling me that that date's the error I'm getting. So I don't understand the date. So E2 is the back a little bit. A little ahead of that, I'm sorry. The income statement here. Is that Select the total revenue? Minus? select the 2019 fiscal year as of date and currency, which will be the global default. Let's add the formula here. 
I'm going to press OK. No. Take this and, fill. and currency, we can select Entifier, which is the company's ticker symbol. We then want to get revenue. So let's go into the income statement here. Select total revenue. We can select the 2019 fiscal year. The date and currency, which will be the global default. Let's add the formula here and press OK. We can take this and fill it right with Control R. The total revenue in 2019 for IBM and for GE. And you can see in the formula here what is being referenced. So if you want to disaggregate this into a more dynamic formula, you can strip parts of it out. Let's take a look at how to do that. Let's study the syntax here. You can see that it starts by taking the company's ticker symbol, which we've linked up here dynamically, so that's good. But then what we want to do is strip out revenue. Let's copy that. And we can actually replace the label here with IQ total revenue. And then we can delete this. It's here, which we can anchor in place using F4 a couple of times. And fill that across to the right. This is looking a bit more dynamic, like our typical Excel formulas we like to build. Let's also strip out the fiscal period. Top left corner as an assumption. So we can now delete that from the formula. And we can link it here. Let's press F4 once to anchor that in place. Fill it right with Control R. have left is the current date as a date, which we can copy and paste here. Let's change that reference in here. So anchor to that four. Let's just quickly format this. All the quotations are there and everything. So now if we want to fill it in for EBIT and net income, all we have to do is go into the formula builder. And we just need to figure out the CIQ code for EBIT. And we can see that it's okay. IQ underscore EBIT. It's a cancel. Let's do the same for net income. IQ underscore N I. So we're going to put these formulas down. First, let's just make sure everything is in place to fill down. We want to make sure that the reference to the ticker which is cell B2 is properly anchored. So we will always refer to row two. So fill that right with control R. If we've done our anchoring properly, we can fill all that down with control D. And there we go. We get the numbers that we wanted. Let's press F5, go to special. Let's select all constants. We want to format those to be blue indicate that they are hard-coded assumptions that drive our model. So now we've got in black these dynamic formulas. We can change these if, for example, we want... All right, well, you put the current date in, but I don't know why it needs the current date, but I got it to work. My problem was with FY, I had a space from FY 2021. So oh, okay. Draft, that's good. Nice. Instead of 2019, you get those numbers just like that. Instead of General Electric, we want Goldman Sachs. We simply change it to GS. We get Goldman Sachs numbers there. 
we would have to do a deeper dive as to why there is an NA for EBIT in 2018 for GS. So let's just change this back now to GE. I also want to add a company name here. Let's just do this one last item. Let's go to Count by Q, Formula Builder, search for company name. Let's reference to the cell here. Okay. It's filled to the right. And I like to have company name here. Let's change it to a formula because if you're simply referencing a ticker and you don't know all the tickers by heart, it could be easy to have a typo in the ticker and you'd never know down here based on the revenue alone. But if it's linking to the company name, of course you would know right away if you have the wrong ticker. So that's how you can start to build a custom template for yourself as a financial analyst using the SMP Capital IQ plugin. Thank you so much for joining us for this course. I get it. Probably my finger to download. I'm going to take a, one of our simple investment sliding models and see if I can replicate it. All right, so why does he do next after this? But then that's his last one, sir, his last free. Okay. Are you able to get a number to come in? Oh, I've never been with the visit from the house. IBM's probably Roman Sachs is the strategic. Um, okay. IBM or I, I brought in full year 2021 for total revenue. Brought in 57,351. When you look for stocks that have dropped more than 50%, you might have to make it you know, more than 30%, have more stocks come through. Loosen criteria or remove criteria. That is the look for stocks every that are too small Mr. for philosophies built around, around investing. Servers. I think all I've used is the Excel add in. Find stuff. And it's interesting, you know, the, the, the warnings, you know, notice those kind of things. I just don't use that that much. I really prefer the Excel add in, but we'll see. I'll, I'll watch all the videos again. You did a good job of giving us a good overview of it. It certainly proves that it's powerful. It works really, really well. So that's exciting. I really like these um, tear sheets. Sorry, Joe, do you mind if I see where you were able to? One of the questions was, I haven't, I don't remember, is how you bring in a bunch of companies at once, uh, what options they had there. However, I think I could pretty easily get something from Bloomberg and convert it to what can work in Capital IQ. I don't know how to work. Make sure I write If you want to do another class, I might be the question is can you bring in all the tickers of one industry all at once? I'll, I'll definitely try it um, this weekend, sir. I think you covered it. I could probably never answer that sure and do something like that. So they have a multiple portfolio one, but that's where you can just compare portfolios.